wherever you are joining us from around the world, welcome to finals day at Henley Royal Regatta 2022. The sun is out and we are all set for 26 key clashes today. This is what it's all about, that hard winter training, the gruelling early mornings, the sacrifices. It all comes down to this one final push down this iconic hallowed stretch of the River Thames to the finish line here at Poplar Point. Crossing this line, sheer disappointment for one crew, but that magical elation for the winners and their names etched on the regatta's historic role of honour. The gladiatorial head-to-head -head format here, there is nothing quite like it. It is sport in its rawest and best form. So let's get these finals underway then and say good morning to our commentators today, Adrian Cassidy and Tim Della. Thank you, Ali. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to what is one of the biggest days in British sport, the pinnacle of this sport, that's for sure. It's what every rower dreams of, making it into one of these finals underway at 11 o'clock with the Britannia Challenge Cup, and we head through till one and lunchtime. And then we've got a busy afternoon programme as well, Princess Grace Challenge Cup, rounding things off for this morning session top quality rowing so let's get the party started 26 finals between now and prize giving at five it's time for the first race of the day the britannia challenge cup this is club men's fours first on the water london rowing club on the Berkshire station and Thames Rowing Club on the Buxton. You can see London Rowing Club waiting patiently. Adrian Cassidy alongside me. What a great day this will be. Morning, Tim. Yeah, great. It's, um, yeah, it's going to be a fantastic day's racing. The weather seems to have done us a bit of favour. We can see the paddleboarders over here as they come past. First race of the day. So they've made the final. This is what they've been training to do. And these two clubs will be going out at hammer and tongs. Having looked at the racing so far this week, they had, neither of them had a really hard test yet. Just before we start, what an achievement from every athlete who gets on this start line today. Regardless of what happens in the next few minutes for them and a few hours for the other events, it's a great achievement to get here, isn't it? It, it really is. I mean, the, the hours the guys put in to train to get to this, you know, they're training 10 times a week whilst having jobs, and because these are club athletes. And yeah, it's an awesome experience for these athletes. And the devastation one of, one of these crews will feel in about eight minutes' time is terrible and they will remember it for the rest of their life they will successful or uh, otherwise correct they will indeed so one of the interesting thing here in the thames rowing club crew the bow seat here with the red cap on the right hand side of the white bit is max gillard and he's in the final today and his dad won this event 30 years ago so that's an amazing parallel lovely bit of symmetry joining up the generations so these conditions it's quiet it's still certainly down at temple island at the moment compared to the last few days we've had everything thrown at the athletes on the water in the last few days it is a bit of luck as to the draw of what you've had to face conditions wise you had a horrific rain last night and at other times you've had a very strong crosswind i think it's a light cross headwind today is the uh, official going yeah, it is, and, and you look down the course, it does look like really optimal racing conditions, so it's good to the final to have these great conditions. And start you like this. Attention, go. Get ready, please. So the pressure building now. This is it, the big moment in the Britannia, the final London Rowing Club A against Thames Rowing Club to the right of your picture. Finals day 2022 now underway with the first of 26, the Britannia. And this all important start, and immediately you're seeing on the Buck Station, the right hand side, Thames Rowing Club battling to keep close to the island, which suggests there is a bit of a breeze across the water. These are two supremely well drilled crews. Here, Stuart Heap has taken over London Rowing Club this year and has already made a huge impact both on the men's and the women's side. And it's good to see this crew how well they're rowing by the very fact that they've got to finals day. They're all going to be classy on the water today, and you'd expect good clean starts from all the boats, and that's what we've got in this particular one. Just having a look, Thames Rowing Club being uh, encouraged to get back onto their side of the water. They have taken a lead, though, so they'll be absolutely satisfied in the early stages. Powerful, explosive start 
off the pontoon and they've taken a lead under the rowing club. You can see there the data, 38 strokes a minute. That's a pretty lively start to this race. It is, they're keeping it quite high and you can see there on the speed that of the, the Thames crew here are moving away. And it's going to be interesting now that it looks like Thames there have found their rhythm and they're into something that, going to, that resembles their cruising speed. Whereas the left-hand side there, maybe um, London Rowing Club is still on top a little bit harder, but that's a great transition. You can hear the blade work from Thames Rowing Club. Yeah, good. The uh, technical skills of Thames Rowing Club showing through there with a slower stroke rate, a reduced stroke rate, but shifting the boat quicker. So uh, energy-wise, they might have a bit more in the tank in a couple of minutes' time. And I think that point about energy-wise is really important. We've seen a few times this week of crews going out well, rowing well, but actually maybe over, overcooking it and then getting rowed through later on in the race. So we want to really find out as this unfolds who's worked too hard or who's been efficient so far. So this is London Rowing Club. Both these boats had their semi-finals on Friday evening and London Rowing Club, who we can see here, beat Hinksy by two lengths on Friday evening, which seems quite a long time ago. They've had a, a day off to, to freshen up, like Thames Rowing Club, who uh, beat Vesta in their semi-final by a length and a half. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting thing, is that now they knew they made the final on Friday, they did a whole day. They would have gone rowing on the Saturday just to keep being busy. But the mental side of that day off, trying to not to think about it too much, trying not to be wasting any nervous energy, who manage themselves well on Saturday will have an impact on today as well. It's a discipline, isn't it, that's required. And everyone imagines uh, discipline-wise is when you're in the gym and uh, putting in the hard yards. But actually on a long regatta like this, here at Thames Rowing Club again, being spoken to by the umpire. I don't think they'll be too anxious, though, will they? They'll most of all be uh, looking at that lead that they've crafted and think, well, we're going all right here. Yep, it's they a good to, start. And even from that data, there, we can see that it still seems to be moving a bit quicker, but Thames getting warned once again by the umpire to get across. But the, yeah, the Cox 4 is a boat where you can actually change the boat speed quite a lot, so depending on how much um, London Rowing Club have got in the tank, but they need to do something quite soon, really, whether well, probably halfway down the course now. Yeah, Thames being spoken to again. The umpire not taking any nonsense from them, encouraging them to stay on their side of the water. The stats point to a really tight race. If you look at the semi-finals, they got to a barrier 205 and 206 in their respective semi-finals. They got to falling in 331 and 332 in their semi-finals. And there was only a couple of seconds in terms of time difference when they got over the finish line. So that points to a really tight race here. But at the moment, Thames, despite being spoken to by the umpire a couple of times for some steering issues, have fought out a good lead. Adrian? Yeah, and, and there's a bit of discrepancy coming on the, on the blade work on the, in the Thames crew. And I think it's interesting you saying those times they were equal at the first two markers. Obviously, today they're not equal at the first two markers. So what's happened? Has somebody not got it quite right or has somebody gone a bit too hard? And I guess as the race progresses, we'll find out. Yeah, only time will tell. Last year, there we go. And the boat and the beating Thames boat is back on top of it again. And maybe this is going to start moving again. Another surge being put in here. This is the Britannia, finals day of Henley Raw Regatta. You can hear already, 11 o'clock in the morning, big crowds assembling to watch this one. Thames Rowing Club getting some good support there. And they've got more than the length up. Yeah, moving well here, aren't they, now again? There's a bit of a stall there as the... As, uh, as the London Rowing Club crew seem to come back on turns, but actually, once they sort of their steering out over here on the London Thames Rowing Club crew, good job. Pat Hanratty in the stroke seat, Thames Rowing Club, Max Robinson in three seat, Ben Campbell Reed, and Max Gillard in the bow seat. You can see there, Pat Hanratty looking pretty relaxed and calm considering the stage of the week we're at. Yeah, Pat has a YouTube channel that he runs. He talked about his journey through Thames Rowing Club. It's amazing to see him here now in the final of the Thames of the Britannia Challenge Cup. Putting together a good race in that stroke seat, Pat Hanratty and his Thames boat. And this is the point in the race that they'll look back on with great fondness if they can hold on, because you've got the big crowds there. They'll be cheered to the finish. You can see the Cox there for the Thames boat, Zoe Evans. Very different perspective on the race, just clear water. She'll be glancing over her left shoulder, no doubt, trying to work out how much of a lead they've got. So and even in this position here, um, Thames Rowing Club, they can't enjoy winning this race at this point. They know they're still under pressure and they need to execute what they've been rehearsing all year. And here as we come up to the mile on the eighth post, you can see on the left-hand side, 
length, about two lengths lead for the Thames Rowing Club. And under this sort of pressure, anything can happen in the final few hundred metres. So they need to keep concentrating. That's Max Gillard, you can see there. So it looks like he's going to win the win the Brit 30 years after his father. That's pretty pretty cool. It certainly is. You can't write those scripts, can you, for that family? So Zoe Evans will be keeping a close eye on things in front of the regatta enclosure, moving in front of Stewards enclosure, and Thames Rowing Club know that the job. Well, it's not done yet, because we're looking at London Rowing Club fighting all the way, and actually they've put in a bit of a surge here, and they have made sure that this stays really competitive. One mistake now, and the whole thing could come off the track for Thames Rowing Club, but they look like they're going to stay composed into the last dozen or so strokes, and in stewards they're being roared home, the Thames Rowing Club the Britannia Challenge Cup is going to go their way. Last few strokes, London Rowing Club fighting all the way. But the final of the Britannia Challenge Cup, the win on the Buck Station. Over they go now, Thames Rowing Club. Congratulations to them. Hanratty Robinson, Campbell Reed and Gillard. Celebrations, Zoe Evans, the Cox, steering them home against London Rowing Club. And there, the jubilation of winning the final at Henry Raw Regatta, our first winners of the Britannia Thames Rowing Club. Here, Zoe Evans, the, cox, the mannerisms as she's coxing, shouting the crew, encouraging them to get the job done. Be some jubilant families on the bank, certainly. Look at that, the celebrations, that's what it means to them. That's the release, isn't it? All the pent up sort of emotion comes out right now. You can see the joy. They can dine out on that for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Club and school junior men's quads next on the water. This is the Forley. And this is an all Windsor Boys School final. Adrian, my money in this race is on Windsor Boys School. I think so. I think so. They've, this, um, Mark Wilkinson at this club has done an unbelievable job <laughs> of just building the state school up from scratch. And the way he organises it, he gets his, his boys involved, he gets all the parents involved. They have a huge amount of support from Sean Furness, the, the new head teacher. And it's amazing for, to see them right, two so the crews. The they're national schools. Incredible. They want national schools regatta by a, by the length, but their top three guys weren't in the boat. So this is fantastic to see. You thought they at least they'd have matching Windsor boats. Windsor black, <laughs> Windsor red. When I see your boat straight and ready, I'll start you like this. Attention, go. Get ready, please. Attention, go! The final of the Forley, the Windsor Boys School A on the Berkshire Bank and Windsor Boys School B on the Buckinghamshire Station. What an achievement from the State School, not too far away from here. That handy, we've got down the road, Windsor Boys churning out great athletes. And we'll have a look at this start. This is for bragging rights. What an achievement from the school to get the two boats into the same final. Immediately, the A boat has sprung into the lead. They've done a good job there on Temple Island. You'd expect that, wouldn't you, Adrian? That should be uh, according to the four, but uh, we'll but, wait and see. But it shows that they've been told to go out and race. It's not like we're going to have a nice procession down here and make it look good. These boys, the second crew, they'll have been wanting this race all season to try and take on this first eight. And the first quad, sorry, will definitely want to do this with damage. But the second crew here, you know, the first one's got about a length, but actually they're holding them at the moment. The far crew looks like they have a higher stroke rate as well. It's a pretty good shot for their school magazine or website, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah that's going to be amazing, isn't it? So, yeah, and here on the, the, the near crew, we have the bow Charlie Ingham. A two, we have Dylan James. A three, we have Matthew Sadler. And the stroke man is Jack Cadwallader. Uh, it's different to the programme. The crew order in the programme is not correct. 
but here we go and you can see the A crew on the far side in the black boat starting to move away again. Now on the far side of the water on the Berkshire station, Charlie Warren in the stroke seat, setting the pace. Marcus Shute in the three seat, Max Bird, and then in the bow seat is Jacob Morris. And what a race they're putting together already. Well, the, well, there's uh, the yellow flag up, Adrian. We got to that point in the race already. So if the flag comes down, that'll be when the leading crew crosses the line and the umpires in the launch will press the stopwatch and that will record the time. So here we can see the A crew getting out to a couple of lengths, really not holding back at all. They're, this is a competition and they're going to feel like, well, they probably felt we're confident we can bin this. Let's see if we can put our best row together because it's the last time these four guys will row together. Winter boys were losing finalists to Tideway Scullers last year in the falling. So they're guaranteed victory to one boat or another today. And they have got a pretty good pedigree in this as well. They won the event back in 2017 and 2018 as well. And it looks as if the Windsor Boys School A boat to the right. You can see in the back of Jacob Morris in that boat in the bow seat is uh, keeping their cool. It's a different sort of pressure for, for both of these boats, isn't it? And actually a very contrasting pressure for the A boat and the B boat. Yes, for sure. I mean, the A-boat obviously has nothing to, to gain because they should win. And if they lose, it's a complete disaster. <laughs> and the B-crew can just throw everything at it and take no, every risk they want because they're not expected to win and they yeah. can just go for it. But, you know, if the selection's been done right, and you can see here, the A-crew, it's, it's that's an impressive double quad. The way they're sculling is so efficient. Do the coaches want the A-boat to win then? Because as you say, it's, the selection's been done right, so it sort of underlines they know their stuff. I, the I, I personally, I think last night, they would have just loved the fact yeah. he can probably actually enjoy this race for the first time because he knows Windsor boys are going to win. He's got his feet up. Yeah, I think he probably has. Big, um, big cigar lit. <laughs> yeah, so, and what was interesting is that when the, when the years ago, when that St. Paul's Day was meant so fast and everybody was talking about it, actually the Windsor boys quad that won that year was only one less than 1% slower. So because Scully hasn't got the same profile as the eights event, people don't talk about how quick these crews are. But these crews here are world class. I mean, the three three man here, third from the screen, third, third from us. He is a lightweight. He's a junior. So he's still at school. Came second or third, I think, in the British under 23 trials. I mean, he's a phenomenal athlete. So we're at this stage of the race where it will be hurting, but it's the A boat that's shifting along well. On the Berkshire station, you've got there the A boat that's leading. Stroke seat, Charlie Warren, 18 years old. There's uh, three 18-year-olds and a 17-year-old in the bow seat, Jacob Orris, in that boat. And look at the lead they've established here. And it looks really well drilled, doesn't it? Very slick. Here come the B boat. And they know that, uh, bar a catastrophe to their mates in the A boat, the world order will remain the same, at least at Windsor Boys. Indeed. And this is where it gets hard for the B crew, because they will have gone as hard as they can to stay in touch and be competitive. And now they'll have spent more energy than they should have done if they'd gone for the fastest race. But now they're also rowing in the bouncy water from the other crew. So it's really uncomfortable. And yeah, so it's good to see these guys still carrying on, just doing their best. But the A crew, what, an, what a phenomenal performance. And I guess maybe they're trying to send a signal out to everybody else that you know, you're going to come and get us next year. Yes. So uh, just having a look at this Windsor. Boys school. The A crew beat St Andrew Boat Club in their semi-final and we had uh, a local derby on the water in the Forley in the other semi-final. The B crew beat Clare's Court School of Maidenhead and that would have uh, taken its own toll, no doubt, on the uh, B crew. And we can see the A crew extending their lead. So one of the thoughts people might be having watching this crew because they're still going hammer and tongs even despite this being this far ahead is that are they going to try and break the record? Now, to be honest, with the conditions today, I'm not sure if the record's up for grabs, but then again, I don't actually know how fast this crew really is, and maybe they, they don't need optimal conditions to break the current record, but we'll only find out when they cross the line. So they might have that as a, an added incentive, a target, an objective, and barring catastrophe, it'll be them that pick up the red boxes later on, the, uh, the trophies, the prize giving at five o'clock. It's quite a long wait for the prize giving at this stage, isn't it? The state they might be in by uh, five o'clock. Yeah, exactly. 
you know, they've been holding off for this all week. But some of these guys have got British trials in a week's time. And they have to try and do selection to work for their country. So some of them will have to keep a lid on it. So a tremendous moment for Windsor Boys School, both the A and the B crews. It's the A crew that's going to win the Forley Challenge Cup. But you can't escape the fact that Windsor Boys School have done brilliantly at this Henry Raw Regatta to dominate this event. The Windsor Boys School A win the Forley Challenge Cup. There's the celebrations for Charlie Warren in the stroke seat, Marcus Shoup, Max Bird and Jacob Oris. And the B crew getting a pretty hot reception as well at Stewart's. The B crew over the line now. And uh, it'll be interesting to see the uh, respect shown between these two groups. Yes, immediately the B crew turn around and applaud their mates. And that is a fine, fine race. A terrific achievement from Winter Boys School. Yeah, fantastic result from boys. I mean, it must be Chris Morrell, who's the grandfather of the Windsor Rowing. He must be loving this today. These two crews and the sportsmanship with all these A guys, they're friends and competitors, and even the B crew there when they crossed the line, how they were cheering the A crew. It's what a great atmosphere it must be in that club. Congratulations, guys. If you'll come into the first pontoon, that'd be great. Yeah, the first one. First man to Cheers. Yeah, so some special moments made this morning fantastic race there and it's time to move on to our next race of prince of wales the men's quad skulls reading university and leander club a proper local derby a good local match up here if you're not familiar with your local geography reading university five miles down the road from leander club Great. We're Reading University made a decision several years ago to stop rowing and just become a sculling university. So they're uniquely the only sculling university in the UK. And they've taken their time to raise the standard, and here they are in the final of the Prince of Wales Challenge Cup against the Leander Club crew. This has been an event since 2001, under this name since 2007. Leander Club, terrific pedigree in this. Reading University! Sarah Winkless, the umpire, calling them when under I starters' see orders. And ready, I shall start you like this. The nerves at this Attention. moment. Attention. So stay ready, focused, please. stay calm, try not to be distracted, try not to be overawed by the occasion. Because neither of these crews have been tested so far. Until yesterday, Reading had to row through a little bit hard race, but actually they haven't really been tested and the margins Attention. have been quite big. Go! So the Prince of Wales final, the men's quad skulls underway. Reading University to the left of your picture and flying out from the right-hand side is Leander Club. Both these boats will know this water so well. Leander Club look like they've seized an early initiative, hammering out there. And yeah, nobody's holding back, they've really gone hammer and tongs. And both crews steered a very good straight line. Off the, so coming off the end of the island, the transition looks like it's a really close race so far. Leander are slightly ahead, maybe three or four feet. Well, this is in the very early stages, shaping up to be a good one. Not much of an advantage there for Leander Club, nearest to your picture. It's a bit like the Brit, uh, where there was one second between these two crews at every marker going down the course yesterday. So this should be a tight race. Yesterday we had uh, the semi-final where Reading University beat Dank students. Copenhagen on the Buck Station. They're on the Berkshire Station today, Reading University. And the Ander Club, they were uh, on the Buck Station as well, beating London Rowing Club, Leander, yesterday. I almost wonder how much of an advantage it is having had a dress rehearsal in your semi final, going off the same station as you then go off in the final, whether that gives you a little bit of an edge. So Leander Club have been on the back station for both the semi-final and the final, whereas Reading University have had to switch sides. Yeah, I think being, getting used to the station is quite good, particularly the transition from the end of the island onto the course because of the gap in the booms there. And getting that right is quite key. But here we have Leander gone out to, looks like maybe a length lead. Um, Reading yesterday were down on Copenhagen until Forley, until they sort of rode through them. So they're not unfamiliar to being here, but they really need to make sure they don't, they don't let Leander get any further ahead. Just watching. Reading University to the right, heading a little bit central with the steering there. 
umpires are keeping an eye on it. In fact, uh, all the umpires need to intervene. They're probably going to correct it themselves. Yeah, they want to do it gently. As soon as you put the rudder on, it's going to slow the boat. So if you can do it less, it's really small taps, take less speed off the boat. We hear both crews settle into a good aggressive rhythm. Um, Leander on the left-hand side here with the pink, what we call Cerise blades. Really accurate blade work at the front. Really, they, when they come to their full length and reach, the blades come, go into the water really quite efficiently. And that's the thing that's given them the early advantage. Yeah, it's very neat and tidy from Leander, who are defending champions in this event, the Prince of Wales. They beat Twickenham by a length and a half. It's Twickenham in Queen's University, Belfast, 12 months ago. And uh, they've done well over the years here. They've uh, won in 2019 as well, 17, 15, 14 and 13. So uh, they really have dominated the Prince of Wales in the last 10 years. Yeah, they've really made it their own, actually, they really have. And here we have Leander crew. We have Jack Keating is one of the only two Irishmen left in the regatta. Oliver Costley in the three seat, Grant Ellery, and then Rory Harris in the stroke seat. There's some international experience sort of peppered through the boat. An Irish junior world championship athlete. We have under 23 European medalists and previous winners of the 40 Cup, the race we just watched earlier. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that Bryn Ellery, who in the three seat for Leander, is a rowing coach at Windsor Boys. So uh, news won't have reached him yet of what's just happened, but it's. Uh, a good place to be contributing and he won the falling in 2017 but here they really are seem doing a good job on it they've moved out to what it looks like a length and a half reading have a few steering issues here and they really are going to have to do something pretty extraordinary to get back on terms the leander crew here just looks a bit more lively on top of it moving more freely it looks like less hard work whereas the reading crew looks a little bit more labored but here great great sculling just right in the place in the water you want to be if you're on the uh, back station yeah, exactly, exactly. Very well aligned and starting to uh, enjoy the crowds as well. They'll be urging them on towards the finish line. The uh, crowds get bigger and bigger as you go through the next mile of racing. This is the regatta enclosure you can see and the uh, Remenham Club at the moment in the picture, but regatta enclosure in the next few strokes will be so, audible. So based on the, the margins yesterday, we'd never have been to this result. No. And it just shows that as the, as Leander basically won the first race easily, four lengths and three and a half lengths. It's been they've not shown their cards till today. Louis Powell in the stroke seat for Reading. Sol Hewitt, Ollie Dix, and Josh Leon in the bow seat for Reading. On the right of your picture, Leander Club. You can see the uh, back of Keating in the bow seat there moving along very well and Leander this has been a high quality uh, they really have they, they've, they've left their best till today haven't yeah they? and they've not given us many clues of the margin that would be seen here as you say last night and uh, in the semi-finals we thought this might be a close one but look at the uh, steering issues still continuing in that Reading University boat I think emotionally mentally reaching this final I I don't know if you saw any of the pictures last night, but Reading University were one of the boats that, uh, and some of the coaching staff and some of those around. But I mean, clearly the, the jubilation of reaching this final, that they, they couldn't contain that. And, and no, whereas Leander were a bit more routine about reaching the final. And I've got to say, earlier in the week, when I saw Copenhagen racing, I thought they were going to be one of the crews to beat, to be honest. So the fact that they rode through them, but it, this the, I think it's the first time Reading have made the final of this event, since yeah. they've decided to become a sculling event. University. So. Like you said maybe the emotion that was the achievement getting in the final and this is maybe just one step too far today at this stage but it's uh, promising for them in years to come isn't it and Leander Club well we know all about them we know all about their superiority in years gone by in the Prince of Wales and that continues they won it last year and they're going to win it again this year by a pretty easy margin in front of Stewart's now a really good moment some young athletes in this boat Leander Club Rory Harris in the stroke seat, Bryn Ellery, Oliver Costley and John Keating are heading over the line for victory in the Prince of Wales Challenge Cup. Once again, it goes to Leander Club on their home water and celebrations ensue. Ecstatic with their win. They may even themselves be a little bit surprised by the margin of victory. Huge win over Reading University. 
So congratulations to Reading University for making the final and showing that the decision they made was the right one in doing sculling. But Leander there, absolutely imperious. They just transitioned onto their rhythm and just every stroke just inched away to what is a comfortable win. And you can see the, the relief on their faces here. Well, last year, Leander won eight events in total. They can uh, chalk one up now. They've uh, just recorded their first win, landed their first win in the finals for 2022. And there's Jack Keating as well in the bow seat. It's back-to-back -back victories in this event. So he won last year. Um, yep, that sets the tone for the Leander Club for the rest of the regatta. A little bit of sunshine on Henley Town Centre, St Mary's Church. The bells were tolling earlier on. They had the annual church service for the regatta at 9 o'clock this morning. It's time now for the Hambledon fight. This is the Hambledon Pairs Challenge Cup, women's pairs. And we've got the might of uh, USA's best, Jess Morrison and Megan Wisnicki against a couple of more local rowers. That's uh, Sophia Heath and Annie Campbell-Ord, British pair. Just keeping an eye on the Americans on the Berkshire station. Great experience from them as well, from Morrison and Ms. Nicky. They really do know their way through a, through a race. They've uh, had so much success over the years. Yeah, I mean, the multiple Olympic medalists between them. Gold medalists. Gold medalists, indeed. And, um, they haven't been tested. They've raced twice this regatta, both easily. The Leander crew on the, on the left right hand side of your screen here have raced three times, but each time it's been five lengths, two and a half, three and a half. So we don't know yet, but the pedigree in the American pair is pretty astounding. Campbell Lord and he, I have to warn you, I will refer to you as California and Leander. Fair enough. I see you are both straight and ready. I will start you like this. Attention, go. Get ready, please. So, Hambledon, Morrison and Musnicki. Attention. In the USA. Go. On the Berkshire station. On the Buck station, Heath and Campbell Ord. And this is really worth keeping an eye on because some of the pairs folks have had particular steering problems at Temple Island during this week. It's been really challenging conditions. And I think maybe the pairs boats the, the smaller boats, the singles as well, have uh, felt the brunt of those difficult conditions. So it's going to be very interesting to see how clean the, these women's pairs can get away from Temple Island. At the moment, they're in the shot. Campbell Ord and Heath looking very composed, almost looking like they're enjoying it. Yeah, it's and, still uh, early on. And here you can see we're coming to the end of the island. This is where the gap is between the island and the first boom. And sometimes a stream comes up there and affects them. But today, these, this crew has dealt with that supremely well. And the American crew of... Mosniki and Morrison just moving out to about the best part of a length so far. So, the uh, University of California, the American crew, uh, Morrison, gold in Tokyo in the Australian four, and then we've got uh, Mosniki in the USA, double Olympic champion in the women's eight. And look at the precision, look at the, how, how direct and dynamic the, the blade entry is there. It's really it's deliberate and really forceful. And here they go, California Rowing Club. This is one of the, the new training centers in the U.S. program because U.S. women were always centralized in Princeton until after the last Olympic Games. Now the athletes can pick where they want to train. And California Rowing Club is one of the centers where there are men and women rowing there. And here, these two Olympic champions deciding to go to the warmer weather to train. Who can blame them? And here are Leander's blades, their boat. Annie Campbell Ord, Nottingham Rowing Club. Very useful netball up in her time, Loughborough University. So you can see the difference there a little bit. The American crew, we saw that blade work, how you can see there how quick and deliberate and forceful it is. And the Leander crew, it's more subtle and gentle entry. It looks to me like just the physicality of the US crew is what's giving them the advantage. It's interesting watching uh, Morrison and Mosnicki, who have had very successful careers quite far apart in different boats, in, in different nations, at different times. 
and they've come together relatively late on in their careers and I wonder how long it would have taken them to bed it down because they are absolutely nailing it technically aren't they? Yeah I think the fundamental thing is athletes of this experience they know what it takes to move a boat and you can see the superior boat speed there on the left hand side they know how to move a boat they know what it takes it would just take a bit of time for them to make the compromises you need to do in a pair you can't just row the way you think you're supposed to row generally the person in the stroke seat so that's furthest away from us here would will row a pattern they find natural and the person behind them would have to initially compromise their rowing to match it so that it's level and it goes straight and then once that's in a good it's a good platform then they can discuss what they think is the best pattern to row to get the most boat speed. It's just a very different career trajectory to Heather Standing and Helen Glover who dominated this event for, for so long who teamed up right at the beginning of their careers and swept all before them didn't they in the uh, yeah and, they, and the way they, they came so. into it was interesting because they they were the spares for the eight and that's yes. why they were put together with Robin Williams and then they did such a good job they jumped over the eight and became the dominant crew at the start of their yes. career whereas these two have had so much success exactly already and they're now battling against the Cup. you can see there Sophia Heath the stroke seat from uh, Hartbury College and Gloucester big moment for Gloucester Rowing Club Oxford University marketing and business is what Sophia Heath is all about at the university course so in here we can see just the difference just the difference in calibre to be honest the American pair here they're so metronomic with what they're doing and so solid. It's really impressive to watch this pair here. And they're all traditional singlets as opposed to the, the modern racing ones, onesies. Well, they've beaten Mitchell and Gleeson. I was watching this race yesterday from rowing Australia in the semi-final easily. So they've not, we've not probably not seen them really tested, have we, at this stage? Not really uh, exposed. We'll get a better idea of international regattas, perhaps, but uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a bit of a shame we didn't get to see these two racing against the New Zealand pair. Exactly. Uh, 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 Prendergast and Crowler, or William this year is now having got married. That might um, have been the match-up we would have been after. Yeah, and they were unable to race. So they, they will not be disappointed not to have raced them because obviously they've won Henley, you would say, unless something goes catastrophically wrong now. But they would have liked to have had the challenge of racing the Olympic champions for sure. Last year, Leander beat Tideway by three and a half lengths in eight minutes and 46. That was uh, last year, Redgrave and Deer, the winners of the Hambledon last year. Also, you look at the American uh, girl ladies in the crew. Uh, Morrison, the consultant for Ernst & Young, and Musniki, she's a talent acquisition operations specialist. So this is the Leander crew. They beat the USA's Van Westreen and Ayi quite comfortably in their semi-final, three and three-quarter lengths. But this is harder work to step up in class. But they'll, uh, as young athletes, be benefiting from the experience. They're both uh, going to be involved out in Lucerne next week. And, uh, in fact, they're in the senior squad double in the four as well in uh, Lucerne next week. It's the first time they've been in the uh, senior squad together. So it's a big week coming up for them internationally. It is. And here now, the US crew, and unlike the Windsor boys crew, they were just really piling it on all the way to the end. I think now they're going to start to enjoy this. And actually, there with their experience and their awareness of what's around them and there's this kind of margin, they're actually going to really be able to savour because the conditions are good. They're no, under no pressure for steering. They can actually now hear the crowd and just enjoy the last minute or so of the racing down here, maybe a minute and a half as they get the applause from the crowd and the stewards. Yeah, as a coach, I suppose you encourage that, but only for athletes at the right stage of their career, at the right position in a race. I Trying to savour the magic of this moment. A lot of athletes will go through it almost oblivious, won't they? And I think you can never talk about this as a coach with the athletes. No. About, you know, when we get up and we're winning, it's fine. You can really enjoy the moment. No way, because if they're thinking about that, they're not going to execute yeah. anything else properly. It's just because they're so experienced. They've been in this position so many times. They, they, they know how to manage their, their concentration. And you look how well they're moving together. So, Megan Wisnicki from the USA, double Olympic champion in the women's eight in 2012 in London, 2016 in Rio, five-time world champion. Part of that USA women's eight that every time they got in the water, you just knew they were gonna boss it. Really dominant force, that women's eight, for a 10-year spell. They were indeed. And so first time, the second time at Henley, but the first time in the boat other than the eight. And 
Morrison. Gold in Tokyo in the four. So now there'll be a few strokes from home. Enjoying the applause from Stewart. We thought they were good. They've shown they're really good. Moves Nicky and Morrison in the Hamilton Pairs Challenge Cup. Last few strokes for them. Comfortably beating Campbell Ord and Heath. Fantastic performance from them. Breezing home, hopefully savouring the moment. A glance over the shoulder from Morrison and over the line they go. It's a win for the experienced pair there of Nicky and Morrison in the Hambledon Pairs Challenge Cup. Even for experienced athletes like this, look at the joy of winning an event like this. Hands are up, waving at the crowd. They are loving this. And here comes the Leander pair, still racing to the line. The crowd appreciating their efforts. Great experience for them, big week for them. Good luck to them in Lucerne, out in Switzerland for World Cup three next weekend. But this weekend at Henley, they've been beaten by Morrison and Musnicki. So a great experience for the Leander girls to see what the A standard really is when it comes to the proper racing. But here, look, two American ladies, Olympic gold medalists, the joy, the joy of winning the event at Henley Royal Regatta. This is fantastic to see how much it means to these elite athletes. Henley very busy. You can see the charge across the bridge to try and catch these races before lunch at one o'clock. Lots more finals coming your way in the next few minutes. The stewards and regatta enclosures packed. And we've got the next race on the water. Student men's eights are going to be nervous here in the temple. University of Washington, USA, on the Berkshire Station, Oxford Brooks University. Up against them. That's the place to be today. As, uh, Kath Bishop joins me in the commentary box. Being up on that start line, you'll really sense the tension, the nerves, the excitement. Uh, it's a peaceful spot now, isn't it? But in a few seconds' time, that'll be broken. And there's an extra frisson on finals day because the other races are just to get through this time this is the last one the big one the medals wait at the end of this race so it has that sense of finals day it's got a different atmosphere and in the boats you really sense that as well you're creating that different atmosphere because you know there's no day after today and you've got to give it everything leave it all out there and see if you can write your name into the history books for henry Ball regatta kitchen sink time for both of these Give it a little, a little handshake there, that was nice, from the cocks to the stroke seat in the Oxford Brooks University boat. They'll be eyeballing each other for the next six and a half minutes. Attention, as you are. The umpire so this is just, just re Attention. restarting. There we go. This is the Temple, University of Washington on the Berkshire Station, and on the Buck Station we've got Oxford Brooks University, and here's the power unleashed, trying to get some speed into the boat off those starting pontoons, and we're keeping a close eye on the steering, and both boats seem to have nailed that in the early stages. We'll have another test in a moment as they come out the protection of Temple Island and have to deal with the winds a bit more. So you want to shoot out like a dart, and both of them did that. They've had enough experience in the last few days to kind of know the island now, know the tricks, know the kind of difficulties, and go absolutely dead straight. Both of these coxes need to make sure these crews get the best lane, the best line, rather, down this course that they can, because it could be nip and tuck all the way. Really powerful, explosive rowing from both of these crews. They're both real, they front end the stroke, they're very aggressive in their style of racing, and that's what's got them to the final. The early indication is it will be nip and tuck. Look how level it is in the early stages. You can see closest to the camera there, Oxford Brooks University. They last won this in 2019, Oxford Brooks University, last won the Temple. They also won it in 17, 16 and 14 as well. So they've been pretty good in this over recent years. And then at the top of the picture, University of Washington, USA, beating Durham University in the semi-final by two thirds of a length 
yesterday. They won this in 2018. So it's two boats uh, from two setups that know how to win the Temple. Absolutely, really experienced coaching that goes behind these crews as well with the, the formidable team that's led by Henry Baylash Webb under Richard Spratley at Oxford Brooks. He's been there now in his 14th year as, as head coach, 22 years with the club, and Mike Callahan, who heads up the University of Washington program again, 12 years there, eight years as head coach. So, you know, again, they really know how to get the preparation right, how to get the detail, how to get the race plan right, and how to use the course, when to put the pushes in, you know, how to cope with that middle area where you're sometimes, you know, a little bit further from the bank. Um, at the moment, it looks like there's, there's real aggression in that University of Washington crew. I think they might be nudging their bows ahead. Possibly, yeah. Just looking at the steering, it's uh, suggesting that they've come a little bit central here. University of Washington, the Barcher Station to the right of your picture. They're one of 11 boats from the USA on the water today in our 26 finals. Got two from New Zealand, eight from Australia, one from Germany, Denmark and Norway each. A couple from China, truly international. This is a classic final, isn't it, with a, a local boat from Oxford Brooks and the uh, boat from Washington, an American boat here. Classic matchup. Absolutely, and, and they're on the, the water's good today, isn't it? So they haven't got quite as much. We've had some real windy, gusty. We've had the whole gamut of seasons thrown at us over the last few days, but the sun is out and the conditions are pretty calm which means again you can just focus in its speed from a to b 2112 meters and you need to make sure every stroke counts and it now looks as if we've got a sharpening happening in the oxford brooks crew you can see the catches they just sharpened up as they went in they've lifted they've tightened a little bit they've soaked up the push that came out of the transition from the start in the university of washington crew and that now looks as if oxford brooks are starting to take the lead Yes, yeah, so Oxford Brooks University, you can see there nearest to the camera, to the left-hand side. A little bit tight, these two boats, but the Coxes will have an eye on that. Well, the name of Oxford Brooks University, you can see hunched at the front of the boat there, and Miles Devro in the stroke seat. Winkham, Huller, McGillan, Hines, Lassen, Haywood. And Donaghy, they put in a surge there. That was an important move. I wonder if that wow. would be a decisive move. And they yeah. have shifted through the last couple of hundred metres. Absolutely devastating there to have clear water to just row straight away from... We saw the power of the University of Washington crew coming out of the start. But as they transitioned, they just kept the power going. They kept the sharpness. And it's now looking a little heavy. The University of Washington crew a little bit shocked that they've got, you know, they've lost a sense almost now where the Oxford Brooks crew were. That was absolutely dominant race out of that start and just move away. You can see here that real sharpness. There's a little bit more kind of movement within the University of Washington crew, big guys, um, just not quite as cohesive, as tight, really kind of level. The shoulders aren't lifting a lot in the Oxford Brooks crew at all. Um, it's all going into shifting the water, levering that boat past them. Really formidable rowing there. Yeah, University of Washington, a little bit ragged, muscling it, fighting it a bit, but Oxford Brooks University, they bolted. That was unreal, that surge mid-race. Now it's just about sustaining it, just keeping their cool and seeing themselves down to the finish line as they hit the regatta enclosure. And they'll have huge support there as well, and their fans on the bank will be ecstatic to see the lead they've carved out. They need to keep an eye on their steering. They're just heading a little bit towards the uh, left-hand side of the picture. I think they'll sort that out. and keeping an eye on the University of Washington have had a bit of a wobble as well in towards the mid water but this is a performance from the Oxford Brooks University boat. Really impressive it's their top crew this year they've been really kind of you know and we know they have such a competitive squad I mean both of these systems University of Washington Oxford Brooks have have really competitive squads that people you know they uh, have ambitions to be part of these squads, to be part of these programs because of what they can learn here, because of the history, because of the results that these teams get. We can see there the confidence. I mean, what a joy to have that much clear water in a Henley final. We know that Miles Dever at stroke, he won Henley Royal in the Forley Challenge Cup just two years ago. So much confidence there. He's competed at the Junior World Championships, the European Championships. So Oxford Brooks University, their program paying off again. They won six events on finals day last year, and here's their first win this year. There might be more to come as well, but they're eight in the Temple Challenge Cup. Gusty winds picking up on the finish line, but it's Oxford Brooks University, the winners of the Temple Challenge Cup 2022. The celebrations belong to them, and University of Washington, who had a fast start, a really sharp start from them, 
but the way that Oxford Brook just powered away mid-race, incredible turn of pace, change of gear, proved decisive, Washington couldn't live with them, and that is what it means to Oxford Bricks University. Really dominant row from the Oxford Brooks crew. They come here, they know what it takes to win Henley. They knew that they had the race plan. They had a really fast time in their semi-final, so they had huge confidence coming into this event. And you can see what it means to them. The celebrations, we can hear it echoing around the commentary box. The joy, even though we see, we see a lot of victories in Oxford Brooks, but every single one means so much to this club. This is, they train so hard through the winter. They have a brutal training program, testing each other to the absolute maximum. And this is when it pays off. Hello everyone, it is Sarah Cook here and I'm delighted to be joining you in the commentary box on this final day of Henley Royal Regatta 2022 with my co-commentator Kath Bishop as we prepare for the next race of the day. At the start now for the final of the Double Ch Skulls Challenge Cup. A grudge match here, Australia versus GB in the Bark Station. It is the British combination from Nottingham Rowing Club and the Tideway Scullers Club, Matthew Haywood and George Bourne. And in the Buck Station, it is Australia, rowing as Rowing Australia. It's Jack Cleary and Caleb Antill. This is going to be quite a match-up, isn't it? And their times yesterday, there was only a second between them to the barrier. So, uh, you know, both of them, this is an important part of their journey to the World Championships. Absolutely. As soon as our new high performance director, Paul Thompson, came to the program, he said, right, we're going to Henley in 2022. The World Cup in Poznan just a couple of weeks ago was the first world rowing event, an international event, other than the Olympic Games that the Australian team has done in three years. So finally coming back to Henley has been such a thrill. We've seen that, haven't we, with the huge overseas entry, that sense, the experience of being at Henley, the experience of every moment in your racing, rowing career you want to seize. The Double Skulls Challenge Cup, Great Britain versus Australia. one of the highest level events we're going to see today in terms of that top level international competition. So brilliant at Henley Royal Regatta. We have school boys, we have school girls, we have clubs, we have universities, and we have the very best of rowing here from Australia and from the UK. And they've had, to come, they've had a race to work out what it's like on this course to get their steering sorted. And it is a power match from the word go. And neither of them is going to want to give anything at the start. Looks like a slight advantage here, maybe to the Australians, but more or less both boats locked together. Caleb Antill from the Australian Capital Territories, an old boy of Canberra Grammar School and a member of the Australian University Boat Club, National University Boat Club in the bow seat, Jack Cleary from West Australian Rowing Club. Bronze medalists at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics in the men's quadruple scale. You can see absolute power coming off those four oars in the Australian crew, a relentless rhythm, a relentless amount of power. For both of them coming out of the start, there's a the question of whether you transition and, you know, or just really kind of hold on. And it looks like the Australians are just staying at that, you know, high power, high rate to get ahead. Yeah, this is going to be really entry, uh, interesting entry because the British combination fourth at Belgrade at the first World Cup, this Australian men's double were a dead heat for bronze in the Poznan World Cup. I've not seen that very often, but uh, there were two bronze medals awarded and they've actually switched the seating. So Jack uh, was stroking that boat and now Caleb's gone into the stroke seat. The only two returning members this year from the Australian men's quad, so giving things a go in the double skull here, coached by Lyle McCarthy. What confidence they must have coming off that result in Tokyo to know that 
know that this combination works as part of the quad and now to have the opportunity to come down to the double skull where it's even more intimate, even more intense in some ways and test yourselves on the water at Henley on the way to the World Championships. And they're looking strong, but absolutely you can see Hayward and Bourne are Again, incredible athletes learning, learning about this boat, learning about racing a double at top level. It's a new combination for GB this year. Um, so they're on that journey and this is an important day for them to try and see if they can take it up a notch and see how they can match themselves against the Australians. Looks like they were just adjusting their steering there, but I think they're back straight, keeping away from the boons. It's pretty good conditions today. It's pretty flat, but always with a bit of the Henley popple. Yeah, wonderful conditions here. We've seen very challenging headwind conditions all week since the qualifiers. So I think crews were probably relieved to wake up. But wow, look at that big wash that's hit the Australians. They've come through it well, but tough conditions. You can see the pleasure craft going up and down this course. It's incredibly difficult, but it's all of what makes Henley Henley, contending with the conditions, with the river. And those booms, they always seem closer than they are, don't they, Kat? Always. It looks like Hayward and Bourne have actually really been working hard in that last 250 metres. They are not giving anything away at the moment to the Australians at all. For them, they they know each other well. That's their first season as the GB double. They won under 23 gold uh, in 2019 in the quad. So, you know, had some experience and had some experience of racing together. And that's so important in a race like this to be able to communicate, to make some small adjustments. You can see in the bow, they're just taking a look across at where the Australians are. The Australians are up, but they can sense them. They have not got lost. And so you're both in the same race at this point. And we know anything can happen. We saw the Aussies just get slammed by a bit of a wash there. We have seen all sorts of mishaps and trials and tribulations on this course this week. So the race is not over till it's over, but the Australians with a slight advantage at this stage of the race. And hello to those of you joining us from Australia, from West Australia, cheering on Jack Cleary in the bow seat, from the Australian Capital Territory in Canberra, cheering on Caleb Antill in the stroke seat. I'm sure that Caleb's mum, who rose at Canberra Rowing Club, her and her crewmates will be watching this. Very excited to see the boys leading halfway down the track here at Henley Royal Regatta in the Double Skulls Challenge Cup. So as they pass Remenon now, pass up the Thames, that is looking pretty relentless from uh, Caleb until and Jack Cleary. They have not faltered since the first stroke to just power down. There's an immense consistency in the way they are sculling. It's all about learning from Matthew Hayward and George Bourne. Can they now find another gear? Can they test themselves? Will they go slightly earlier for the finish? What can they do to try and upset dominance of the Australians? Fantastic shot there across the course. The Aussies on the left-hand side of your screen currently leaving, leading the crew from Great Britain. See the wonderful coaches launch behind with the Australian and British supporters and coaches. Of course, they're not allowed to speak, they're not allowed to gesture. It looks like Amy Fernandez, our Deputy Performance Director, taking a cheeky little photo out the side of the mm. following launch there. Gwyn Batten, the umpire for the race. As they pass the mile, it is Australia currently leading this race. Caleb Antill and Jack Cleary over Matthew Haywood and George Bourne of Great Britain. Hayward and Bourne talked about the ferocious sprints that were required in every single race at the World Cup. You know, again, like many events, it's so tight and the positions change in the run-in and how they were learning with each of the sprints, uh, you know, when to go, how to do it, um, to call the timing at a point when you're so exhausted. You have to race, you have to have those other gears. And so again, we'll see here, can they find a sprint? Can they lift? Looking across again in the bow there, What's, what's required? A call has followed, a sharpening has followed there. As these athletes think, what can we do? What move can we make? There we go, definite increase in rate from the British crew there. They're gonna have a go, they're gonna see what's possible. Again, looking across, don't look across too much. Stay in your boat. They can hear now the crowds in the enclosures. They know that it's getting to that sharp end of the race. They're coming down to the last couple of hundred metres past the Stewart enclosures. Matthew Hayward, he's looking over desperately from the British crew over on the Bark station, but the Australian crew answering the call as they're coming down to the line, still with about three quarters of a length lead. Caleb Anthill and Jack Cleary. Jack looks over his shoulder. It's all going to come down to the last few metres here. Sprint to the line from both crews. The British moving up onto terms with the Australians. They are moving. They've upped it. They've upped it. And it wasn't quite enough. The Australians are across. 
what a race in the Double Skulls Challenge Cup. It is Australia, Caleb Anthill and Jack Cleary taking the win over the crew from Great Britain, Matthew Haywood and George Bourne. What a final we've just witnessed. Confirmation wow. of that result there. Really impressive from the Australians, but they were tested at the end. They put a lot of power in on the first part of, you know, throughout the race. That was a great challenge for Matthew Hayward and George Bourne, who closed a lot of the gap. They were overlapping the Australians. The Australians had enough. You can see how much that has taken out of them to stay ahead and win the 2022 Double Skulls Challenge Cup and sets them on a good path heading now to the World Championships. And we now go to the winner of the Temple, Zach Kasler. Uh, sorry, rather, Will Denegri from Oxford Brooks University, the coxswain of that crew. So we'll throw now to Will for a quick interview. Just how emotional was that win, given what happened last year when the boat was narrowly beaten? Yeah, really emotional. Just huge payoff for all of us. It's been such hard work, but really enjoyable. Just the nine of us and the entire squad at Brooks have just been working for this for so long not just last year, but the year before. And it's just a, such a good reward for so many years of hard work. And I'm so happy for these guys and the club as a whole that we can deliver for them today. Why did it go so well today? What is it about this crew? It, we're just so internal and we're so focused on what we can do and what we know we can deliver. We're not phased by other crews or any chat that comes from outside the boat. All we care about is what we can do and just executing our plan every day. And you certainly had some support on the banks with, uh, with the, it seemed like the whole of Oxford Brooks University here. Just describe that feeling, that atmosphere. The support means everything and it's been incredible this week. Despite all our early morning races, everyone's been down here clapping us out. And that's the reason we do it. We couldn't be here without them. We literally could not do what we're doing today without their support. And it just means the world to us. Brilliant. Well done. Enjoy the Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations to Oxford Brooks taking out the Temple Challenge Cup. That was their coxswain will there telling us how much it means to them as we prepare now for the next race the prince philip challenge trophy up at the start line now for the prince philip challenge trophy it is the crew from winter park crew united states of america on screen Next to them in the Bark station, it is St. Catherine's School, Australia. An international match up here. Record entries at Henley Royal Regatta this year, 739 entries. And the highest entries from these two nations, 66 crews from the United States of America, 37 crews from Australia, and one of eight and a half Australian crews racing here on finals day. It has been an absolutely brilliant sight and the stewards are absolutely delighted to see the enthusiasm with which we've had, yeah, 17 nations joining us this year uh, to be part of this very special event, back bigger than ever, uh, having had a slightly quieter year, 2021, missing 2020, so 2022 is firmly back on the map and it's been brilliant to have yeah, even, even more crews from, from some countries involved than ever before and this event only in its second year but border you know just one year to the next it goes up the bar goes up all of the time and these crews have been part of that it's been an exceptional event to bring into the St. program Catherine's junior women's eight Winter Park defeating Henley race. quite sensationally yesterday. Probably the favourites coming into this event. Attention. Extraordinary row from this Winter Park crew. They are exceptional. Ready, St. Cath's undefeated domestically in Australia this year. Two of the very best schoolgirl crews internationally. They have both had undefeated seasons in their countries. What a place that we are offering now the chance for the best of schoolgirl rowing to race it out. And we are away in the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy, St. Catherine School, Australia, against Winter Park Crew, United States of America. This could be the biggest test that either of these crews have faced throughout their seasons. They have been undefeated. They have faced everything that their countries could offer. They have faced everything that this draw could offer. And now St. Catherine School is facing the Winter Park Crew for the honour of winning the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy. 
These girls are just absolutely ferocious. Look at the way they lock in and absolutely throw their body weight onto it. Sitting back together, stroked by Bridget Cullen. A Bronte Cullen, rather. One of the captains of boat at St. Catherine School, Australia. Maybe just with a canvas lead over Winter Park crew, United States of America. Unbelievable aggression out the start, both of these crews. Here we see this Winter Park crew. They came and they qualified. They were so impressive in qualifying. It was obvious they needed to then be one of the selected crews and they have not only beaten Henley yesterday with Hopper Link, they beat Headington, last year's winners as well. But now they come across St. Catherine's School, who beat Surbiton, last year's runner-up, uh, by two lengths yesterday. And they were fast out of the blocks yesterday and they're doing exactly the same slight lead here to St. Catherine's School from Australia, coached by John Saunders, head of rowing, Bridget Carlisle. We're riding with that crew now. Bronte Cullen in the stroke seat, Sienna Darcy behind her, Sarah Marriott, Chloe Nevins, Zara Bongiorno, Lucy Green, Jemima Wilcox and Zara Peel. Three of these women were in the Australian Junior Women's Eight last year. That was Bronte Cullen, Sarah Marriott, and Zara Bongiorno, unfortunately unable to compete at the World Championships, but selected nonetheless in the Junior Women's A. It looks to me like Winter Park are battling and trying to left to kind of make sure they keep the pressure on that St. Catherine's crew. Their coach, Michael Fatullo, has coached for 30 years at Winter Park in Florida and said that this is an exceptional crew. And having been undefeated, they felt they had to come here. They were the first ever crew in history to win from Winter Park to win the US SRAA and now to come to Henley and they are being tested more than they've been tested ever by before by this Australian crew. What a matchup! Two of the best schoolgirl junior women eights in the world going head to head. There is no other event where you see the best of the best in their categories come up against one another and Boy, are they putting on a show for you today. St. Catherine's School Australia, Winter Park Crew, United States of America, locked together down the track, vying for the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy. That's a great overhead shot there. Um, you can see the aggression in the oars, the sharpness of the catches, and that absolute commitment in both crews. And I think what's quite exceptional about this crew from Melbourne is Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. These girls only learned, or these women rather, only learned to row sweep in November of last year, despite coming out of really locked down in January, February. So extraordinary effort from the girls from St. Cats. But here we see Winter Park crew USA led by Paige Perra in the stroke seat. The Coxon Delaney Gardner, she's looking across her shoulder. They know that they are neck and neck at the moment, stroke for stroke down the course. They're so proud of what they've achieved, Winter Park, making their own history, and they know that they have to pull out something special today. They're being asked a lot of questions, and can Delaney Gardner, their cox, 16 years old, can she help them to find another gear against this really aggressive, dominant crew? And we saw a fantastic move from St. Cass at the three-quarter mile over Surbiton. They really had a huge push there. Do they have that in their pocket today? Or is Winter Park, who was truly dominant in their round yesterday over Henley, do they have the call to answer? That's what they're going to find out. They've been testing their race plans over the last few days, haven't they? Understanding where they are on the course is so important so you don't get lost in the middle. And the, the question here is, can they hang on? Can they maintain some overlap in that Winter Park crew with Australia so that they can come back and make a push? As we come past the three-quarter mile, it is a push from St. Katz. It looks to me, it's a tough camera angle we've got here, but it looks to me like St. Katz still have the lead. This is a small program in Australia. They've only won the schoolgirl head of the river and the national championships twice, but undefeated throughout this season. I know that there's a lot of people in Victoria, in Melbourne, watching this race with great interest. As they come level past us, it looks to me as though St. Cass has almost half a length on Winter Park, but everything to play for as they come past Remenham. And I think Winter Park have been creeping back because the Australians at Catherine School were further ahead earlier in the track. And Winter Park know they have to work through this middle section, coming past Remenham, the Remenham Roar. They know that they have to make sure you can't leave it too late to use this middle part of the race. I think there's a little more relaxation in that Winter Park crew. Will that help them down the course against the raw aggression, the attack that we see in that St. Catherine school? 
And St. Catherine's still leading as we focus in on that crew. Five of these rowers are in year 11. So we know that they'll be back next year to defend their title as national champions. And maybe we'll even see them back again. But St. Cath's still leading 35 strokes per minute, 15.9 kilometres per hour. In the sixth seat there, the incredibly strong Sarah Marriott. She has five Australian ergo records, one world record on the rowing machine. Incredible power in the middle of this boat. And they have just increased the rate in the St Catherine School. They know they have to go for home. They know they were under pressure from Winter Park crew. They are throwing everything. They can sense each other. A few heads looked either way there, but that absolute dominance from the stroke guard, Bronte Cullen. She is not giving up. She is fighting for every stroke, leading her crew, leading the rate up, as both of these crews now know that they're going to have to start to think about winding for home. Welcome to those joining us on the broadcast from Australia and the USA. What a matchup we have here for you in the Prince Philip Challenge Cup. Oz versus USA, two of the best junior women's eights in the world in the crew from Winter Park. Delaney Gardner Coxing, Paige Perrot stroking, Susie Mallon, Riley Harris, Hannah Hill, Ashley Perrot, Kate Miller, Ava May, and Zoe DeVio. I think maybe they've come back on St. Cats a little bit here. Kat, what do you think? Yeah, I, they are definitely, there's overlap, isn't there? There is fighting, there's a sense of that rising roar they're getting now they're, now they're into the first part of the enclosures. It's who's got what's left, what was the winter training like, how much of those ergs paid off, but there is no let up in the aggression from that St. Catherine school. St. Cats striving down past Stewart's. They're coming to the line. The lead is with St. Cats of Australia, undefeated domestically in Australia this season. They've come out to prove that they are the best schoolgirl junior women's eight in the world. They're coming down to the line. St. Cats leading Winter Park crew, United States of America. Utterly dominant. A length to St. Catherine's school from Australia. Two undefeated crews. The toughest race they've had. What a treat for us to see this incredible race. The best of schoolgirl rowing in Australia and in the USA. St. Catherine's School, US, Australia beating the Winter Park crew. You can see from the start to finish, absolute aggression, commitment and joy. Joy at the end of that. What an experience, what a journey they have been on. What a race we just saw there. It just keeps coming as we head up now for the Queen Mother Challenge Cup. Up at the start line now with the Queen Mother Challenge Cup. As we look into the boat there of the crew from the United States of America, Texas Rowing Center and Vespa Boat Club USA up against the China or Chinese rather, national rowing team. The Olympic champions from Tokyo. Oh, rather. China, USA. When I see Apologies that you are ready, there, I shall start you like the this. The winners from the World Cups, Attention. not the Tokyo Olympics. Go. Get ready, please. Another international matchup: China versus USA on the waters of Henley on Thames. The Queen Mother Challenge Cup, Chinese national rowing team, Attention. with the bronze medalists from Go. the Tokyo Olympic Games, up against the United States of America. This event is always tight, fast and furious. It's a test of getting power and technique out of the start. Who can be most effective? Who can use their power most effectively? And it's a really slick start from the Chinese rowing team, putting a marker down right from the word go. There were just two seconds between their times yesterday. Uh, the USA came through beating New Zealand, really quite dominant. Uh, the New Zealand's had a good, powerful start, but the USA just rode straight through them and beat them in the end by two and a quarter lengths. Now they're coming up against China, who beat the British team yesterday by half a length. 
early lead for the Chinese, looking really strong. Great experience there. Yeah, the, the stroke man came in, has come in from the bronze, who won the bronze and the double in Tokyo, uh, joining three others who were in the World Championships, came sixth in 2019 uh, and then seventh in Tokyo. You see the crew from the US there, Dominic Williams in the bow, Kevin Cardno in two seat, Jonathan Kirkgaard and James Hillhow in the stroke seat. Looking very loose and relaxed there, but they're gonna really need to drive it, keep the momentum going if they wanna stay on terms with this impressive outfit from China. Beautiful technique from the Chinese crew. They're coached by one of our own, by Tom Kay, one of the best GB lightweights probably in, in history. Um, he used to be part of the Nottingham setup and uh, who's really enjoying coaching out in China. And he was known himself for supreme blade work and he's transmitting all of those lessons over to this crew. He was somebody who had great efficiency of technique, who understood how to move a boat with that real precision. You can see it there, there's no um, you know, extra body movements, it's down very low, it's kind of, you know, very horizontal, uh, the blades aren't digging, and, you know, and they're rowing in a straight line. Again, Tom raced many times at Henley, so he'll have passed on all his knowledge there, and you can see the US crew having some challenges there with their steering, and that, that costs you, you know, the moment where you're down, you give away a little bit more distance again. Yeah, this USA crew will need to correct their steering at the moment, heading towards the boom, but it looks like they're slowly getting back straight in their station but as you say cap that knocks off both speed and it does unsettle the boat a little bit so a bit of an overcorrection there though as they come back towards the chinese crew who are probably also sitting a bit close to the center of the course as well yeah i mean so the usa they're going a longer course now you can see the the, the streak behind them the wake that they leave and now they have overcorrected the chinese are uh, you know, that's quite difficult then because you end up sort of slightly reacting off each other. Um, but the Chinese are far enough ahead now. They just stay even more comfortable. Uh, look at that real smoothness, great synchronicity of the oars, the timing. And, you know, a lot, we often see kind of blades that are going a little bit deep at different parts of the stroke. But I have to say that Chinese crew, again, we see that precision just burying in the blades great acceleration great yeah the power curves down the crew and and that's what you get you get that kind of difference in quality um, really impressed by this crew and record entries from both nations from China and from the United States of America fantastic to have such strong international competition here the Chinese crew moves over into the center of the course now but they're not too concerned because they have well and truly clear water over the crew from the United States of America, from Texas Rowing Center and Vesta Boat Club. So here we see the Chinese rowing crew. They're, they're having a great season. They won at Belgrade World Cup. They won at the Poznan World Cup. And so this is great preparation, great confidence building on their way to the World Championships. And they'll, of course, have seen last year their, their women's crew who won here and were, in, uh, who, who won Henley and were incredibly impressive winning Tokyo. So there is a lot of history making going on now, consistency year to year, uh, experience being you know, handed over, a lot of UK knowledge going into that Chinese rowing team. And I don't want to talk it up too much because the Chinese women are racing the Australians in the final later today, but yeah. we could well be looking at China taking the win in the open men's and women's quads here, being the form crews in both events. And that would make history. And if this crew from China win, and they are looking very dominant at the moment, that will be the first Henny Wall Regatta win for a men's crew from China. So they'll be aware of that. They'll know. They love the, the history that comes with being part of this event, something they had never experienced before. And, you know, there was just in incredible joy for them to be. I remember meeting the sort of women's quad, seeing some of them last night as well. Really, really love being part of this regatta and they are asking big questions at the moment of this US crew. In the stroke seat, James Pilhal is 208 centimetres tall. So I think that's that's close to seven foot counts. So we can see he just looks incredibly easy with his length, with his stroke length, stroking the crew from the USA. Jonathan Kierkegaard at three. He has good experience. He won at Henley in 2016. He won the Prince of Wales. Uh, so, and he's been part of the USA men's double this year. 
Uh, so again, you know, tremendous experience here. Power, you know, Dominique Williams in the bow, former lightweight under 19 world record holder for the Erg Marathon, uh, you know, and was part of the winning double at the head of the Charles uh, last October. So incredible quality in that US crew but they are not able to match the supreme technique, power, cohesion that we're seeing in the China national rowing team men's quad. As I come past the enclosures, huge appreciation for the quality, the absolute quality of rowing there. Oh, I've got a bit of steering happening for both these crews now. They're both too far in the middle. Uh, of course, when you're ahead, you can sometimes want to make sure you're, you're in the safe water, but they are well ahead of the American crew and you know, able to glide through the enclosures, getting all of the appreciation as they supremely dominate this race to make it the first Henny Roll Regatta win for a men's crew from China. Dominant performance there from the World Cup winners in Belgrade and Poznan. So history is made. What an impressive row that was. And they're putting the marker down for the World Championships. They're setting the level for their Chinese women's court to come later today. And well done to Tom Kay, their coach. What a great job he's been doing with them. As we move to an interview now with the St. Cath's crew, winners of the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy. Bronte just described the feeling of crossing that finish line. In front. Absolutely exhilarating. It feels like nothing else. So psyched. You, you came into this regatta as national champions. Was there pressure on to achieve and beat all of the, the world crews? Yeah, obviously a lot of pressure, but throughout the week we've just tried to relax as much as we can and just sort of detach from all the extra added pressures. And how did today's race go for you, given what sort of what happened at the beginning of the week? Yeah, well, after the beginning of the week, I've just tried to sort of step a step back and really relax and trust the process. And today was just amazing. Our crew put our best race forward, and I couldn't be more proud of everyone. It's a long, long way to come. Yeah, and what is it about this crew? Why do you feel that this year's been so successful? We're just the best nine group of girls you could get. Everyone loves each other so much, so supportive. We just act as one. And it's just been amazing to be with them. And I think I owe it to the, them for all this. And what's the support been like back at home and how many people have come over and made the trip? Oh, all our parents, all our families. We love you all and we really appreciate it. And everyone back in Australia, thank you for your support. It's unlike any other and it just means the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bronte Cullen, and congratulations to St. Cats on the victory in the Prince Philip as we move to the Wargrave Challenge Cup. At the start line now of the Wargrave Challenge Cup, the club women's eight. Thank you to Kath Bishop, who's joined me in the commentary box. And I now welcome Zoe de Toledo. Hello there, Sarah. How are you? It's been a wonderful morning for me and the, and the Aussies, but uh, going well so far as we're away now in the Wargrave Challenge Cup, Thames Rowing Club A and Leander Club. Look at that start there for both these women's eights. This is a direct repeat of last year's final. In the Wargrave, Thames Rowing Club back with seven of the nine finalists from last year. So they are going to be looking to put out an early marker against the Leander crew who are holders of this event. Great start there from both crews. Leander on closest on screen to us, Thames Rowing Club in the Barks station up at the top of the screen. Perhaps with just an early race lead here out of the start. Yeah, it looks like Thames crew had a really um, aggressive, powerful start there. They just flew out of those first few strokes. And I think, you know, this Leander crew, they're a younger crew, but they've got international experience, under 23s, home internationals. They are a club development crew, but I think we're seeing that um, sort of cohesive power from Thames, the fact that they've been rowing together for such a long time. That's really um, put them out to a good start here. Yeah, Thames has looked exceptional all week. They're out here to take this win. Make no mistake, the Wargrave Challenge Cup, they've been eyes on the prize. Brilliant rowing from the crew, absolutely the crew to beat. So I think we see there now 
can see at the top of your picture that crew from Thames in the white boat with the black blades just looking like a really long stroke there underwater. These women are all full-time um, workers. You know, they there's, there's a doctor in there, there's a software engineer, a winery project manager. So these women are fitting in two sessions a day on top of a nine to five job. But you can see the quality of their rowing. They really have this very um, long, powerful stroke. You've got some really good athletes in there. Ali Sharp at four, XUL athlete getting that really long, powerful movement under the water. Great shot there, looking down the course. Got pretty good conditions here. It's been very testing for these crews all week. Strong headwind conditions, gusty from the qualifiers onwards, but some lovely weather today. Although deceptive because it is tricky out there. There's still a little bit of breeze on the water and of course, the roll from the pleasure craft moving up and down the course so always challenging here on the course at Henley and I think Thames have put themselves in a really good position here to manage any rougher water that comes along in the second half of the course but let's not forget Leander they are the holders they won the inaugural race last year they're not going to be willing to just let this Thames crew go so I think we need to keep out you know keep an eye out for them especially in the second half of the course Anything can happen, as we know. We've seen it. But dominating this race in the early stages, it is Thames Rowing Club A looking to reverse the result from last year in the bow. Amy Gibson, Ruth Taylor in two, Sarah Carlotti in three, Anna Annie Sharp in four, Jordan Cole Hossein in five, Olivia Rogerson, Christy Davis, the stroke, Jessica Eastwood, coxed by Natalie Kernan. Thames have had a fantastic season this year. You know, they've not been beaten by many crews at all, certainly not crews here from the UK. They were beaten by Brown in Champates at Henley Women's, but they had some fantastic races to get to that point, turned over some crews. We can see now as we come in to look at that Thames crew, we can just about make out the name on the bow of the boat, Baz Moffat. So Baz, Thames alumna, who also represented GB, and she's a fantastic woman and advocate for women's rowing. She continues to work with women in sport in her capacity at the Well HQ, and they really champion female athletes there by tackling some quite difficult subjects that don't really get talked about. For example, making sure athletes have sports bras that fit correctly, making sure uh, female athletes know about how to manage their periods and how to continue competing through that. And I think it's sort of taboo subjects that aren't discussed much, but are really important to female athletes. So she's doing some fantastic work there and great to see her name on the bow of that tennis boat out in front at the moment as they come past and they'll get a massive roar here from the Remenham Club where their, uh, their crews are based. So you can hear that now on the live stream, that big shout for Thames. And what an absolute push on that must be from Thames. They now have clear water over Leander, but to hear that cheer, I mean, that must be an extraordinary pain right now. And hopefully it just helps to take that pain a little bit easier when you hear your club men and women cheering for you like that coming past the clubs. Yeah, so you come past Remenham and then you go into no man's land, that quiet section there just before you get to the enclosures. And Sunday, always a little bit quieter than the Saturday as well, but it's the die-hard rowing fans who are here on the Sunday. And that's why you get so much noise as you come to the enclosures. Look at this Thames crew. I mean, they have dominated this race really from start to finish. Look at that sweep out either side as we can see down the crew here really fantastic display of rowing here from these club women from Thames. Great shot there looking along the bow of the Thames crew currently leading the Wargrave Challenge Cup only in its second year hotly contested event we saw three crews from Australia here all falling to the wayside through the week as we move now to the crew from Leander looking at the bow there of Amy Gibson in front of her Ruth Taylor Oh, rather, so, sorry, that's India Summerside, getting my crews mixed up there. Frances Hunt Davis in the two seat in front of her. Presumably the daughter of one of our fellow stewards, Ben Hunt Davis. I believe so. 
Yeah, impressive athletes here in this crew from Leander as well. You know, they're young athletes, they're up and comers. These are going to be women that you will be seeing probably in our national team over the next few years. But I think today it is going to be for Thames joining the rank of some of their men's crews have also been dominating the club events. But these women have really led from start to finish. And a late charge from Leander here I don't think is going to be enough to get them in front of that bow of the Thames Rowing Club boat. You're right, Zoe, it's going to be two apiece for Thames. The men taking out the Brit earlier in the day, coming across the line now. It is Thames Rowing Club taking out the Wargrave. Making up for last year, defeating Leander. What a dominant row. Incredible performance from this crew all week, stepping up day on day. Thames Rowing Club A, victors in the Wargrave Challenge Cup. Look at that shot there of the coxswain, Natalie Kernan, full-time doctor, on the water today. Brilliant to see these women win in such a dominant fashion. Fantastic crew. Fantastic display of club women's rowing with Thames Rowing Club A, dominant over Leander Club to take the win today. It's been fantastic joining you in the commentary box this morning. All the best for the next few races. Really looking forward to seeing the next one, but I will hand over to Matt Britton. What an exciting afternoon. Matt Britton here joining Zoe de Toledo in the commentary box to bring you up to lunchtime. Four more Henley finals to go. The sun has finally shone after monsoon. Biblical conditions yesterday afternoon. Some of the most tricky conditions Zoe, I've ever seen at Henley. Yeah, absolutely. I think the I mean the rain is always unpleasant to row in, but it was the wind over the last few days that have really caused some difficult conditions, trouble steering. And I think uh, it'll be interesting to see today how these two elite men's Cox 4s manage that. Hopefully it should be a bit easier for them. Yeah, you know, the conditions yesterday really tested some, we saw multi-Olympic and world medalists struggling with steering through the course. It is a bit more settled, but it's still tricky conditions. There are a lot more pleasure boats out here today. As the sun beats down on the Australian Coxless 4, they will face the Brits here. And it's a straight final in this event. This is the Open Coxless Falls event, the International Cruise uh, event. We'll talk you through the cruise in a second, but uh, there you can see the faces of the British team starting to focus in. They're both attaching now to the stake boats um, and getting aligned, and they'll come under starter's orders in a moment. So looking there at the green and gold of the Australian men's four. And at the top of your picture, you'll see the crew from Brooks and Leander, the burgundy of Brooks and the white and pink of Leander. Yeah, we can just see the, the race clock there showing at about minutes to go before the start of the race. So the athletes will all just be thinking Brooks. through the process and the race plan. Australia. You can hear the umpire when I see that you are both calling them to ready. attention. That's Richard Phelps, like this. British uh, an Olympic uh, world Go. competitor. So, Get ready, please. this is the Stewards Challenge Cup. It's the Open Men's Coxless Fours. We have Oxford Brooks and Leander representing Great Britain and Rowing Australia representing Australia closest to the camera. Straight final. These guys have been waiting and waiting and waiting through the six days of record-breaking Henley. The wait's over. Go! Sharper start from Australia there. Getting a few more strokes in early, but also a little bit of trouble steering, just heading back over now to their station early on. But I think they've jumped out early on that crew from Oxford Brooks and Leander. There we can see that Australian crew really strong, moving in time as they come out of their start sequence. Yeah, a little bit of a warning, a little bit of a glance on the steering. Australia steer away from uh, Great Britain. And, well, there's a lot of experience in this Australian crew. Three of the four of them won gold in Tokyo. And in comes Jack O'Brien in the stroke seat from the eight that was sixth in Tokyo. So I guess you'd expect them to have a bit of an advantage. My goodness, look at that. They really got the jump. You called it spot on, Zoe. Yeah, I think they are the form crew, as you said. You know, they've got that Olympic champion experience. 
this British crew by comparison. Sort of the third ranked sweep crew in the team. Uh, Matt Aldridge has come in after winning GB trials in the pair and racing in the pair. But you can see that actually looks like the crew from Rowing Australia has just started to stretch out onto their lower race pace, whereas the crew from Brooks and Leander are continuing to hold it quite high and maybe pushing back now a little bit onto this Australian crew. So they just went through the quarter mile signal, you saw it there, and it's lane two. Uh, the signal goes up to show the advantage they have. As Zoe was talking, you could see the boat speeds both coming down towards that, what they can say to sustain through the middle of the course. There are the Australian oars moving in synchronization, as you'd expect from a four where three of the members have been together for a couple of years, one Olympic gold. I mean, that gives you an enormous level of confidence, doesn't it? Zoe is a silver medalist from Rio. You know how much that medal went work means to you as an athlete yeah absolutely it's something that you've aimed for your entire life but look at this i think the brits are coming back now a little bit onto the crew from rowing australia how many times matt have we seen gb versus australia in the men's consular sports this is one of the iconic rivalries of the sport really yeah, isn't it absolutely we look at the experience base there of freddie davison in the stroke seat for the british four junior and under 23 champion stroke of the Cambridge boat race crew he's known to set a lovely fluid rhythm and perhaps that is going to give them a bit more of an advantage as they come into the middle of the course they really need to stay on terms and as Zoe said look you can see those the indicators on the left of our picture the uh, quarter mile and then the barrier indicator just half a length in it uh, to the the barrier marker that's about 600 odd, odd meters from the start so I we're into the second quarter through. I think they've gone through Matt it looks like they've moved through the Australians there this is would be a fantastic turn up for this new British lineup all these guys you know two of them raced at the first World Cup and won there but two new athletes into the crew including Sam Nunn who we can see at two there in the white visor who's just come back from major hip surgery this year so he's going to be looking to put down a marker in this event and to set a seat for the World Championships yeah, later this year. Absolutely, I just uh, saw Will Stewart sitting, steering in the bow seat in his white Leander singlet there on the British call, making a call. I think he's calling there for a further push as they approach the halfway mark. So that's a critical second quarter of the course here for the British crew on the right of our picture, really attacking to hold on to the Australians. Australia staying calm, I think, but they haven't seemed to change their pace in response to the British crew as yet. I think that Australian crew just look a little bit more dynamic now actually look at them go i think they might have just raised their rate there looks like they're just deciding like you say critical part of the course that they need to push back through and they have just got their bows back ahead this is a fantastic race from these australians who like you say comfortable just to sit a little bit down brave to wait for their time and have now moved right back through the Brits. So this is the stewards, the open men's Cotsless Force, two great international crews here. The first quarter of the race went to the Australians. The second quarter, the British crew attacked and had the edge. Now we look, both of them, 35 strokes a minute, both of them moving pretty fast here. The Australians are looking to win the third quarter of this race, and it does look to me like they've got the edge. Zoe called it, they started to take it up a little bit, attack it a little bit more, a little bit more dynamic with the legs on the Australian crew. Can the British respond? Those Australians now are sitting in that one length up, which is a bit of a danger point for the crew behind. This is something we talk about a lot in boat race crews when you're one on one. That is the point where you've got to make sure as the losing crew that the winning crew does not break away and get clear water. You've got to keep in contact. You want to keep your bow overlapping their stern. Matt, you know if you're in that position, you've got to say, right, this is it, we're going now. Yeah, it's what I call kitchen sink time. Meanwhile, here we look at the face of the Australian stroke, Jack O'Brien, who jumped in from the sixth place Tokyo 8 to join uh, his gold medalist colleague, so there's some pressure on him, but he is stroking well, just lifting when he needs to. And the tactics here are so important, aren't they? It's kind of responding and attacking and pacing what you do between those two things. Again, the Brits attack. They have an overlap still on the Australian crew. Just at the one mile signal, you can see they were just uh, about to stern at the one mile signal and coming into the closing quarter of this race. Who's going to win this section? Not just the tactics of today, Matt, but the tactics of the rest of the season, because this isn't the last time these crews are going to meet. Both of them are racing at Lucerne in the third World Cup next week. 
and likely both of them racing at the World Championships in September as well. Yeah, and you know, the British crew are on the rise, I think. We saw in the first World Cup, they beat the uh, Netherlands by two seconds. The second World Cup, the Australians beat the Netherlands by one second. So there's good form here. A little bit of steering from the British crew on the right of our picture, preparing for the final stage. I think just from the indicator, I can see they've gained a quarter of a length probably in the last minute or so of this race and now unbelievable race here from the brits i think on the form book the australians should have had it easy here but this british crew from brooks and leander have not read that form book and they look like they are charging again now have they left it too late to get back through 10 strokes to go the home crowds at their feet in the stewart enclosure finals day at henley royal regatta australia great britain we've seen it before in the coxless falls leander are going hard the australians looking a bit ragged on the line who's it going to be whoa that looked like a dead heat to me matt well we're going to have to look at the photograph for me i think the australians may have it by 10 centimeters but it's always dangerous to call in the heat of the moment let's, let's have, a, have look. a look looks like the australians got it on the surge Wow, that is literally, as you say, the surge, just the randomness of whether the boat is coming off the finish and surging or slowing towards the catch. So we wait for the official confirmation on that, but it looked to me like the, the 10 centimetres was all that was in it. After 2,112 metres, it came down to fewer than 10 centimetres. Unbelievable charge there at the end from that British group. They could not be stopped, really, just one stroke more and it might have been a different story. I mean, credit to the British crew because I think the Australians have the form there and they have been chased by the Brits to 10 centimetres. These three Olympic champions won uh, Olympic sixth place in the A sitting at the stroke seat. Let's see what the official verdict is. The crews are just outside our commentary box here, also looking to wait for that confirmation. Yeah, you can tell by the looks on their faces that they didn't know yeah, that's right. In, your, in a situation like that, I've, I've won medals by uh, photo finishes before. Fortunately, never lost them. But there you go. That is the final stroke, the surge, as you said it. So you cross the line like that and you just don't know. The official verdict is a foot. They're in imperial measurements still here at Henley Regatta, but the, they beat by a foot. Um, what a verdict and what a win. So confirmation of the victory. Like we said, one of the iconic rivalries of our sport, Australia versus Great Britain in the Coxless Men's Fours. Unbelievable race in the stewards today, and we'll see, will be fantastic to see how they go through the season. Amazing scenes here on Henley Sunday. It's finals day, the biggest ever Henley regatta. The church, as it has done since the beginning, looks down on the beautiful straight Henley course, full of spectators colourful scenes with boats moored all the way along the course on the one side and the packed stewards and other enclosures uh, on the other side. We can just see a crew coming for a lunchtime row past there. We have crews who've won in the past coming and celebrating um, its centenaries or shorter decades since their wins. But now we're going to take you up to uh, the start and have a look at what's coming next on our programme. Just three races until the lunch interval. What a packed morning we've had. Looking forward uh, to more excitement all the way through the afternoon right until 4 UK. the umpire's launch and the start pontoons revealing the crews sitting there for the Ireland Challenge Cup final. This is the student women's eight event and we have Brown University from the USA. Yesterday they beat the record for this event by 17 seconds. Now in fairness this event only started last year, so they had one record to beat, but 17 seconds and last year was no slouches. The holders, Brooks, were pretty fast down the course, so this crew has formed. They beat the record to each of our key markers, the barrier, Foley, and the finish line. So that's the crew to beat Brown University. And facing them, also from the USA, five of them from the Varsity 8, four from the second Varsity 8, it's Yale University. So excited to see this race, Zoe. I think this is going to be a great race. The last time these crews saw each other in a direct battle, there was two tenths of a second between them. So I think we are going to be in for some uh, special scenes here. We just had a photo finish in the stewards, the open men's coxless fours. Will the stewards need that line camera again for this race? Prediction there of a close race. 
Here comes umpire is on their feet, giving them instructions. They're all sat forward. The two Cox's hands are up, indicating they're not aligned yet. They're not ready to go. The hands have to go down. Get ready, please. And the ducks pass by. Uh, an aeroplane thunders overhead. A little bit of noise to unsettle the athletes, but the hands are down. Expect a very close race. Go. So it's Brown at University on the left and Yale University on the right. The Americans have bought their fastest crews in the student women's eights to Henley to race off for this coveted Island Challenge Cup trophy. Clean start, powerful start. It looks like Yale are trying to do everything they can to rattle the Brown crew, Zoe. Absolutely. Yale, I guess you could say, are the underdogs. They haven't beat Brown yet this season. Uh, Yale are coming over here, not quite the same crew as they've had during their main US season. Two British women actually had to come out due to previous wins or ineligibility. But it looks like it is Brown with all but their all but one of their athletes from their 1B crew this year who've got out to an early start. But Yale moving really nicely there. Again, they look like they're getting quite a lot of time with their blades in the water compared to slightly shorter strokes from Brown. Although. That's a bit of a hallmark of the Brown crew. Feisty, distinctive in their style, higher on the rate. They often look short, but they still do really get movement of their blades under the water. Great insight, insights from Olympic Cox. Zoe de Toledo alongside me here. Absolutely, you can see the Brown crew. Shorter, punchier stroke. Lovely long stroke, dynamic stroke from the Yale crew, crew closest to the camera. We can see Aparajita Chauhan in the Cox's seat, urging on Claire Dirks in the stroke seat there. And you can see it's pretty neck and neck at this point uh, in the course. Brown versus Yell. It's an all-American final in the Island Challenge Cup. As we look down the course, and it looks like Brown, with that punchier stroke, have been able to ease out to maybe a third of a length over their Yale competitors. There's yellow flag, which indicates the first timing marker, the barrier at 637 metres down this course. It's really the first quarter of the course, and I'd say the first quarter of the race probably goes to Brown at this point. Has that punchy start been expensive for them? We'll see as the middle of the race starts to unfold now. It looks like they've just crept out a little bit there. I think what will be interesting to see is that these two programs have very different styles in terms of how they run their year. Brown have this really racy program. I heard that there's a rumor that they do a 2K every single week on a Monday. Whereas Yale, they're much more about um, they're much more about their volume. They do longer sessions. So will a longer course here at Henley, a longer race than they're used to, will that work in Yale's favor? We'll see. 2K uh, test on the ergo, that's one of the most painful things one can do if you're not familiar with it. And that's the punishing program of Brown. That leads them to the punchy, aggressive, highly competitive style that we can see here on the right of the picture. Yell a bit longer. And in the middle of the course, you need to have something that's sustainable. And that's the question. What's the base pace that both these crews can sustain for the 1,000 plus middle, middle of the course section here at Henley? Um, you can see it's getting warmer here. And that makes it, you know, the water a little bit more fluid. I'm not sure whether we'll see any records tumble because we've still got a little bit of a headwind but the winds have really dropped it's almost perfect conditions and perfect pictures here wherever you're watching if you're watching us from the US good morning to you this is an all-american event now the American name will go on the beautiful new Island Challenge Cup trophy trophy the question is will it be Brown or will it be Yale yeah Brown University look like they've maybe just got that clear water advantage now over the crew from Yale I think Brown have used that feisty early start quite well. They also have some experience. They won at Henley Women's Regatta, the Champ 8 event, uh, just a few short weeks ago. So they've got that experience of racing between the booms. Will they be able to hold it all the way from the finish line for Henley Women's at Remenham down right to us in Stewart's? Well, I can see the Yale crew really attacking as they must do now as they go through the three-quarter mile signal. You can see lane one, Brown University broke the record by 17 seconds yesterday, beating uh, Oxford Brooks A crew. They beat Nereus on Friday and Newcastle University on, uh, on Thursday pretty easily. But look at Yale, 
really explosive attacking here. They're desperate to get back on terms in this third quarter of the race. Yeah, and Yale have form doing this. Yesterday they raced you well, and actually, I think we all set, thought that Yale had that race pretty much in hand. But the Yale crew were just more effective in their rowing. They were efficient, they were neat, and that pulled them back through. And that's what's happening here again as well. It looks like that crew from Yale is starting to put themselves back on terms now with Brown University. Yeah, absolutely right. They were led by University of London A crew yesterday and came through around the three-quarter mile marker. Now, they've already passed the three-quarter mile marker, so they've left themselves with more to do later in the race. That's a big, big ask, particularly having had quite a tough race. Coming from behind generally suggests it's been a harder race for those athletes. So those legs, the question for the women in Yale, have they got what it takes in those legs? Does that weekly 2K ergo test fearsome, fearsome training from the Brown crew give them the speed they need? We're into the third quarter of the race and starting to approach the stewards enclosure and the crowds will be looking forward to this one. Looks to me like Brown have actually managed to absorb that push now from Yale. Yale are going to have a huge amount to do if they want to overturn at this point. So if you're here on the riverbank or if you're home in the US and you are cheering on that Yale crew, get on your feet because they are going to need that now as they come into the last part of this race if they are going to overturn this crew from Brown. Brown versus Yale, USA versus USA. There's the back of Beata Katz in the brown seat. She and in front of her, Eloise Baker, their job at Bow and Two is to set the boat up to make it a stable platform to keep the strokes quick and fast and sharp. And Brown really is a sharp crew, isn't it? Looking at the way that they're rowing. As you said, right from the start, they've been punchier, sharper, uh, and that kind of really has paid off through the middle of the course. That can often be expensive, but I think Yale, you can see a slightly longer, slightly lower stroke rate there from the Yale crew, and that's not been enough in the middle of the course to break Brown's lead. I think Brown were just willing to put themselves right in the fire from the word go. Yale, maybe a more efficient stroke, maybe a little bit neater, but it is Brown who are comfortably leading now. Clear water over Yale, as you can hear the cheers from the crowds coming through the stewards' enclosure. So we've gone through the mile in the 1800 metres, only 300 metres left to go now, less than that. The crowd are on their feet, applauding Brown. They take it up with confidence. Let's see what they've got. There's no point in leaving anything in the tank. There isn't a race tomorrow. Let's see the speed they can get. Can they crack through the last 10 strokes? Beautiful row from Brown, punchy from the start. Yale responding with length and strength, but it hasn't been enough. The young women from Brown University, USA, they put their name for the second time only in the history of Henley. The Ireland Challenge Cup has been won, and it's been won well from the start by Brown over Yale. What a race. Yeah, you can see just how much it's taken out of that Brown crew. Barely enough uh, left in them to give a cheer, but I'm sure they have enjoyed watching that Yale crew behind them as they came through there, through the finish line. So, yeah, Brown, punchy from the start, led all the way through the race. We weren't sure whether they could keep up that cadence, that intensity, but they did exactly that. And, in fact, they took it up towards the end uh, to beat Yale. A great race and some fantastic racing we've had in this new student women's event. In fact, all three new student, uh, new women's eights events have produced cracking races through the uh, event. And it sounds like they've set a course record both to the barrier and to Fawley beating their times yesterday, not in the fastest conditions. Brilliant race from the Brown women. So, it's time now for us to look to the final of the Visitors Challenge Cup. It's the intermediate men's fours race. Really intense competition here. We've seen great crews throughout the week, half of them going out every day. And let's see what happens at the final. So this is the final of the Visitors' Challenge Cup. The 175th year of this race, established in 1847. And we have Tideway Scholar School and Bonsley Boat Club here. We're looking at composite crew, um, the British. And on the far side, it is University of Washington, fierce competitors, both racing for this trophy held by Oxford Brooks University, who won so many trophies last year when we had fewer international um, competitors, but it's going to be a fresh name on the trophy at the end of this race. Looking forward to this one, Zoe. 
Let's see if Tideways Colors and Molsey have a better time of their steering today. They've struggled a bit this week. Hopefully, like you said, better weather. Maybe an easier ride. It's the Visitors Challenge Cup final, the 175th year. It's University of Washington on the left of our picture and Tideway Scholars and Molsey on the right. They go away straight, they go away cleanly. You can see the flat water, mirror-like conditions here at the start. Yep, but there we have it, that Tideway Scholars and Molsey crew just creeping out into the middle of the river. This is a crew that is a presumptive under-23 crew for Great Britain, not yet named, but they are up against a crew from the University of Washington that are around half of their first B crew. Now, these fours have been posting pretty similar times all week, so I think it is going to be neck and neck down the course here, as it looks here, moving away from the island. Yeah, cracking start to what could be an absolutely cracking race. The Scullers and Molsey crew nearest us had a little bit of a challenge with their steering yesterday when they were racing uh, against the Oxford University B crew. But to get here, they beat Munster, they beat Oxford A, they beat Oxford B, and here they are in the final facing Washington on the far side, who rolled over two Dutch crews and then Thames and Leander yesterday uh, to, put, to book their spot here on Henley Sunday. It's finals day. It's the Visitors Challenge Cup for intermediate men, and at the moment it really is hard to call. I think it's stroke for stroke. Interesting to see as they were sitting on the start line that that crew from Scullers and Molsey have made their colours really well known. Two of these men rode at Harvard University, two of them rode at Yale, and I saw at least one Harvard cap and two Yale caps there. They obviously want to make sure their crew from the University of Washington know that. And I'm calling Washington the Americans, but actually, Four non-Americans in that crew, an Austrian, a Canadian, someone from the Netherlands, someone from New Zealand, but they are experienced athletes, under 23 experience, and it looks like maybe that better time, that more time together has just pushed them out ahead, and I think they've got the lead there on the British crew. One of the things I love about our sport is across nationalities, across universities, across clubs, you get to compete hard and then you get to combine and row together. And we've got some real experience here as we look at the left-hand crew, which is Molsey and Tideway Scholars they're rowing at. We've got uh, the winner of the Princess Elizabeth Challenge Cup in 2021. Harry Geffen was with the Eton crew that won there. Uh, Dow de Graaf in the stroke seat. Well, he was in that legendary St. Paul's School crew that set the record, smashed the record in the Princess Elizabeth um, a few years ago, 2018. So lots of experience of Henley there. And at the moment, well, it looks to me like the Washington crew are rather calmer. Uh, the British crew, the left-hand side crew, are attacking more. Yeah, I think this British crew, not only are they obviously going to want to secure this win today, but they are also going to want to be writing their names on some seats that will be going to Varese for the Under-23 World Championships at the end of this month. I heard uh, gossip on the towpath that said there are still 86 rowers in contention trialling next week for under-23 selection. So this is a chance for these four men to book a seat early. So if you're joining us watching from the USA or anywhere around the world, you're watching a real tournament here. This is a great place, Zoe says, to demonstrate your pedigree, to show the world what you can do. The eyes of the world who love rowing are watching racing like this, and here we go. We're getting through to the middle of the course, passing that marker is exactly halfway. Looks to me like Tideway Scullers and Molsey on the left of the picture have had a better second quarter of the race here. Yeah, I think another little wiggle on the uh, on the steering there in that British crew, but like you were saying, that experience for these men, they've got some winning experience at Henley before. Looks like that's paying off, and. I've got them neck and neck there, I reckon, coming through past Washington now. Yeah, very exciting here. The water gets a bit flatter here. Looks like lane two has gone up first on that marker, which is the three-quarter mile marker. It's 1,200 metres down the course. So Molsey and Tideway Scullers nearest to us, they've got their nose in front now. That's a massive turnaround there as we see this shot play out. You can see they've got nearly a length now on that crew from Washington, and they are still moving away every single stroke. Great move by Molsey and Scullers there. Washington now really need to respond. And have they got what it takes to lift their game in this third quarter? This is where everything's hurting. The legs are burning. It's hard to focus mentally, and you need to absolutely focus mentally. In a small boat like the Coxless 4, you have to do everything together. A little bit of steering, uh, though the water is quite a bit flatter here. So Tideway Scullers and Molsey have taken the lead. Umpire Gwyn Batten 
raises her flag and just warns them off. Zoe called it. It was a little bit tricky to steer there. Immediate correction, but that slows the boat a little bit, that swerve that they've done there. Yeah, good quick correction from them there. But like you say, that's how the rudder works. Every time you use it, it acts as a brake. So you want to be using it as little as possible. And like we've been saying earlier on in the week, you only want to do 2,112 metres, not any more. But I think that British crew is still holding on to this lead from the University of Washington. What can Jack Walke now, Canadian, son of two Canadian Olympians, what can he do at stroke in that Washington crew to raise his boat up? And will that British crew stay out of trouble with their steering? They're approaching the mile and eighth. That's 108,011 metres down the track. Bolsey and Scullers still have their nose in front. Have they stretched it out towards half a length? We're looking there at the back of Harry Geffen, then Calvin Tarzi. Miles Beeson and the stroke Dal de Graaf as they are again warmed by umpire Batten in her distinctive Thames Rowing Club summer uniform there. Again, a bit of expensive steering. That break goes on to get them away, back off the centre line of the course. Yeah, that bow steers from Mattis Holler in the Washington crew. Looks like they've had an easier ride of this. And is that going to mean that as they come into the end of this race, they have a little bit extra to give? There you see them, University of Washington raising that rate. You can see the eyes there of the Husky on the back of their boat. And it is coming now for that British crew. So we've got another crack on our hands. The Washington crew looking across Logan Ulrich in the three seat glances across again at sideways Scullers and Molsey who are sprinting for the line. It's a sprint for both crews. The legs are burning, the lungs are bursting. You've got to get the oars in the water as many times as you can. It's going to be close. Pull out that photo finish camera. Whoa. Washington think they've got it. I think they probably had it by another foot maybe. They are absolutely exuberant. Whoa! Going for a little bit of a swim there. Gert van Dorn, be careful. Don't want anybody the in the water coming there. Coming together hard there Coming together well. on the line. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, that's a clear win for the University of Washington, and they knew it as soon as they went over the line. The hands raised up, and you can see them there. We can see them from the commentary box. Both boats have come together and actually shaking hands right there in the boats. Incredible sportsmanship, incredible race from both crews. Well, it was hard to separate them down the course. It's hard to separate them now as they've crossed the finish line in exhaustion and celebration. The Scullers and Molsey crew were beaten there on the line by the University of Washington, who took an early lead. Scullers and Molsey won the middle of the course, but you've got to win the final closing metres. Well, you can see what winning at Henley means, doesn't it? You come all the way around the world here. There's the excitement, the elation, the jubilation from the University of Washington beating a fantastic rising British development crew. Yeah, lead changed several times there through the race, but that British crew just didn't have enough to respond as the Huskies charged back hard at the end. So now the question is, can this British crew keep their names on those seats? and change something in the next few weeks before they get to the under-23s. Fantastic race. What excitement here. We have to calm our nerves because we go to the quiet and the relative calm of the start before an explosion into the, the final of the Princess Grace Challenge Cup. Looking forward to this. It's the last race before lunch here on Henley Sunday, finals day at Henley. looking at the faces of Olympic gold medalists from Tokyo, three of the four of this Chinese crew won gold in this boat class. They were world champions in 2019. The two seat has come in from the Coxless Four Xu Lu, uh, Coxless Four Tokyo competitors as well. So these are the world's best quad scholars uh, from China and they're up against a new combination from Australia. Look at that focus. Got to raise your game to beat the Olympic champions. This is the moment of calm that precedes the storm that is the race. Yeah, we're seeing here on the right of your picture three of the 11 Tokyo gold medalists that will be racing today. I think they're going to put on a good show for us. Well, here at Henley, it's a race for silver. It's a race for the Australia. Princess Grace Challenge China. Cup. 
established in 2001, named for like Princess this. Grace, whose brother Attention. won the singles here at Henley in 1947 and 1949. Ready, Rowing royalty, and these Chinese are the ones to beat. Rising crew from Australia will want to do exactly that. Let's see what kind of a plan of attack they have to take Attention. on the world's best. Go. It's the Princess Grace Challenge Cup. Australia and China, away they go. Yeah, and we heard the distinctive yell of the Chinese crew, similar to how they work in their eights as well. They actually shout out the first few strokes. It seems to help them keep in time, and you can see there, look at that crew, how neat they are going off the start, how synchronized they are together, even at that high rate. Yeah, and the Chinese have dominated their way through this event. Leander A, they took them easily on Friday. Yesterday it was New Zealand, three and three-quarter length, a pretty strong verdict there from the Chinese, and they'll be looking to unfold exactly the same race plan. I watched both of those races, and at this point they were already charging away. What can Australia do to respond? They're going to expect the Chinese to be fast. They've got to be at their most dynamic here. Yeah, we can see that yellow stripe down the legs of the Australian crew. Four pairs of legs really working together. Two bronze medalists from Tokyo here in the women's quad and two new athletes into this crew, but already they look like they are going to be no match for this crew from China on the right-hand side of the picture. Beautiful conditions here, 37 strokes a minute each boat, so it's stroke for stroke. But at the moment, the same number of strokes by the Chinese have put them, well, a, a, a few metres down the course further than the Australians already. And there we see the super focused, super experienced Chinese quad skulls. Three of them gold medalists, as you said, one dropping in from the Coxless four. And look at that. You can see everything moving together. This is a fantastic display of quality sculling here from this Chinese crew. Three of these athletes, like we've said, from Tokyo. Three who won the Princess Grace here in 2019. Will that established unit pay off here now as we move into the middle part of the course where you just need to make every single inch count? I think the Australians might have actually come back a little bit now from that slower start. Still pretty much stroke for stroke in terms of the rate. Maybe the Australians just edging it. But we can see again another great display of quality sculling here yeah, from this hard. Australian. Crew. Very hard to call it technically between these two, two crews. You can see Tara Rigney sitting at bow, having a glance across. Where are the Chinese? That means they're just slipping out her, her field of vision as she calls um, their crew to attack again. You need to really stay on terms, don't you, in this second quarter of the race. Losing overlap here can be very, very difficult to respond to. And so it's everything the Australians need to do right now. Don't wait until later. You've got to start doing it now, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to give too much distance. Mind you, we've seen some brilliant races already this morning where we thought crews were out and they've come right back. And that's what Henley is so special for. It's for making those moments where the form book does get overturned. And you would say that the Chinese are ahead on that front. Rowing Australia raced in Poznan as well, where the Chinese won and they came fourth there. There has been one change to that crew. So will that seat change be enough to let them overturn the Chinese here? And they put themselves right back in contention now. Yeah, we see through all of these open events, they're a perfect opportunity to really test new combinations to refine the crews as they come towards the World Championships. And of course, we're in the first of a shortened three-year Olympic cycle now. So this is when you start to try to establish the core of the crews that you want to go through to compete in Paris. And it looks to me like the Australians, well, they've, they've found a rather easier, perhaps a bit more efficient rhythm than that far start phase. And they're sculling really pretty well. So two top class quads at the top of their game competing at the top of our programme, as we go into lunch at here at Henley Royal Regatta, the Chinese have not been too bothered by opposition to date. Leander and New Zealand went down to the Chinese quad machine here, the gold medalists. They're starting to come together a bit, Zoe. Yeah, again, I think we might have a problem here with the steering from both crews. This looks a little bit like mutual water, the middle, the centre of the river here, which could cause some problems as they come down. It looks like maybe three quarters of a length now for that Chinese crew. So the Australians have come back into the game. They've still got overlap on the Chinese. That could be enough for the Australians, but we'll need to see a change of gear from Australia if they're going to stop 
the Chinese national rowing team. Australia a stroke a minute above the Chinese. They'll need that advantage because the Chinese base pace at 34 strokes a minute has been pretty devastating for other crews through this regatta. Can Australia do it? Have they got an extra gear? Can they get an extra stroke or two a minute in there as they start to approach the mile marker and the final phase of the race? Yeah, so it looks like we can see the Australian crew there just heading back on to work towards their booms. Looking for a little bit more clear water there. You can hear them shout to each other, encouraging each other on. This Australian crew is building through their European season onto the World Championships again in September. But will that established unit from China be able to continue holding them off? Yeah, you want to be unbreakable in a crew like this, don't you? Whatever conditions, whatever competitors throw at you, you want to know that you've got the confidence to be able to respond. And I think the Chinese just look so calm, don't they? Every time they row down this course, they just like they're totally in control of the boat and they're totally in control of the race. But Australia inch back a bit further, I think, as we come to the enclosures. The crowds will be yelling this final race before lunch on the biggest ever, the biggest ever Henley Regatta. It's China, Australia. China has led all the way down the track. And now we're coming to the mile in the eighth and the last 400 meters of the course. Yeah, these Chinese women are going to have one eye on that trophy. This trophy that three of them have won before, they are going to want to join their men's squad, who we saw earlier today winning in the open men's event. Can they hold off this charge now? It's starting to look a tiny bit ragged in that Chinese crew, which is something I haven't really seen from them yeah, before. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They've been pressed by these Australians more than anyone else has pressed them. The Australians came through the other side of the draw quite well. Um, and now it's China under pressure with Australia starting to stray towards the booms there. They need to correct that because they don't want to waste any time as this charge needs to be efficient. It needs to be the final charge from Australia. That looks treacherously close to those booms there from Australia. And I think that has given China the opportunity to relax back out and hold this off. But here come Australia. Can they put themselves back on terms now? Top class quad sculling from eight women at the top of their game coming to Henley Regatta. Here come the Chinese. They've dominated the event, the event, but the Australians really took it to them. Overlap at the finish. That's the closest the Chinese have been chased by anybody. Wow. Top quality quad sculling in the Princess Grace. And the trophy will be engraved by the four names on the Chinese national rowing team quad for the second time at Henley Regatta. What a class quad. It was absolutely so, and I know that won't be the result that Australia wanted, but I think that's a pretty big turnaround for them in their international season. So I think we're going to want to keep an eye on them as we go through to Lucerne and the Worlds later this year. Yeah, you know, it's a new combination from Australia. They'll be devastated in the moment, but I think, you know, they will be quite happy to be able to get that close to the Chinese in retrospect. When they look at what they've learned from this campaign and this, this Henley campaign in particular, I think there's a good sign that they've got real speed there. I was really impressed with the way they came back through the race there, Zoe. Yeah, absolutely so. It looked early on like China were just going to go and keep moving, but actually Australia stayed in contention. They put a real pressure on them. They made the Chinese look a little tighter on their rowing and a little scrappier for the first time I think I've ever seen. So a great performance there from Australia as well. It's finals day at the biggest ever Henley Royal Regatta. Six days of top class racing at every level, junior, college, club, and internationals splashing through the Henley waters with joy in the spirit of competition. We've seen some amazing races. We're halfway through the final program. On the final day, we've got incredible racing still to come. Join us uh, in an hour's time for the last few finals at Henley Royal Regatta 2022. Yes, thank you very much for watching our live coverage wherever you are in the world. Wow, what a morning we've had, 13 intense finals and we've got it all again this afternoon. A great way to finish there, the Chinese team dominant here this week. Not surprising really, given the three of the four of them won gold medals in Tokyo 2020. Great to see them here. They tasted victory for the first time in 2019 and again this year.
but it has been a fantastic morning for everyone, not just the top end of the sport like these girls. We've seen the students and the atmosphere here on this winner's podium, this winner's pon pontoon rather, has been um, amazing. The emotions um, have, have really rarely see these in, in sport and the support from all of the family, friends and uh, fellow students and schools. Um, but as I said, we've got 13 more finals to come after lunch. We'll be back with a live coverage just before 2.30. So enjoy your lunch, enjoy your break and we'll see you then. Get ready, please. So the pressure building now. This is it, the big moment in the Britannia, the final London Rowing Club A against Thames Rowing Club to the right of your picture. Finals day 2022 now underway with the first of 26 of Britannia. And this all important start, and immediately you're seeing on the Buck Station, the right hand side, Thames Rowing Club battling to keep close to the island, which suggests there is a bit of a breeze across the water. These are two supremely well drilled crews. Here, Stuart Heap has taken over London Rowing Club this year and has already made a huge impact both on the men's and the women's side. And it's good to see this crew how well they're rowing. By the very fact that they've got to finals day, they're all going to be classy on the water today, and you'd expect. Good clean starts from all the boats, and that's what we've got in this particular one. Just having a look, Thames Rowing Club being uh, encouraged to get back onto their side of the water. They have taken a lead, though, so they'll be absolutely satisfied in the early stages. Powerful, explosive start off the pontoon, and they've taken a lead. London Rowing Club, see there, the data, 38 strokes a minute. That's a pretty lively start to this race. It is, they're keeping it quite high, and you can see there on the speed that of the, the Thames crew here are moving away. It's going to be interesting now that it looks like Thames there have found their rhythm and they're into something they're going to, that resembles their cruising speed. Whereas the left hand side there, maybe um, London Rowing Club is still on top of it a bit harder, but that's a great transition. You hear the blade work from Thames Rowing Club. Yeah, good. The uh, technical skills of Thames Rowing Club showing through there with a slower stroke rate, a reduced stroke rate, but shifting the boat quicker. So uh, energy-wise, they might have a bit more in the tank in a couple of minutes' time. And I think that point about energy-wise is really important. We've seen a few times this week of crews going out well, rowing well, but actually maybe over overcooking it and then getting rowed through later on in the race. So we're wanting to really find out as this unfolds who's worked too hard or who's been efficient so far. So this is London Rowing Club. Both these boats had their semi-finals on a Friday evening, and London Rowing Club, who we can see here, beat Hinksy by two lengths on Friday evening, which seems quite a long time ago. They've had a, a day off to, to freshen up, like Thames Rowing Club, who uh, beat Vesta in their semi-final by a length and a half. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting thing, is that now they knew they made the final on Friday, they a whole day. They would have gone rowing on the Saturday, just to keep being busy. But the mental side of that day off, trying not to think about it too much, trying not to be wasting any nervous energy. Who manage themselves well on Saturday will have an impact on today as well. It's a discipline, isn't it, that's required. And everyone imagines uh, discipline-wise is when you're in the gym and uh, putting in the hard yards, but actually on a long regatta like this, here at Thames Rowing Club again being spoken to by the umpire. I don't think they'll be too anxious, though, will they? They'll most of all be uh, looking at that lead that they've crafted and think, well, we're going all right here. Yep, it's they a seem good to, start. Even, even from that data there, we can see that it still seems to be moving a bit quicker, but Thames getting warned once again by the umpire to get across. But the, yeah, the Cox 4 is a boat where you can actually change the boat speed quite a lot, so depending on how much um, London Rowing Club have got in the tank, but they need to do something quite soon, really, where they're probably halfway down the course now. Yeah, Thames being spoken to again, the umpire not taking any nonsense from them encouraging them to stay on their side of the water. The stats point to a really tight race. If you look at the semi-finals, they got to barrier 205 and 206 in their respective semi-finals. They got to falling in 331 and 332 in their semi-finals. And there was only a couple of seconds in terms of time difference when they got over the finish line. So that points to a really tight race here. But at the moment, Thames, despite being spoken to by the umpire a couple of times for some steering issues, have fought out a good lead. Adrian. Yeah, and, and there's a bit of discrepancy coming on the, on the blade work on the in the Thames crew. And I think it's interesting you saying those times they were equal at the first two markers. Obviously today they're not equal at the first two markers. So what's happened? Is somebody not got it quite right or has somebody gone a bit too hard? And I guess as the race progresses, we'll find out. Yeah, only time will tell. Last year, there we go. And, and the Thames boat is back on top of it again. 
and maybe this is going to start moving again. Another surge being put in here. This is the Britannia finals day of Henley Raw Regatta. You can hear already 11 o'clock in the morning, big crowds assembling to watch this one. Thames Rowing Club getting some good support there, and they've got more than the length up. Yeah, moving well here, aren't they now again? There was a bit of a stall there as the, as, uh, as the London Rowing Club crew seemed to come back on turns, but actually, once they sorted their steering out from here on the London Thames Rowing Club crew, good job. Pat Hanratty in the stroke seat. Thames Rowing Club, Max Robinson in three seat, Ben Campbell Reed, and Max Gillard in the bow seat. You can see there, Pat Hanratty looking pretty relaxed and calm considering the stage of the week we're at. Yeah, Pat has a YouTube channel that he runs. He talked about his journey through Thames Rowing Club. It's amazing to see him here now in the final of the Thames of the Britannia Challenge Cup. Putting together a good race in that stroke seat, Pat Hanratty and his Thames boat. And this is the point in the race that they'll look back on with great fondness if they can hold on, because you've got the big crowds there. They'll be cheered to the finish. You can see the cocks there for the Thames boat, Zoe Evans. Very different perspective on the race, just clear water. She'll be glancing over her left shoulder, no doubt, trying to work out how much of a lead they've got. So and even in this position here, um, Thames Rowing Club, they can't enjoy winning this race at this point. They know they're still under pressure and they need to execute what they've been rehearsing all year. And here, as we come up to the mile on the eighth post, you can see on the left-hand side, length, about two lengths lead for Thames Rowing Club. And under this sort of pressure, anything can happen in the final few hundred metres. So they need to keep concentrating. That's Max Gillard, you can see there. So it looks like he's going to win the, win the Brit 30 years after his father, that's pretty pretty cool. Certainly is. Can't write those scripts, can you, for that family? So Zoe Evans will be keeping a close eye on things in front of the regatta enclosure, moving in front of Stewart's enclosure, and Thames Rowing Club know that the job, well, it's not done yet, because we're looking at London Rowing Club fighting all the way, and actually they've put in a bit of a surge here, and they have made sure that this stays really competitive. One mistake now, and the whole thing could come off the track for Thames Rowing Club, but they look like they're going to stay composed into the last dozen or so strokes, and in Stewart's they're being roared home, the Thames Rowing Club. The Britannia Challenge Cup is going to go their way. Last few strokes, London Rowing Club fighting all the way. But the final of the Britannia Challenge Cup, the win on the Buck Station. Over they go now, Thames Rowing Club. Congratulations to them. Hanratty Robinson, Campbell Reed and Gillard. Celebrations. Zoe Evans, the Cox, steering them home against London Rowing Club. And there, the jubilation of winning the final at Henley Raw Regatta. Our first winners of the Britannia, Thames Rowing Club. Here, Zoe Evans, the cox, the mannerisms as she's coxing and shouting the crew, encouraging them to get the job done. There'll be some jubilant families on the bank, certainly. Look at that, the celebrations, that's what it means to them. That's the release, isn't it? All the pent up sort of emotion comes out right now, and you can see the joy. They can dine out on that for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Attention, go! The final of the Forley, the Windsor Boys School A on the Berkshire Bank and Windsor Boys School B on the Buckinghamshire Station. What an achievement from the State School, not too far away from here at Henley. We've got down the road, Windsor Boys churning out great athletes. And we'll have a look at this start. This is for bragging rights. What an achievement from the school to get the two boats into the same final. And immediately, the A boat has sprung into the lead. They've done a good job there on Temple Island. You'd expect that, wouldn't you, Adrian? That should be uh, according to the four, but uh, we'll but, wait and see. But it shows that they've been told to go out and race. It's not like we're going to have a nice procession down here and make it look good. These boys, the second crew, they'll have been wanting this race all season to try and take on the first eight. And the first quad, sorry, will definitely want to do this for damage. But the second crew here, you know, the first one's got about a length, but actually they're holding them at the moment. The far crew looks like they have a higher stroke rate as well. 
It's a pretty good shot for their school magazine or website, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah that's going to be amazing, isn't it? So, yeah, here on the, the, the near crew, we have the bow Charlie Ingham. At two, we have Dylan James. At three, we have Matthew Sadler. And the stroke man is Jack Codwallader. Uh, it's different to the program. Uh, the crew order in the program is not correct. But here we go, and you can see the A crew on the far side in the black boat starting to move away again. Now on the far side of the water on the Berkshire station, Charlie Warren in the stroke seat, setting the pace. Marcus Shute in the three seat, Max Bird, and then in the bow seat is Jacob Morris. And what a race they're putting together already. They'll be in, well, there's uh, the yellow flag up, Adrian. We got to that point in the race already. So as the flag comes down, that'll be when the leading crew crosses the line and the umpires in the launch will press a stopwatch and that will record the time. So here we can see the A crew getting out to a couple of lengths really not holding back at all then this is a competition and they're going to feel like well they probably felt we're confident we can bend this let's see if we can put our best row together because the last time these four guys were row together winter boys were losing finalists to tideway scholars last year in the falling so they're guaranteed victory to one boat or another today and they have got a pretty good pedigree in this as well they won the event back in 2017 and 2018 as well and it looks as if the Windsor Boys School A boat to the right. You can see in the back of Jacob Morris in that boat in the bow seat is uh, keeping their cool. It's a different sort of pressure for, for both of these boats, isn't it? And actually a very contrasting pressure for the A boat and the B boat. Yes, for sure. I mean, the A boat obviously has nothing to, to gain because they should win. And if they lose, it's a complete disaster. <laughs> and the B crew can just throw everything at it and take no every risk they want because they're not expected to win and they yeah. can just go for it. But you know, if the selection's been done right, and you can see here, the A crew, it's, fan it's that's an impressive double quad. The way they're sculling is so efficient. Do the coaches want the A boat to win, though? Because as you say, if the selection's been done right, so it sort of underlines they know their stuff. I, I, I personally, I think last night, they would have just loved the fact yeah. he can probably actually enjoy this race for the first time because he knows Windsor boys are going to win. He's got his feet up. Yeah, I think he probably has. Big, um, big cigar lit. <laughs> yeah, so... and. What was interesting is that when the, when the years ago, when that St. Paul's eight was meant so fast and everybody was talking about it, actually the Windsor Boys Quad that won that year was only one less than one percent slower. So because sculling hasn't got the same profile as the eights event, people don't talk about how quick these crews are. But these crews here are world class. I mean, the three three man here, third from the screen, third, third from us, he is a lightweight. He's a junior. So he's still at school. Came second or third, I think, in the British Under 23 trials. I mean, he's a phenomenal athlete. So we're at this stage of the race where it will be hurting, but it's the A boat that's shifting along well. On the Berkshire station, you've got there the A boat that's leading. And the stroke seat, Charlie Warren, 18 years old. There's uh, three 18-year-olds and a 17-year-old in the bow seat, Jacob Oris, in that boat. And look at the lead they've established here. And it looks really well drilled, doesn't it? Very slick. Here come the B boat, and they know that uh, bar a catastrophe to their mates in the A boat, the world order will remain the same, at least at Windsor Boys. Indeed, and this is where it gets hard for the B crew because they will have gone as hard as they can to stay in touch and be competitive. And now they'll have spent more energy than they should have done if they'd gone for the fastest race. But now they're also rowing in the bouncy water from the other crew. So it's really uncomfortable. And yeah, so it's good to see these guys still carrying on, just doing their best. But the A crew, what, an, what a phenomenal, performance and I guess maybe they're trying to send a signal out to everybody else that you know you're going to come and get us next year yes it's, uh, just having a look at this Windsor boys school the, the A crew beat St Andrew boat club in their semi-final and we had uh, a local derby on the water in the Forley in the other semi-final the B crew beat Clare's Court School of Maidenhead and that would have uh, taken its own toll no doubt on the uh, B crew and we can see the A crew extending their lead so one of the thoughts people might be having watching this crew because they're still going hammer and tongs even despite this being this far ahead is that are they going to try and break the record now to be honest with the conditions today i'm not sure if the record's up for grabs but then again i don't actually know how fast this crew really is and maybe they, they don't need optimal conditions to break the current record but we'll only find out when they cross the line 
So they might have that as a, an added incentive, a target, an objective. And barring catastrophe, it'll be them that pick up the red boxes later on. The, uh, the trophies and prize giving at five o'clock. It's quite a long wait for the prize giving at this stage, isn't it? What state they might be in by uh, five o'clock. Yeah, exactly. And they've been holding off for this all week. But some of these guys have got British trials in a week's time. And they have to try and do selection to work for their country. So some of them will have to keep a lid on it. So a tremendous moment for Windsor Boys School, both the A and the B crews. It's the A crew that's going to win the Fawley Challenge Cup. But you can't escape the fact that Windsor Boys School have done brilliantly at this Henry Raw Regatta to dominate this event. The Windsor Boys School A win the Fawley Challenge Cup. There's the celebrations for Charlie Warren in the stroke seat, Marcus Shoup, Max Bird and Jacob Oris. And the B crew getting a pretty hot reception as well at Stewards. The B crew over the line now. And uh, it'll be interesting to see the uh, respect shown between these two boats. It's immediately the B crew turn around and applaud their mates. And that is a fine, fine race. A terrific achievement from Winter Boys School. Yeah, fantastic result from boys. I mean, it must be Chris Morrell, who's the grandfather of the Windsor Rowing. He must be loving this today. These two crews and the sportsmanship with all these eight guys, they're friends and competitors, and even the B crew there when they crossed the line, how they were cheering the A crew. It's what a great atmosphere it must be in that club. Congratulations, guys. So the Prince of Wales final, the men's quad skulls underway. Reading University to the left of your picture and flying out. On the right-hand side is Leander Club. Both these boats will know this water so well. Leander Club look like they've seized an early initiative, hammering out there. Yeah, nobody's holding back. They've really gone hammer and tongs. And both crews steered a very good straight line. Off the, so coming off the end of the island, the transition looks like it's a really close race so far. And Leander are slightly ahead, maybe three or four feet. Well, this is. In the very early stages, shaping up to be a good one. Not much of an advantage there for Leander Club, nearest to your picture. It's a bit like the Brit, uh, where there was one second between these two crews at every marker going down the course yesterday. So this should be a tight race. Yesterday we had uh, the semi-final where Reading University beat Dank students. Copenhagen on the Buck station, they're on the Berkshire station today, Reading University. And the Ander Club, they were uh, on the Buck Station as well, beating London Rowing Club, Leander, yesterday. I always wonder how much of an advantage it is, having had a dress rehearsal in your semi-final, going off the same station as you then go off in the final, whether that gives you a little bit of an edge. So Leander Club have been on the Buck Station for both the semi-final and the final, whereas Reading University have had to switch sides. Yeah, I think being, getting used to the station is quite good, particularly the transition from the end of the island onto the course because of the gap in the booms there. Getting that right is quite key. But here we have Leander gone out to, looks like maybe a length lead. Um, Reading yesterday were down on Copenhagen until Fawley, until they sort of rode through them. So they're not unfamiliar to being here, but they really need to make sure they don't they don't let Leander get any further ahead. Watching Reading University to the right, heading a little bit central with the steering there. The umpire's keeping an eye on it. In fact, uh, all the umpire needs to intervene going to correct it themselves. Yeah, they want to do it gently. As soon as you put the rudder on, it's going to slow the boat. So if you can do it less, it's really small taps, take less speed off the boat. We hear both crews settle in a good aggressive rhythm. Um, Leander on the left-hand side here with the pink, what we call Cerise blades, really accurate blade work at the front. Really, they, When they come to their full length and reach, the blades come, go into the water really quite efficiently. And that's, I think, what's given them the early advantage. Yes, yeah, very neat and tidy from Leander, who are defending champions in this event, the Prince of Wales. They've been twicken and by a length and a half. Just took him in Queen's University Belfast 12 months ago. And uh, they've done well over the years here. They've uh, won in 2019 as well, 17, 15, 14 and 13. So uh, they really have dominated the Prince of Wales in the last 10 years. Yeah, they've really made it their own, actually. They really have. And here we have Leander crew. We have Jack Keating is one of the only two Irishmen left in the regatta. Oliver Costley in the three seat, Grant Ellery, and then Rory Harris in the stroke seat. There's some international experience sort of peppered through the boat. An Irish Junior World Championship athlete. We have under 23 European medalists and previous 
winners of the 40 Cup, the race we just watched earlier. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that Bryn Ellery, who in the three seat for Leander, is a rowing coach at Windsor Boys. So uh, news won't have reached him yet of what's just happened, but it's, uh, it's a good place to be contributing. And he won the 40 in 2017. But here they really are seeing, doing a good job on it. They've moved out to what it looks like a length and a half. Reading have a few steering issues here, and they really are going to have to do something pretty extraordinary to get back on terms. The Leander crew here just looks a bit more lively on top of it, moving more freely. It looks like less hard work, whereas the Reading crew looks a little bit more laboured. But here, great, great sculling. Just right in the place in the water you want to be if you're on the uh, back station. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very well aligned. And starting to uh, enjoy the crowds as well. They'll be urging them on towards the finish line. The uh, crowds get bigger and bigger as you go through the next mile of racing. This is the regatta enclosure you can see and the uh, Remenham Club at the moment in the picture, but regatta enclosure in the next few strokes will be so, audible. So based on the, the margins yesterday, we would never have predicted this result. No. And it just shows that as, the, as Leander basically won the first race easily, four lengths and three and a half lengths. It's been, they've not shown their cards till today. Louis Powell in the stroke seat for Reading. Sol Hewitt, Ollie Dix and Josh Leon in the bow seat for Reading, on the right of your picture. And Leander Club, you can see the uh, back of Keating in the bow seat there. Just moving along very well and Leander this has been a high quality uh, they really have they, they've, they've left their best till today haven't yeah they? and they've not given us many clues of the margin that would be seen here as you say last night and uh, in the semi-finals we thought this might be a close one but look at the uh, steering issue still continuing in that Reading University boat I think emotionally mentally reaching this final I don't know if you saw any of the pictures last night but Reading University were one of the boats that uh, and some of the coaching staff and uh, some of those around that, I mean, clearly the, the jubilation of reaching this final, uh, they, they couldn't contain that, and, and no, whereas no. Leander were a bit more routine about reaching the final. And I've got to say, earlier in the week, when I saw Copenhagen racing, I thought they were going to be one of the crews to beat, to be honest. So the fact that they rode through them, but it, this the, I think it's the first time Reading have made the final of this event, since yeah. they've decided to become a sculling event. University. So, like you said, maybe the emotion, that was the achievement, getting in the final, and this is maybe just one step too far today at this stage but it's uh, promising for them in years to come isn't it and Leander Club well we know all about them we know all about their superiority in years gone by in the Prince of Wales and that continues they won it last year and they're going to win it again this year by a pretty easy margin in front of Stewart's now a really good moment some young athletes in this boat Leander Club Rory Harris in the stroke seat Bryn Ellery Oliver Costley John Keating and heading over the line for victory in the Prince of Wales Challenge Cup. Once again, it goes to Leander Club on their home water. And celebrations ensue. Ecstatic with their win. They may even themselves be a little bit surprised by the margin of victory. Huge win over Reading University. So, congratulations to Reading University for making the final and showing that the decision they made was the right one in doing sculling. But Leander, they're absolutely imperious. They just transition onto their rhythm and just every stroke just inched away to what is a comfortable win. And you can see the, the relief on their faces here. Well, last year, Leander won eight events in total. They can uh, chalk one up now. They've uh, just recorded their first win, landed their first win in the finals for 2022. And there's Jack Keating as well in the bow seat. It's back-to-back -back victories in this event. So he won last year. Um, yep, that sets the tone for the lay on the club for the rest of the regatta. So Hambledon, Morrison and Musnicki, USA, Go. on the Berkshire station. On the Buck station, Heath and Campbell Ord. And this is really worth keeping an eye on because some of the pairs folks have had particular steering problems at Temple Island during this week. It's been really challenging conditions and I think maybe the pairs boats and obviously the, the smaller boats, the singles as well, have uh, felt the brunt of those difficult conditions. So it's going to be very interesting to see how clean the, these women's pairs can get away from Temple Island. At the moment they're in the shot. Campbell Ord and Heath looking very composed, always looking like they're enjoying it. 
Yeah, it's still early on. And here you can see we're coming to the end of the island. This is where the gap is between the island and the first boom. And sometimes a stream comes off there and affects them. But today, these, this crew has dealt with that supremely well. And the American crew of Musniki and Morrison just moving out to about the best part of a length so far. So, the uh, University of California, the American crew, uh, Morrison, gold in Tokyo, in the Australian four, and then we've got uh, Ms. Nikki in the USA, double Olympic champion in the women's eight. And look at the precision, look at the, how, how direct and dynamic the, the blade entry is there. It's really it's deliberate and really forceful. And here they go, California Rowing Club. This is one of the, the new training centers in the US program because US women were always centralized in Princeton until after the last Olympic Games. Now the athletes can pick where they want to train. And the California Rowing Club is one of the centers where there are men and women rowing there. And here, these two Olympic champions deciding to go to the warmer weather to train. Who can blame them? And here are Leander's leads their boat. Annie Campbell Ord, Nottingham Rowing Club. Very useful netballer in her time, Loughborough University. So you can see the difference there a little bit. The American crew, we saw that blade work, how you can see there how quick and deliberate and forceful it is. And the other crew, it's a more subtle and gentle entry. It looks to me like just the physicality of the US crew is what's giving them the advantage. It's interesting watching uh, Morrison and Mosnicki, who have had very successful careers quite far apart in different boats, in, in different nations, at different times, and they've come together relatively late on in their careers, and I wonder how long it would have taken them to bed it down, because they are absolutely nailing it technically, aren't they? Yeah, I think the fundamental thing is athletes of this experience, they know what it takes to move a boat, and you can see the superior boat speed there on the left-hand side. They know how to move a boat, they know what it takes. It would just take a bit of time for them to make the compromises you need to do in a pair. You can't just row the way you think you're supposed to row. Generally, the person in the stroke seat, so that's furthest away from us here, would, will row a pattern they find natural, and the person behind them would have to initially compromise their rowing to match it so that it's level and it goes straight. And then once it's, in a, good, it's a good platform, then they can discuss what they think is the best pattern to row to get the most boat speed. It's just a very different career trajectory to Heather Stanning and Helen Glover, who dominated this event for, for so long, who teamed up right at the beginning of their careers and swept all before them, didn't they, in the... Uh, yeah, and, they, and, the, and the way they came so. into it was interesting because they, they were the spares for the eight, and that's yes. why they were put together with Robin Williams. And then they did such a good job, they jumped over the eight and became the dominant crew. At the start of their career, whereas these two have had so much success exactly. already. And they're now battling against the Cup, you can see there, Sophia Heath, the stroke seat from uh, Hartbury College in Gloucester, big moment for Gloucester Rowing Club, Oxford Brooks University. Marketing and business is what Sophia Heath is all about, at the university course. So in here we can see just the difference, just the difference in calibre, to be honest. The American pair here, they're so metronomic with what they're doing and so solid. It's really impressive to watch this pair here. And they're all traditional singlets as opposed to the, the modern racing one, onesies. Well, they've beaten Mitchell and Gleeson. I was watching this race yesterday from Rowing Australia in the semi final easily. So they've not, we've not probably not seen them really tested, have we, at this stage? Not really uh, exposed. We'll get a better idea at international regattas, perhaps, but uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a bit of a shame we didn't get to see these two racing against the New Zealand pair. Exactly. Uh, 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 Prendergast and Crowler, or Williams, as she is now, having got married. That might um, have been the match-up we would have been after. Yeah, and they were unable to race. So they, they will not be disappointed not to have raced them because obviously they've won Henley, you would say, unless something goes catastrophically wrong now. But they would have liked to have had the challenge of racing the Olympic champions, for sure. Last year, Leander beat Tideway by three and a half lengths in eight minutes and 46. That was uh, last year, Redgrave and Deer, the winners of the Hambledon last year. Also, you look at the American uh, girl ladies in the crew. Uh, Morrison, the consultant for Ernst & Young, and Musniki, she's a talent acquisition operations specialist. So this is the Leander crew, they beat the USA's Van Westreen and Ayi quite comfortably in their semi-final, three and three-quarter lengths. But this is harder work to step up in class. 
but they'll, uh, as young athletes, be benefiting from the experience. They're both uh, going to be involved out in Lucerne next week. And, uh, in fact, they're in the senior squad double in the four as well in uh, Lucerne next week. It's the first time they've been in the uh, senior squad together, so it's a big week coming up for them internationally. It is. And here now, the US crew, and unlike the Windsor boys crew, they were just really piling it on all the way to the end. I think now they're going to start to enjoy this. And actually, there with their experience and their awareness of what's around them, and there's this kind of margin, they're actually going to really be able to savor because the conditions are good. They're no, under no pressure for steering. They can actually now hear the crowd and just enjoy the last minute or so of the racing down here, maybe a minute and a half, as they get the applause from the crowd and the stewards. Yeah, as a coach, I suppose you encourage that, but only for athletes at the right stage of their career at the right position in a race I trying to savor the magic of this moment a lot of athletes will go through it almost oblivious won't they and i think you can never talk about this as a coach with the athletes no. but you know when we get up and we're winning it's fine you can really enjoy the moment no way because if they're thinking about that they're not going to execute yeah. anything else properly it's just because they're so experienced they've been in this position so many times they they, they know how to manage their their concentration and you know, look how well, they're moving together. So, Megan Wisnicki from the USA, double Olympic champion in the women's eight in 2012 in London, 2016 in Rio, five-time world champion. Part of that USA women's eight that every time they got in the water, you just knew they were going to boss it. Really dominant force, that women's eight, for a 10-year spell. They were indeed. And so, first time, the second time at Henley, but the first time in the boat other than the eight. And Morrison gold in Tokyo in the four. So now they'll be a few strokes from home, enjoying the applause from stewards. We thought they were good. They've shown them really good. There's Nicky and Morrison in the Hamilton Pairs Challenge Cup. Last few strokes for them, comfortably beating Campbell Ord and Heath. Fantastic performance from them breezing home, hopefully savouring the moment. A glance over the shoulder from Morrison, and over the line they go. It's a win for the experienced pair there of Nicky and Morrison in the Hambledon Pairs Challenge Cup. Even for experienced athletes like this, look at the joy of winning an event like this. Hands are up, waving at the crowd. They are loving this. And here comes the Leander pair, still racing to the line. The crowd appreciating their efforts. Great experience for them, big week for them. Good luck to them in Lucerne, out in Switzerland, for World Cup three next weekend. But this weekend at Henley, they've been beaten by Morrison and Musnicki. So a great experience for the Leander girls to see what the A standard really is when it comes to the proper racing. But here, look, two American ladies, Olympic gold medalists, and the joy, the joy of winning the event at Henley Royal Regatta. This is fantastic to see how much it means to these elite athletes. Jess, you won Olympic medals, world medals, European, well, not European medals, big medals all around the, on the, on the circuit. We could see just how much that meant to you as well. Yeah, it was amazing. It was my first Henley race, so I'm um, thrilled to be out here and to do it with a good friend. Um, was even better and just handled the conditions well all week. Um, blessed with a beautiful day today. It wasn't as windy, so it was a real cherry on top of the week. Just put it into perspective, you haven't been racing together or training together for very long. No, Henley was our first race together. We've been training together for about five weeks. Um, so this was an incredible way to cap off training together. And why, what was so important about coming here and competing here? Just the experience, right? Like we had the opportunity to come, California Rowing Club allowed us to come here and it is an incredible opportunity that we wouldn't want to pass up. And I get to do it with one of my great friends and it's really can't ask for much more. Well done, well done. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Temple University of Washington on the Barcher Station and on the Buck Station we've got Oxford Brooks University and here's the power unleashed, trying to get some speed into the boat off those starting pontoons and we're keeping a close eye on the steering and both boats seem to have nailed that in the early stages. We'll have another test in a moment as they come out the protection of Temple Island and have to deal with the winds a bit more. So you want to shoot out like a dart, and both of them did that. They've had enough experience in the last few days to kind of know the island now, know the tricks, know the kind of difficulties, and go absolutely dead straight. Both of these coxes need to make sure these crews get their best 
lane the best line rather down this course that they can because it could be nip and tuck all the way really powerful explosive rowing from both of these crews they're both real they front end the stroke they're very aggressive in their style of racing and that's what's got them to the final the early indication is it will be nip and tuck look how level it is in the early stages you can see closest to the camera there oxford brooks university they last won this in 2019 oxford brooks university last won the temple they also won it in 17 16 and 14 as well so they've been pretty good in this over recent years and then at the top of the picture the university of washington the usa beating durham university in the semi-final by two-thirds of a length yesterday they won this in 2018 so it's two boats uh, from two setups that know how to win the temple absolutely really experienced coaching that goes behind these crews as well with the the formidable team that's led by Henry Belash Webb and Richard Spratley at Oxford Brooks. He's been there now in his 14th year as, as head coach, 22 years for the club. And Mike Callahan, who heads up the University of Washington program again, 12 years there, eight years as head coach. So, you know, again, they really know how to get the preparation right, how to get the detail, how to get the race plan right, and how to use the course, when to put the pushes in, you know, how to cope with that middle area where you're sometimes, you know, a little bit further from the bank. Um, at the moment, it looks like there's, there's real aggression in that University of Washington crew. I think they might be nudging their bows ahead. Possibly, yeah. Just looking at the steering, it's uh, suggesting that they've come a little bit central here. University of Washington, the Barcher Station to the right of your picture. They're one of 11 boats from the USA on the water today in our 26 finals. Got two from New Zealand, eight from Australia, one from Germany, Denmark and Norway each. A couple from China, truly international. This is a classic final, isn't it, with a, a local boat from Oxford Brooks and the uh, boat from Washington, an American boat here. Classic matchup. Absolutely, and, and they're on the, the water's good today, isn't it? So they haven't got quite as much. We've had some real windy, gusty. We've had the whole gamut of seasons thrown at us over the last few days, but the sun is out and the conditions are pretty calm which means again you can just focus in its speed from a to b 2112 meters and you need to make sure every stroke counts and it now looks as if we've got a sharpening happening in the oxford brooks crew you can see the catches they just sharpened up as they went in they've lifted they've tightened a little bit they've soaked up the push that came out of the transition from the start in the university of washington crew and that now looks as if oxford brooks are starting to take the lead Yes, yeah, so Oxford Brooks University, you can see there nearest to the camera, to the left-hand side. A little bit tight, these two boats, but the Coxes will have an eye on that. Will Denengri of Oxford Brooks University, you can see hunched at the front of the boat there, and Miles Devro in the stroke seat. Wincombe, Huller, McGillan, Hines, Lassen, Haywood and Donaghy, they put in a surge there. That was an important move. I wonder if that wow. would be a decisive move. And they yeah. have shifted through that last couple of hundred metres. Absolutely devastating there to have clear water to just row straight away from... We saw the power of the University of Washington crew coming out of the start, but as they transitioned, they just kept the power going. They kept the sharpness, and it's now looking a little heavy. The University of Washington crew a little bit shocked that they've got, you know, they've lost a sense almost now where the Oxford Brooks crew were. That was absolutely dominant race out of that start and just move away. You can see here that real sharpness. There's a little bit more kind of movement within the University of Washington crew, big guys, um, just not quite as cohesive, as tight, really kind of level. The shoulders aren't lifting a lot in the Oxford Brooks crew at all. Um, it's all going into shifting the water, levering that boat past them. Really formidable rowing there. Yeah, University of Washington, a little bit ragged, muscling it, fighting it a bit, but Oxford Brooks University, they bolted. That was unreal, that surge mid-race. Now it's just about sustaining it, just keeping their cool and seeing themselves down to the finish line as they hit the regatta enclosure. And they'll have huge support there as well, and their fans on the bank will be ecstatic to see the lead they've carved out. They need to keep an eye on their steering. They're just heading a little bit towards the uh, left-hand side of the picture. I think they'll sort that out and keeping an eye on the University of Washington have had a bit of a wobble as well in towards the mid water but this is a performance from the Oxford Brooks University boat really impressive it's their top crew this year they've been really kind of you know we know they have such a competitive squad I mean both of these systems University of Washington Oxford Brooks have have really competitive squads that people you know they I have ambitions to be part of these squads, to be part of these programs because of what they can learn here, because of the history, because of the results that these teams get. We can see there the confidence 
I mean, what a joy to have that much clear water in a Henley final. We know that Miles Deverett at Stroke, he won Henley Royal in the 40 Challenge Cup just two years ago. So much confidence there. He's competed at the Junior World Championships, the European Championships. So Oxford Brooks University, their programme paying off again. They won six events on finals day last year, and here's their first win this year. There might be more to come as well, but they're eight in the Temple Challenge Cup. Gusty winds picking up on the finish line, but it's Oxford Brooks University, the winners of the Temple Challenge Cup 2022. The celebrations belong to them, and University of Washington, who had a fast start, a really sharp start from them, but the way that Oxford Brooks just powered away mid-race, incredible turn of pace, change of gear, proved decisive, Washington couldn't live with them, and that is what it means to Oxford Brooks University. Really dominant row from the Oxford Brooks crew. They come here, they know what it takes to win Henley. They knew that they had the race plan. They had a really fast time in their semi-final, so they had huge confidence coming into this event. And you can see what it means to them. The celebrations, we can hear it echoing around the commentary box, the joy, even though we see, we see a lot of victories in Oxford Brooks, but every single one means so much to this club. This is, they train so hard through the winter. They have a brutal training program, testing each other to the absolute maximum. And this is when it pays off. The Double Skulls Challenge Cup, Great Britain versus Australia. one of the highest level events we're going to see today in terms of that top level international competition. So brilliant, the Henley Royal Regatta, we have school boys, we have school girls, we have clubs, we have universities, and we have the very best of rowing here from Australia and from the UK. And they've had, a, they've had a race to work out what it's like on this course to get their steering sorted. And it is a power match from the word go. And neither of them is going to want to give anything at the start. Looks like a slight advantage here maybe to the Australians, but more or less both boats locked together. Caleb Antill from the Australian Capital Territories, an old boy of Canberra Grammar School and a member of the Australian University Boat Club, National University Boat Club in the bow seat, Jack Cleary from West Australian Rowing Club. Bronze medalists at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics in the men's quadruple scale. You can see absolute power coming off those four oars in the Australian crew, a relentless rhythm, a relentless amount of power. For both of them coming out of the start, there's a question of whether you transition and, you know, or just really kind of hold on. And it looks like the Australians are just staying at that, you know, high power, high rate to get ahead. Yeah, this is going to be really entry, uh, interesting entry because the British combination fourth at Belgrade at the first World Cup, this Australian men's double were a dead heat for bronze in the Poznan World Cup. I've not seen that very often, but uh, there were two bronze medals awarded and they've actually switched the seating. So Jack uh, was stroking that boat and now Caleb's gone into the stroke seat. The only two returning members this year from the Australian men's quad, so giving things a go in the double skull here, coached by Lyle McCarthy. What confidence they must have coming off that result in Tokyo to know that know that this combination works as part of the quad and now to have the opportunity to come down to the double skull where it's even more intimate, even more intense in some ways and test yourselves on the water at Henley on the way to the World Championships. And they're looking strong, but absolutely you can see Hayward and Bourne are Again, incredible athletes learning, learning about this boat, learning about racing a double at top level. It's a new combination for GB this year. Um, so they're on that journey and this is an important day for them to try and see if they can take it up a notch and see how they can match themselves against the Australians. Looks like they were just adjusting their steering there, but I think they're back straight, keeping away from the boons. It's pretty good conditions today. It's pretty flat, but always with a bit of the Henley popple. Yeah, wonderful conditions here. We've seen very challenging headwind conditions all week since the qualifiers. So I think crews were probably relieved to wake up. But wow, look at that big wash that's hit the Australians. They've come through it well, but tough conditions. You can see the pleasure craft going up and down this course. It's incredibly difficult, but it's all of what makes Henley Henley, contending with the conditions, with the river. And those booms, they always seem closer than they are, don't they, Kat? Always. 
it looks like Hayward and Bourne have actually really been working hard in that last 250 metres. They are not giving anything away at the moment to the Australians at all. For them, they they know each other well. That's their first season as the GB double. They won under 23 gold uh, in 2019 in the quad. So, you know, had some experience and had some experience of racing together. And that's so important in a race like this to be able to communicate, to make some small adjustments. You can see in the bow, they're just taking a look across at where the Australians are. The Australians are up, but they can sense them. They have not got lost. And so you're both in the same race at this point. And we know anything can happen. We saw the Aussies just get slammed by a bit of a wash there. We have seen all sorts of mishaps and trials and tribulations on this course this week. So the race is not over till it's over, but the Australians with a slight advantage at this stage of the race. And hello to those of you joining us from Australia, from West Australia, cheering on Jack Cleary in the bow seat, from the Australian Capital Territory in Canberra, cheering on Caleb Antill in the stroke seat. I'm sure that Caleb's mum, who rose at Canberra Rowing Club, her and her crewmates will be watching this. Very excited to see the boys leading halfway down the track here at Henley Royal Regatta in the Double Skulls Challenge Cup. So as they pass Remenon now, pass up the Thames, that is looking pretty relentless from uh, Caleb until and Jack Cleary. They have not faltered since the first stroke to just power down. There's an immense consistency in the way they are sculling. It's all about learning from Matthew Hayward and George Bourne. Can they now find another gear? Can they test themselves? Will they go slightly earlier for the finish? What can they do to try and upset dominance of the Australians? Fantastic shot there across the course. The Aussies on the left-hand side of your screen currently leaving, leading the crew from Great Britain. See the wonderful coaches launch behind with the Australian and British supporters and coaches. Of course, they're not allowed to speak, they're not allowed to gesture. It looks like Amy Fernandez, our Deputy Performance Director, taking a cheeky little photo out the side of the loop, <laughs> following launch there. Gwyn Batten, the umpire for the race. As they pass the mile, it is Australia currently leading this race. Caleb Antill and Jack Cleary over Matthew Haywood and George Bourne of Great Britain. Hayward and Bourne talked about the ferocious sprints that were required in every single race at the World Cup. You know, again, like many events, it's so tight and the positions change in the run-in and how they were learning with each of the sprints, uh, you know, when to go, how to do it, um, to call the timing at a point when you're so exhausted. You have to race, you have to have those other gears. And so again, we'll see here, can they find a sprint? Can they lift? Looking across again in the bow there, What's, what's required? A call has followed, a sharpening has followed there. As these athletes think, what can we do? What move can we make? There we go, definite increase in rate from the British crew there. They're going to have a go. They're going to see what's possible. Again, looking across, don't look across too much. Stay in your boat. They can hear now the crowds in the enclosures. They know that it's getting to that sharp end of the race. They're coming down to the last couple of hundred metres past the Stewart enclosures. Matthew Hayward, he's looking over desperately from the British crew over on the Bark station, but the Australian crew answering the call as they're coming down to the line, still with about three quarters of a length lead. Caleb Anthill and Jack Cleary. Jack looks over his shoulder. It's all going to come down to the last few metres here. Sprint to the line from both crews. The British moving up onto terms with the Australians. They are moving. They've upped it. They've upped it. And it wasn't quite enough. The Australians are across. What a race in the Double Skulls Challenge Cup. It is Australia, Caleb Antill and Jack Cleary taking the win over the crew from Great Britain, Matthew Haywood and George Bourne. What a final we've just witnessed. Confirmation wow. of that result there. Really impressive from the Australians, but they were tested at the end. They put a lot of power in on the first part of, you know, throughout the race. That was a great challenge from Matthew Hayward and George Bourne, who closed a lot of the gap. They were overlapping the Australians. The Australians had enough. You can see how much that has taken out of them. Extraordinary row from this Winter Park crew. They are exceptional. St. Cats undefeated domestically in Australia this year. Two of the very best schoolgirl crews internationally. They have both had undefeated seasons in their countries. What a place we are offering now the chance for the best of schoolgirl rowing to race it out. And we are away in the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy, St. Catherine School, Australia, against Winter Park Crew, United States of America. This could be
be the biggest test that either of these crews have faced it throughout their seasons. They have been undefeated. They have faced everything that their countries could offer. They have faced everything that this draw could offer. And now St. Catherine's School is facing the Winter Park crew for the honor of winning the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy. These girls are just absolutely ferocious. Look at the way they lock in and absolutely throw their body weight onto it, sitting back together, stroked by Bridget Cullen, uh, Bronte Cullen, rather, one of the captains of boat at St. Catherine School, Australia. Maybe just with a canvas lead over Winter Park crew, United States of America. Unbelievable aggression out the start, both of these crews. Here we see this Winter Park crew. They came and they qualified. They were so impressive in qualifying. It was obvious they needed to then be one of the selected crews and they have not only beaten Henley yesterday with half a length, they beat Headington, last year's winners as well. But now they come across St. Catherine's School, who beat Surbiton, last year's runner-up, uh, by two lengths yesterday. And they were fast out of the blocks yesterday and they're doing exactly the same slight lead here to St. Catherine's School from Australia, coached by John Saunders, head of rowing, Bridget Carlisle. We're riding with that crew now. Bronte Cullen in the stroke seat, Sienna Darcy behind her, Sarah Marriott, Chloe Nevins, Zara Bongiorno, Lucy Green, Jemima Wilcox and Zara Peel. Three of these women were in the Australian Junior Women's Eight last year. That was Bronte Cullen, Sarah Marriott, and Zara Bongiorno, unfortunately unable to compete at the World Championships, but selected nonetheless in the Junior Women's Eight. It looks to me like Winter Park are battling and trying to left to kind of make sure they keep the pressure on that St. Catherine's crew. Their coach, Michael Fatullo, has coached for 30 years at Winter Park in Florida and said that this is an exceptional crew. And having been undefeated, they felt they had to come here. They were the first ever crew in history to win from Winter Park to win the US SRAA and now to come to Henley and they are being tested more than they've been tested ever by before by this Australian crew. What a matchup! Two of the best schoolgirl junior women eights in the world going head to head. There is no other event where you see the best of the best in their categories come up against one another and Boy, are they putting on a show for you today. St. Catherine School Australia, Winter Park Crew, United States of America, locked together down the track, vying for the Prince Philip Challenge Trophy. That's a great overhead shot there. Um, you can see the aggression in the oars, the sharpness of the catches, and that absolute commitment in both crews. And I think what's quite exceptional about this crew from Melbourne is Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. These girls only learned, or these women rather, only learned to row sweep in November of last year, despite coming out of really locked down in January, February. So extraordinary effort from the girls from St. Cats. But here we see Winter Park crew USA led by Paige Perrot in the stroke seat. The Coxon Delaney Gardner, she's looking across her shoulder. They know that they are neck and neck at the moment, stroke for stroke down the course. They're so proud of what they've achieved, Winter Park, making their own history, and they know that they have to pull out something special today. They're being asked a lot of questions, and can Delaney Gardner, their cock, 16 years old, can she help them to find another gear against this really aggressive, dominant crew? And we saw a fantastic move from St. Cass at the three-quarter mile over Surbiton. They really had a huge push there. Do they have that in their pocket today? Or is Winter Park, who was truly dominant in their round yesterday over Henley, do they have the call to answer? That's what they're going to find out. They've been testing their race plans over the last few days, haven't they? Understanding where they are on the course is so important so you don't get lost in the middle. And the, the question here is, can they hang on? Can they maintain some overlap in that Winter Park crew with Australia so that they can come back and make a push? As we come past the three-quarter mile, it is a push from St. Katz. It looks to me, it's a tough camera angle we've got here, but it looks to me like St. Katz still have the lead. This is a small program in Australia. They've only won the schoolgirl head of the river and the national championships twice, but undefeated throughout this season. I know that there's a lot of people in Victoria, in Melbourne, watching this race with great interest. As they come level past us, it looks to me as though St. Cats has almost half a length on Winter Park, but everything to play for as they come past Remnant. And I think Winter Park have been creeping back because the Australians at Catherine School were further ahead earlier in the track. And Winter Park know they have to work 
through this middle section, coming past Remenham, the Remenham Raw. They know that they have to make sure you can't leave it too late to use this middle part of the race. I think there's a little more relaxation in that Winter Park crew. Will that help them down the course against the raw aggression, the attack that we see in that St. Catherine School? And St. Catherine's still leading as we focus in on that crew. Five of these rowers are in year 11. So we know that they'll be back next year to defend their title as national champions. And maybe we'll even see them back again. But St. Cath's still leading 35 strokes per minute, 15.9 kilometres per hour. In the sixth seat there, the incredibly strong Sarah Marriott. She has five Australian ergo records, one world record on the rowing machine. Incredible power in the middle of this boat. And they have just increased the rate in the St. Catherine School. They know they have to go for home. They know they were under pressure from Winter Park crew. They are throwing everything. They can sense each other. A few heads looked either way there, but that absolute dominance from the stroke of Bronte Cullen. She is not giving up. She is fighting for every stroke, leading her crew, leading the rate up, as both of these crews now know that they're going to have to start to think about winding for home. Welcome to those joining us on the broadcast from Australia and the USA. What a matchup we have here for you in the Prince Philip Challenge Cup. Oz versus USA, two of the best junior women's eights in the world in the crew from Winter Park. Delaney Gardner Coxing, Paige Perrot stroking, Susie Mallon. Riley Harris, Hannah Hill, Ashley Perrot, Kate Miller, Ava May, and Zoe DeVio. I think maybe they've come back on St. Cats a little bit here. Kat, what do you think? Yeah, I, they are definitely, there's overlap, isn't there? There is fighting, there's a sense of that rising roar they're getting now they're, now they're into the first part of the enclosures. It's who's got what's left, what was the winter training like, how much of those ergs paid off, but there is no let up in the aggression from that St. Catherine school. St. Cats driving down past Stewart's. They're coming to the line. The lead is with St. Cats of Australia, undefeated domestically in Australia this season. They've come out to prove that they are the best schoolgirl junior women's eight in the world. They're coming down to the line. St. Cats leading Winter Park crew, United States of America. Utterly dominant. A length to St. Catherine's school from Australia. Two undefeated crews. The toughest race they've had. What a treat for us to see this incredible race. The best of schoolgirl rowing in Australia and in the USA. St. Catherine's School, US, Australia beating the Winter Park crew. You can see from the start to finish, absolute aggression, commitment and joy. Joy at the end of that. What an experience, what a journey they have been on. going well so far as we're away now in the Wargrave Challenge Cup, Thames Rowing Club A and Leander Club. Look at that start there for both these women's eights. This is a direct repeat of last year's final. In the Wargrave, Thames Rowing Club back with seven of the nine finalists from last year. So they are going to be looking to put out an early marker against the Leander crew who are holders of this event. Great start there from both crews. Leander on Closest on screen to us, Thames Rowing Club in the Barks station up at the top of the screen. Perhaps with just an early race lead here out of the start. Yeah, it looks like Thames crew had a really um, aggressive, powerful start there. They just flew out of those first few strokes. And I think, you know, this Leander crew, they're a younger crew, but they've got international experience, under 23s, home internationals. They are a club development crew, but I think we're seeing that um, sort of cohesive power from Thames, the fact that they've been rowing together for such a long time. That's really um, put them out to a good start here. Yeah, Thames has looked exceptional all week. They're out here to take this win. Make no mistake, the Wargrave Challenge Cup, they've been eyes on the prize. Brilliant rowing from the crew, absolutely the crew to beat. So I think we see there now see at the top of your picture that crew from Thames in the white boat with the black blades just looking like a really long stroke there underwater these women are all full-time um, workers you know they there's there's a doctor in there there's a software engineer a winery project manager so these women are fitting in two sessions a day on top of a nine-to-five job but you can see the quality of their rowing they really have this very um, 
long, powerful stroke. We've got some really good athletes in there. Ali Sharp at four, XUL athlete, just getting that really long, powerful movement under the water. Great shot there, looking down the course. Got pretty good conditions here. It's been very testing for these crews all week. Strong headwind conditions, gusty from the qualifiers onwards, but some lovely weather today. Although deceptive because it is tricky out there. There's still a little bit of breeze on the water. And of course, the roll from the pleasure craft moving up and down the course. So always challenging here on the course at Henley. And I think Thames have put themselves in a really good position here to manage any rougher water that comes along in the second half of the course. But let's not forget Leander. They are the holders. They won the inaugural race last year. They're not going to be willing to just let this Thames crew go. So I think we need to keep out, you know, keep an eye out for them, especially in the second half of the course. Anything can happen, as we know. We've seen it. But dominating this race in the early stages, it is Thames Rowing Club A looking to reverse the result from last year in the bow. Amy Gibson, Ruth Taylor in two, Sarah Carlotti in three, Anna Annie Sharp in four, Jordan Cole Hossein in five, Olivia Rogerson, Christy Davis, the stroke, Jessica Eastwood, coxed by Natalie Kernan. Thames have had a fantastic season this year. You know, they've not been beaten by many crews at all, certainly not crews here from the UK. They were beaten by Brown in Champates at Henley Women's, but they had some fantastic races to get to that point, turned over some crews. We can see now as we come in to look at that Thames crew, we can just about make out the name on the bow of the boat, Baz Moffat. So Baz, Thames alumna, who also represented GB, and she's a fantastic woman and advocate for women's rowing. She continues to work with women in sport in her capacity at the Well HQ, and they really champion female athletes there by tackling some quite difficult subjects that don't really get talked about. For example, making sure athletes have sports bras that fit correctly, making sure uh, female athletes know about how to manage their periods and how to continue competing through that. And I think it's sort of taboo subjects that aren't discussed much, but are really important to female athletes. So she's doing some fantastic work there and great to see her name on the bow of that tennis boat out in front at the moment as they come past and they'll get a massive roar here from the Remenham Club where their, uh, their crews are based. So you can hear that now on the live stream, that big shout for Thames. And what an absolute push on that must be from Thames. They now have clear water over Leander, but to hear that cheer, I mean, that must be an extraordinary pain right now. And hopefully it just helps to take that pain a little bit easier when you hear your club men and women cheering for you like that coming past the clubs. Yeah, so you come past Remenham and then you go into no man's land, that quiet section there just before you get to the enclosures. And Sunday, always a little bit quieter than the Saturday as well, but it's the die-hard rowing fans who are here on the Sunday. And that's why you get so much noise as you come to the enclosures. Look at this Thames crew. I mean, they have dominated this race really from start to finish. Look at that sweep out either side as we can see down the crew here. Really fantastic display of rowing here from these club women from Thames. Great shot there looking along the bow of the Thames crew. Currently leading the Wargrave Challenge Cup. Only in its second year. Hotly contested event. We saw three crews from Australia here all falling to the wayside through the week. As we move now to the crew from Leander. Looking at the bow there of Amy Gibson. In front of her, Ruth Taylor. Oh, rather, sorry. Sorry, that's India Summerside. Getting my crews mixed up there. Frances Hunt Davis in the two seat in front of her. Presumably the daughter of one of our fellow stewards, Ben Hunt Davis. I believe so. Yeah, impressive athletes here in this crew from Leander as well. You know, they're young athletes, they're up and comers. These are going to be women that you'll be seeing probably in our national team over the next few years. But I think today it is going to be for Thames joining the rank of some of their men's crews have also been dominating the club events. But these women have really led from start to finish. And a late charge from Leander here, I don't think is going to be enough. 
to get them in front of that bow of the Thames Rowing Club boat. You're right, Zoe, it's going to be two apiece for Thames. The men taking out the Brit earlier in the day, coming across the line now. It is Thames Rowing Club taking out the Wargrave, making up for last year, defeating Leander. What a dominant row. Incredible performance from this crew all week, stepping up day on day. Thames Rowing Club A, victors in the Wargrave Challenge Cup. Look at that shot there of the coxswain, Natalie Kernan, full-time doctor on the water today. Brilliant to see these women win in such a dominant fashion. Fantastic crew. Natalie, I'll start with you. What an amazing performance. A new course record in this event by 12 seconds. Sorry. <laughs> um, we had a plan, we stuck to the plan, we executed the plan. The girls gave 110% and it all went well. So. <laughs> Nothing more to add to that really. I think we were so hungry and we just executed it to the best that we could yeah. um, and we had the race of, race of the season so race of our lives race of our lives, race of our lives. surprised uh, you must have known coming in you were you were you were fast you were speedy but surprised to beat that record by such a margin i yeah. mean yeah by that margin yeah but i knew that if these girls did exactly what they were able to do anything was possible they're so incredibly fast it's the Visitors Challenge Cup final, the 175th year. It's University of Washington on the left of our picture and Tideway Scholars and Molsey on the right. They go away straight, they go away cleanly. You can see the flat water, mirror-like conditions here at the start. Yep, but there we have it, that Tideway Scholars and Molsey crew just creeping out into the middle of the river. This is a crew that is a presumptive under-23 crew for Great Britain, not yet named, but they are up against a crew from the University of Washington that are around half of their first B crew. Now, these fours have been posting pretty similar times all week, so I think it is going to be neck and neck down the course here, as it looks here, moving away from the island. Yeah, cracking start to what could be an absolutely cracking race. The Scullers and Molsey crew nearest us had a little bit of a challenge with their steering yesterday when they were racing uh, against the Oxford University B crew. But to get here, they beat Munster, they beat Oxford A, they beat Oxford B, and here they are in the final facing Washington on the far side, who rolled over two Dutch crews and then Thames and Leander yesterday uh, to, put, to book their spot here on Henley Sunday. It's finals day. It's the Visitors Challenge Cup for intermediate men. And at the moment, it really is hard to call. I think it's stroke for stroke. Interesting to see as they were sitting on the start line that that crew from Scullers and Molsey have made their colours really well known. Two of these men rode at Harvard University. Two of them rode at Yale. And I saw at least one Harvard cap and two Yale caps there. They obviously want to make sure their crew from the University of Washington know that. And I'm calling Washington the Americans, but actually, Four non-Americans in that crew, an Austrian, a Canadian, someone from the Netherlands, someone from New Zealand, but they are experienced athletes, under 23 experience, and it looks like maybe that better time, that more time together has just pushed them out ahead, and I think they've got the lead there on the British crew. One of the things I love about our sport is across nationalities, across universities, across clubs, you get to compete hard and then you get to combine and row together. And we've got some real experience here as we look at the left-hand crew, which is Molsey and Tideway Scholars they're rowing at. We've got uh, the winner of the Princess Elizabeth Challenge Cup in 2021. Harry Geffen was with the Eton crew that won there. Uh, Dow de Graaf in the stroke seat. Well, he was in that legendary St. Paul's School crew that set the record, smashed the record in the Princess Elizabeth um, a few years ago, 2018. So lots of experience of Henley there. And at the moment, well, it looks to me like the Washington crew are rather calmer. Uh, the British crew, the left-hand side crew, are attacking more. Yeah, I think this British crew, not only are they obviously going to want to secure this win today, but they are also going to want to be writing their names on some seats that will be going to Varese for the Under-23 World Championships at the end of this month. I heard uh, gossip on the towpath that said there are still 86 rowers in contention trialling next week for Under-23 selection. So this is a chance for these four men to book a seat early. So if you're joining us watching from the USA or anywhere around the world, you're watching a real tournament here. This is a great place, Zoe says, to demonstrate your pedigree, to show the world what you can do. 
the eyes of the world who love rowing are watching racing like this. And here we go. We're getting through to the middle of the course, passing that marker is exactly halfway. Looks to me like Tideway Scullers and Molsey on the left of the picture have had a better second quarter of the race here. Yeah, I think another little wiggle on the uh, on the steering there in that British crew. But like you were saying, that experience for these men, they've got some winning experience at Henley before. Looks like that's paying off. and. I've got them neck and neck there, I reckon, coming through past Washington now. Yeah, very exciting here. The water gets a bit flatter here. Looks like lane two has gone up first on that marker, which is the three-quarter mile marker. It's 1,200 metres down the course. So Molsey and Tideway Scullers nearest to us, they've got their nose in front now. That's a massive turnaround there as we see this shot play out. You can see they've got nearly a length now on that crew from Washington, and they are still moving away every single stroke. Great move by Molsey and Scullers there. Washington now really need to respond. And have they got what it takes to lift their game in this third quarter? This is where everything's hurting. The legs are burning. It's hard to focus mentally, and you need to absolutely focus mentally. In a small boat like the Coxless 4, you have to do everything together. A little bit of steering, uh, though the water is quite a bit flatter here. So Tideway Scullers and Molsey have taken the lead. Umpire Gwyn Batten raises her flag and just warns them off. Zoe called it. It was a little bit tricky to steer there. Immediate correction, but that slows the boat a little bit, that swerve that they've done there. Yeah, good quick correction from them there. But like you say, that's how the rudder works. Every time you use it, it acts as a brake. So you want to be using it as little as possible. And like we've been saying earlier on in the week, you only want to do 2,112 metres, not any more. But I think that British crew is still holding on to this lead from the University of Washington. What can Jack Walkie now, Canadian, son of two Canadian Olympians, what can he do at stroke in that Washington crew to raise his boat up? And will that British crew stay out of trouble with their steering? They're approaching the mile and eight. That's 108,011 metres down the track. Bolsey and Scullers still have their nose in front. Have they stretched it out towards half a length? We're looking there at the back of Harry Geffen, then Calvin Tarzi. Miles Beeson in the stroke Dow de Graaf as they are again warmed by umpire Batten in her distinctive Thames Rowing Club summer uniform there. Again, a bit of expensive steering. That break goes on to get them away back off the centre line of the course. Yeah, that bow steers from Mattis Holler in the Washington crew. Looks like they've had an easier ride of this. And is that going to mean that as they come into the end of this race, they have a little bit extra to give? There you see them, University of Washington raising that rate. You can see the eyes there of the Husky on the back of their boat. And it is coming now for that British crew. So we've got another crack on our hands. The Washington crew looking across Logan Ulrich in the three seat glances across again at Sideway Scullers and Molsey who are sprinting for the line. It's a sprint for both crews. The legs are burning, the lungs are bursting. You've got to get the oars in the water as many times as you can. It's going to be close. Pull out that photo finish camera. Whoa. Washington think they've got it. I think they probably had it by another foot maybe. They are absolutely exuberant. Whoa, going for a little bit of a swim there. Gert van Dorn, be careful. Don't want anybody All the in the water coming there. Coming together hard there. Coming together well. on the line. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, that's a clear win for the University of Washington, and they knew it as soon as they went over the line. The hands raised up, and you can see them there. We can see them from the commentary box. Both boats have come together and actually shaking hands right there in the boats. Incredible sportsmanship, incredible race from both crews. Congratulations, guys. That looked really hard fought. How was it? It was an amazing job. It's like very hard, but we kept composed as we were training and then just relied on our sprinting power and perfectly worked out today. Why do you think it went so well today? What made the difference and um, a new course record as well achieved for this event? Oh, I mean, the course, I think the course record is just because the other crew was phenomenal too and they pushed us all the way. So that, that definitely plays into it. But we just really, we stayed within our boat, within our own gunnels and we executed our race plan exactly how we wanted it. Just keep it, keep it, keep it and then just take off for the last 500 and we did, we did a really good job doing that. So. Everything went as planned. And, and what is it about this regatta? Why was it so important? How long has this been the plan for? Huh, it hasn't been planned for that long, but at Henley Royal Regatta, it's just so, spe so spe special to be here. So it's just another amazing event to just come here and, and just win. It's just the atmosphere is just 
you don't have it anywhere else in the world, so yeah. yeah describe what's it like coming down that course? I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's, you have people from start to finish. You got the booms, you got the water. It's a, it's a very, very special feeling. And coming all the way from America, you know, it's not a, it's not a short trip. It's not like you throw up and do it. It takes a bit. And we've been, we've been here for the last week and a half training on the water, which helped a lot. And uh, I thought it was just, it's awesome. No, it's amazing. Yeah. And winning your last race as a dog. Yeah. It's last amazing. Dog. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to full silverware that every single rower wants to get their hands on when they come to Henley. I've made my way to the trophy room. Welcome back to finals day here at the Henley Royal Regatta 2022. We are halfway through proceedings. We've had 13 fabulous finals so far and we've got 13 more coming up for you. But have a look at this because this arguably is the most prestigious trophy of them all. This is the Grand Challenge Cup first presented right back in the first year of the regatta back in 1839 in fact this is the original base but they run out of space on that one so in 2014 harvard university donated that new base this cup has been seriously hard fought for over the years and this afternoon at 3 30 oxford brooks and leander take on rowing australia for this trophy but uh, we kick off the action this afternoon with the Princess Elizabeth Challenge Cup, this one for the Junior Eights. And this one is probably one of the highlights in terms of the crowds. The atmosphere down at the boat tents as the, the boys were heading out to the water was just electric. So let's join our commentators then. And uh, they have got a busy but fantastic afternoon in store. Let's say hello to Martin Cross and to Mark Hunter. Hello there, it's me, Martin Cross, and with me, Olympic champion Mark Hunter, to take you through this first part of the afternoon session, finals day at Henley Raw Regatta. First race up is going to be a real corker. We've had some fantastic races this morning, but look at what we've got this afternoon. The PE between uh, Radley and St Paul's, Princess Royal Challenge Cup between Curler and Grant, the y folds between Thames and the Oslo students, the Revenant Challenge Cup, between Australia and Britain, the Diamond Challenge Skulls with Ollie Ziegler going head-to-head -head against David Bartolot, the Australians, and right through the afternoon, a grand at 3.30, always a highlight that, the top event, at the, the oldest event anyway at the regatta, going right through to the end of the afternoon at 4.30, and the Thames Challenge Cup, which is gonna be a real corker of a race. Silver Goblets and Nichols, I think the crowds will wanna stay to watch that race, Mark. Definitely, I think there's a, a yeah a battle royale in that last one there. So really looking forward to that. And we've had some exceptional racing this morning, but I'm super pumped for this afternoon. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, what do you reckon? I, I can feel the wind just on, you know, on on us now, which normally it's been blowing behind. But is it a bit of a tailwind now down the course? Yeah, it seems the way the, the wind seems to have swung round, so it's kind of favouring the crews as they race up the course. So you know, we might see some potentially different tactics because it has been quite challenging all week, you know, and our crew is going to try and get out in front, dictate the race, where in the headwinders we've seen all week, there's just more time to kind of get back on terms or make things happen. So it'd be really interesting, especially with the kind of decisions that crews are going to make as they race up the course. So the record time for the Princess Elizabeth was that 6.06 done by St. Paul's back in... 2018 can't see that record going today even though it is another St Paul's crew it doesn't quite have the same incredible quality that that race had but uh, we did see a fantastic visitors final only one second slower the intermediate fours than the stewards the open fours yeah that was that's what I mean there's been some exceptional racing this morning like some close races is what we like on finals day and it just shows the standard of those intermediate events, like knocking on the door at the big open senior events. So the grandstands are packed. People coming back from their lunches, from their picnics, ready for this first race of the afternoon, which we will be going to shortly, the Princess Elizabeth Challenge Cup, which is for schoolboy eights. So we're at the start for the first final of this afternoon session at Henley Royal Regatta. You can see the crowds lining the banks. Looks pretty good up there, doesn't it, Mark? It looks fantastic. This is a sort of 
finals day you want. It's nice and calm up there today. So it'll be clean. You know, there's no kind of rough water. So you, know, you can see the crews just sitting there going through their kind of thought process, that kind of nervous energy, that anticipation of what they're about to embark on where, you know, some of these athletes, that dream they had at one point of being in the final and racing to win the PE, which is obviously a huge thing for them as schoolboy athletes. Um, it's going to become reality in the next seven or eight minutes. That is the St. Paul stroke. Phil Wolfensberger, 16 years of age, as is the lad behind him, Felix Peerless. And you can hear Sir Matthew Pinson, the umpire of this race, go through the starting protocol, which is going to be hotly anticipated, this race, all the way down the course. Radley had that tremendous win against Eden where they rode them down. Fantastic contest. So it's the final of the Princess Elizabeth Challenge Cup. Radley College on the Berkshire side of the course at the top of your picture. St Paul's School on this side nearest to the island. Go. They jumped on it St Paul's didn't they Mark? Straight off the yeah they've had some really interesting races this week where some have gone out like a bat, I feel they've really leapt off the blocks. Where yesterday there was there was kind of calm about their racing as they kind of rode through into Wilmington. So it'd be interesting to see how this pans out as they kind of move through the island. Alp Caradogan, the tall lad in the middle of the St Paul's boat, is just a 15-year-old. He is a J15. I think he's the first J15 to row in a St Paul's eight. Bobby Thatcher's put him there. He has great faith in him, and so far that faith has been justified throughout this regatta. Bobby talked to him before this race he said my guys are improving every single race of the regatta they got better and better they keep on surprising me will it be just one more surprise for the guys from St Paul's just as they kind of start to bed down Radley trying to find their rhythm now you know both crews yes in that semi-final bided their time and came through and overhauled the top two seats so they both know they have a finish but obviously with the way they both raced yesterday, it's a recovery element. Can they come back and do it all again today at the same intensity? Well, Radley rode through Eton yesterday, so they'll have the confidence that they've got a second half of the course. Coached by John Gearing, who took that British pair to the Olympic qualifying ground last year. Bolding and Glenis who took a sabbatical from Radley. But a long-time coach of the first eight. Sam Townsend there, the head of rowing, and uh, Radley and St Paul's. This race is shaping up to be a great one, isn't it, Mark? It's exactly what we wanted, and I think what we all expected. You know, I, I don't think at the start of the week they probably believed they'll be in this position. They like said they've both grown in confidence as they've raced through the regatta, and you know this is going to be a battle royale. We saw the faces of Philip Wolfensberger, the 16-year-old in the stroke seat. Bobby Thatcher said, my crew, they're just kids. He's got two 16-year-olds, two J16s and a J15 in this St Paul's crew. So it's going much better for it when he put the youngsters in. And uh, at the moment, I think it's a maybe slight advantage to St Paul's, but only by the smallest of margins. Too close for comfort, really. Yeah, at this stage, it's just kind of settling down, you know, kind of sussing each other out, being in your boat, making sure you're going through your processes, because once we get to Fawley and we hit that halfway mark, that's when things will start to heat up, and that's when we see the kind of fist fight really start to unfold. So we're coming out of the race's first quarter into the second quarter. First blood to the men from St. Paul's, the young men from St. Paul's. They are on the left of your picture. They lead the young men from Radley College with the red and white blades on the right of your picture. Bradley look pretty smooth, don't they? They look quite relaxed. I don't think they're concerned at the moment. No, I, I, at the two common like, crews you see here, I just I do think Bradley just look a bit more composed. Um, they're not being flustered by what's going on next to them. And maybe they have, they're, they're so confident in that mid-race pace as they start to move up on St Paul's now. So this Radley crew, two changes from the crew that finished seventh at the National Schools Regatta. Angus Gray, Cheap and Max Hartwright have come into the boat, 116, 118 years of age, up in the two and the four seats. Stroke by Arthur Benjamin German, Hilton Harvey behind him in the seven seat. And St Paul's gone for that early lead, but that aggressive style you heard Mark Hunter talk about has carried them through, but Radley are looking very smooth, very cool, very relaxed, typical John Gearing style. 
And these two eights are going stroke for stroke down the middle of the course. We're into the second quarter of the race mark, and it's stroke for stroke. St Paul's with the narrowest of leads. And that is so impressive. St Paul's don't look the more composed, but they just look racing. Like they really want to take it on. The, they're kind of racing with no fear, as you kind of said at the start. And they're just grinding confidence. They've just got no one to fear in this. So it's really impressive the way they've gone out and taken this and lead at this particular point in the race. Two great coaches, John Gearing and of course Bobby Thatcher for St Paul's. And uh, let's not forget Donald Leggett, 80 this year, coached both at Radley, but he's been working with St Paul's about one day a week. He's not as quick as he used to be on his legs, but he comes down to give his expertise and Bobby Thatcher is very grateful for that. St Paul's lead Radley at the moment. St Paul's on the left of your picture. You can see that signal go up, that number two at the one mile signal. Job done for the first half, sort of uh, coming into the second half of this race. Job done for St Paul's. And actually, this is when we saw both crews yesterday start to light it up. So it's going to be interesting to see who has recovered in the best way, who has that spring in their kind of step as we kind of move into the last five, 600 metres. Radley, if anything, have moved back on St Paul's. I think St Paul's moved further out, but Radley are moving now. The crew on the right of your picture with the red and white blades, Radley College. Stroke by Arthur German, backed up by Hilton Harvey. There you can see the guys, Cameron Tasker, Hamish Rimmer, Max Hartwright, Edward Mortimer, Angus Gracie, and Henry Jones. Cox by Nikita Jacobs, replaced Johnny Gilbert. The Elliot, the week before this regatta, who cops at national schools. So a lot of changes in the Radley 8, but it's actually producing dividends for them. They are coming back, Mark. I'd love to see where they are from side by, you know, the kind of side angle now, you know, how close those bad balls are now. But Radley are definitely coming through now. They look strong. And St Paul's kind of battle and keep them behind. So St Paul's crew on that far side of the course finished. In sixth place in the National Schools Regatta. Wasn't the best of regattas for Bobby Thatcher. Thought he was on a bad lane, undone by the wind maybe, but they have the narrowest of leads. It's about a third of a length of canvas coming through to the finish. I look up and see St Paul's now. They're running out of water, Radley, but they're charging. St Paul's coming to the finish line. There's about three strokes left. Radley charging. Here they come. St Paul's, they take the Princess Elizabeth Jones Cup from Radley College Boat Club. Just, and the screams you can hear, absolute madness. James Trotman, the Cox, hands in the air. A sensational win for St Paul's, splash in the water. That is incredible. He talks about how young that crew is. We're going to see them back here next year and the year after. Some of those athletes are J16 and below, so that is incredible. Just the gutsiness they had, the way they raced, there was just no fear there at all. Celebrations will continue, I think, long into the night and thereafter. Congratulations from Minak Chiku, the two man from St Paul's School, to his opponents. And when I bumped into Bobby yesterday, he was saying they're just kids. You know, that's the thing that just blew my mind. Was that they're such young athletes that have raced with such composure there, going out, leading from the front, absorbing the pushes coming from Radley and totally dictating the race. So that is, that's senior at racing. That's not schoolboy race. That is really impressive. Right, well, let's head up to the start for the next race on our afternoon's program after that breathless encounter between St Paul's and Bradley. Well, there are the very distinctive features of Caracola from the Texas Rowing Center in America. And I guess she must be the favorite scholar in this race. Imogen Grant, the Cambridge University Boat Club scholar, closest to us. A couple of the more experienced at 31, Imogen Grant, a mere 26 years of age, but she's packed in so much experience in that 26 years, Mark. Yeah, she's an incredible athlete. She was in a lot with women's double last year in Tokyo that narrowly missed out on not just a medal, but winning gold and that blanket finish with four boats. Decided to take some time out for her studies and to go back to Cambridge, and you know, she said she was going to have some fun this year. 
It's not bad, is it, to make a Henley final, having a bit of fun? It's not fun. And, you know, she's got a chance against Kola. You, you would think Kola, she got the bronze in the world in 2019 behind Sunita Prospera and Emma Twig. So she was going strong. She was, I think, desperately disappointed not to make the final in the Tokyo Olympics, ended up finishing ninth. But um, she's such an experienced sculler. She's performed at the highest level in world championships, as had Imogen Gop. But there's the difference in in weights between Imogen Grant is a lightweight, so that means that she rose at a kind of maximum of 59 kilos. And Cara Cola weighs in at about 78 kilograms. So how much difference will that make in these conditions? Yeah, I think it's pretty even today. We talked about the kind of the following win potentially. So I think that kind of evens things out where if you'd have done this a few days ago with that headwind, it may have had more of an impact. This is the final of the Princess Royal Challenge Cup between Cara Cola of the USA on the left-hand side of your picture and Imogen Grant from Cambridge University Boat Club, Great Britain, on the right-hand side of your picture. Both scholars very close in times for this race. And uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how the lighter Imogen Grant fares against Cara Cola. You know, I think the way Imogen Grant races, she's so gutsy, she's so aggressive, she will go out and try and lead this race, Mark. She just keeps going. She's just one of those athletes that never seems to die or fade. Um, she's super consistent and obviously hugely talented. So as you said, it'd be really interesting how she mats up, matches up, but she's extremely quick in a single as well. Obviously not, that's obvious because she's made a final today but she is the fastest lightweight we have in the country leading into the Tokyo Games. So which of these two women will put their names on the Princess Royal Trophy? There's been some fantastic female scholars, the likes of Emma Twig, the Olympic champion, Mirka Napkova, the Olympic champion, Ekaterina Castle, the Olympic champion, Rumina Nekova, the Olympic champion, and Maria Brandin won this race so many times in the early years. I don't think she ever made Olympic champion, but the quality of names on this Princess Royal Challenge Cup is such that one of these two women will now add a fresh name to the trophy. Who will it be? Cola just coming through there. A little longer push-off at the back end from Cola there, Mark. Yeah, she's just got that, obviously being the taller athlete, she's got that more range. And she's really maximising that right now as she starts to just inch out on Imogen. But you know, with a single skull, you can change speed so quickly. So even if you're down half a length or a length, you know, you can really kind of eject up and kind of move the cadence or rate up. But it's about staying in contact. Is That's there much Im Imogen Grant can do about this move by Cola? Will she try and counter it? Will she have a different tactic to the ones that the race tactics that she thought she might employ for this race? Well, I think normally you'd, when you do the side by side kind of multi lane racing, you'll have a set plan, but then you've got other boats to feed off. I think with match racing, the kind of gladiatorial race that we have at Henley, I think you have to be more flexible. And actually, if things aren't going to plan, actually, how do you change it quickly? Because you don't want the, the gap or your opponent to move away and lose contact and lose, yeah, be out of the race. Cara Cola's been loving her time since the Tokyo Olympics at the Texas Rowing Centre, coached down there by Peter Mansfield, the former Dresdner Ruder Club athlete. And Cara Cola loves it down in Texas. It's a small group, there's about seven scholars, it's mixed, there's a great atmosphere and she's really enjoying her time down there in Texas. And she is on the right of your picture, Imogen Grant on the left, and Cola probably has a one length lead over Grant at this stage of the race. And she is tapping along at a high cadence here. If you look at the two athletes, Cara's definitely slightly higher on the rating than Imogen, and that's paying into her favor right now. She seems to be kind of gradually increasing. This race will, if Cara, Cola should win it, will make up for the disappointment of finishing in the B final of the Olympics. Ninth place for Cola, it's not what she wanted. She wanted that Olympic medal. But uh, Cola, of course, has raced, beat Ginevra Stone, the Olympic silver medalist for the US women's single slot. And Ginevra Stone took that silver in Rio. So she can punch at the highest levels, this woman. And I, so, I suppose that shows the class of Cara. She's on song and she, you know, she can deliver those sort of performances, even not to exactly the same level, but close to it. She's going to be really tough to beat today. Imogen Grant on the left of your picture, brilliantly stroked the Cambridge Boat Race crew this year with a fantastic stern pair combination. 
of her with the legendary Grace Prendergast behind her. They look fantastic, the two of them working in tandem. And I don't know how she does it, the rowing with her medical studies. You know, she's had to be up at 5.15 in the morning at Cambridge. She's had to complete the medical studies. She's not in the women's lightweight double this year. That is a different boat with um, Emily Craig and Maddie Arlott. But I reckon that Imogen will be doing the lightweight women's single at the World Championships this year. I'd be surprised if she isn't. You know, the caliber athlete she is, you know, she says she wants some fun, you know. It's a tough event to go into if you want fun as a single, but it, it works with what she's got going on with her studies and doing the boat race and other things in her life right now. So it's kind of gives that flexibility. So Cara Kola at the top of your picture, she's moved out to what, I guess a two length lead mark over Imaging Grant. That looks a pretty useful lead to have at this stage of the race. I can't see Kola blowing up or anything like Mahe Drysdale did in that final against Chettle Borsch but she has kept that high rate of striking throughout. Nice clearance off the back end yeah, too of those blades. She does skull really well, really efficient, uses her length really well. She collects, shoulders are nice and relaxed. It's kind of textbook sculling, so yeah, it's really nice to watch. The Californian went to University of Cal Berkeley, also competed in the 2012 Olympic Games as a youngster where she won a bronze medal in the American quad. So she has an Olympic medal in her back pocket. Will she add the diamonds to her Palmares today? Imogen Grant on the left of your picture. There she is, Imogen Grant, the 26 year old from Cambridge University Boat Club. She has battled everything this year. She battled to win the boat race. She's battled to combine her medical studies with her rowing training, and she has battled this singles race down the course with Cara Cola. But Cara's kept such a great line there. You haven't seen her like stray at all. She's kind of moving, being consistent. She's still tapping it. She's still keeping on top of it, keeping it light. She really wants this Cola, doesn't she? I think she can see her name on that uh, Princess Royal Challenge Cup trophy. And there she comes, I look ahead, and the scholars have something just under 500 metres to go. That's probably something around about a minute 50 for Imogen Grant to put in a final sprint. Can she do anything from that far back, Mark? It's really difficult. I haven't seen Imogen do something from this position before, um, so it'd be interesting whether she can get back on terms, but like any kind of race, especially in the final, if someone if breaks contact with you, you use the term breaking the string, you're not being towed, it's really hard to get back on terms. But the next, as you said, the next minute, minute and a half is so important to give herself a chance to try and put Cara under pressure. Imogen Grant got that really punchy style of sculling. You can see even on this difficult water at Henley, the blades coming clear every stroke off the finish. Out forwards, nice, easy, relaxed flow. Maybe she's moving back on Cola a little bit, I think. Perhaps the water's going to run out for Imogen Grant, but she is making a little bit of an impression on the Californian. Imogen Grant there, 26 years of age. She is an amazing fighter. She has come back a little bit on Cola coming through the enclosures. If she could just feel that overlap, that might give her a little bit of extra motivation, Mark. Yeah, and that, that's the thing, you, you want to feel that contact, and right now, unfortunately, she doesn't have that. Sakara has done exactly what she wanted to do, taking control of the race, really dictated from very early on, to give her that clearance and space to just sit and watch Imogen right behind her. Yeah, she's rated higher than I've seen her skull in previous World Cup contests or World Championships. I think it's done her really well in this race. So, Cara Cola, will become the champion of the Princess Royal Challenge Cup in 2022. Arms aloft, Imogen Grant, what a brave skull from the 26-year-old Cambridge University Boat Club sculler. And the two women will no doubt congratulate each other. She knows she's been in a race cola, didn't she? Oh, yeah, very much so. And you talked about the high cadence, you know, she kept that throughout. And maybe that's a new thing she's trying and definitely worked today as she came off that start, came into that base pace, but kept it high. Um, so she was kind of tapping it along and she was, which is unusual, you'd always think the lightweight would potentially rate higher than the heavyweight athlete, but not in this case. And it, it looked really well, it looked went really well, and it looked really efficient. So that was the 
race in the Princess Royal Challenge Cup. Coracola beat Imogen Grant. We will now go back up to the start for the next race. So the men from NSR Oslo on this near side of the course. My goodness, they've had some close races this regatta mark. Yeah, this is another one I think is coming. These guys had yesterday off. These athletes rested yesterday because they raced on Friday. Um, there just doesn't seem to be much between them throughout the regatta. And you've definitely got the top two crews in this event racing it out in this final. Here we see the men from Thames Rowing Club. Coached by Jamie Brown. And uh, they have had, I guess, nothing's easy in the wife holds. It's such tight racing, but I guess you could say they haven't had as many close finishes as the guys from Norway. So it's the final of the Wifold Challenge Cup. Thames Rowing Club at the top of your picture, NSR Oslo, Norway on this island side, the right-hand side of your picture. This is going to be a real barnstormer. Sven Oli Molstad Nicholson has got his hand up. Attention. Now it's down. Go. Oh, she held him a long time there, didn't she? Yeah, that makes it always difficult and a bit rocky, a bit uncertain. You may have lost the grip on the water, but great to see both crews off cleanly. Men from Oslo row on the uh, Aragon Fjord there in Oslo, coached by Halvor West. I was talking to him today, and he's really pleased with his crew's progress. You know what he was telling me, Mark, was that in the run-up, he said, you never get any good strokes at Henley. These guys are so experienced. They've raced Thames Cup, they've raced Wi-Fi Challenge Cup. But he basically didn't tell them. They changed their pitch from minus four to plus four, and he wouldn't tell him for an outing, and they had to cope with whatever pitch they had. And he said that really prepared them for the difficult conditions at Henley. That's really impressive. I've never heard of someone doing that. So that's thinking outside the box here. That's really impressive because, yeah, at Henley is challenging. It's not just about your race. It's about the wash, the wind, all these things that go on around you and being able to deal with all those kind of out, the, the things you can't control. The Thames Ryan Club at the top of your picture, just edging out on Oslo, but this race is not done and dusted by any means. Oslo will want to stop that move. I think their legs are quite tired. Apparently, according to their coach, they did have a, a day's road trip yesterday out to the local Tesco, which I think is the first time they've been out. But he said it with a bit of a tongue in his cheek. That's like a 20 minute walk or something like that maximum. But yeah, that, that'd be interesting to see how both of those crews dealt with that day off of racing because, you know, you get into a pattern or a rhythm, don't you, racing back to back days. And it's kind of strange to have that break. So Thames have obviously trying to capitalise on that by taking the early lead, taking control. I must say, this has been a fantastic first quarter from the Thames crew to have a Lens lead over Oslo. Crew of their calibre at this stage of the race. Hugh Jones up in the bow seat, the men's captain, the Thames finalist back in 2017, rode since 2015 for Thames Rowing Club, a loyal servant of the club, no doubt. Henry Lamb also from Newcastle University. I think he's been to the Junior Worlds. In the three seat, Finn Regan won the 40 last year in that Tideway Scholars crew. That was an amazing quad that won the 40 last year, that Tideway Scholars crew. And the former lightweight, James Stevenson, in the stroke seat at Thames. Furthest away from your picture, Thames on the right, NSR Oslo on the left. So given the races that they've had, which have been so tough, they lost by a canvas, or they won by a canvas from Upper Thames Rowing Club in the semi-final. They won by just three feet from Marlow on the Friday. I mean, have they got another race in their legs, Mark? Yeah, that's, that's three big, no, two big finals back to back, and with today a third. So that's, that's, yeah, to do that is very challenging, but that's what's uniqueness about the regatta, isn't that day, back to back racing, being able to recover so you can go and do it all again. But, Thames have really gone out and dictated this race and taken it from the first stroke, but also also worrying if they've taken too much. But we'll see as we kind of move into the second kind of second half of the race. 
Well, the Oslo crew have always had a great second half of the race. They're going to need it now because this is a very strong Thames crew. Anchored by that 19-year-old uh, youngster, Finn Regan. Thames steering across now. Is the umpire going to say anything, do you think, Mark? Maybe, because they are. They, they st still probably don't have enough water to be in that position. So it'd be interesting whether the umpire does tell them to move back to their station. But they're definitely moving into the middle of the river there. You can see that clearly there. The umpire, yep, flags just come up. It's Fiona Dennis there, the umpire of today's race. Yeah, might that be a little chink of light for the men from NSR? I have to say, barring accidents, I'm giving this race to the men from Thames Rowing Club. I just can't see NSR Oslo coming back from that position with the races they've had. Going to be heartache for the Norwegians lost in the final of the Thames Challenge Cup. They lost in the final of the Wi-Fi Challenge Cup in recent years, 2019. Most recently, it's going to be heartache again for the Norwegians if nothing changes in this race. And it is about that they've come through Fawley now. It's between here and those kind of enclosures. They have to get back in contention. Otherwise, Thames are really going to enjoy that kind of row for the regatta enclosures. There we see the Norwegians, Matt Zabrowski at stroke and Patrick Sturey in that Thames Challenge Cup losing finalist day, as was Halvor Bjorkland in the two seat. And then furthest away, Sven Ole Molstad Nicholson, the 30 year old. These guys are all working. Sabrowski is a carpentry apprentice, Stewart is a, an architect, Bjorkland is a medical doctor. They've only been able to row five hours a week. Their coach told me they hit their training very hard because. Uh, Bjorkstead has been on nights quite recently, so, you know, they've had to fit their training around him. And it, this is an impressive kind of first 1500 of the race, if you want to call it that, the way the Thames have gone out and they just kept moving. Like, it's really impressive and that kind of freshness that they've got over their competitors, potentially with the kind of tight racing that Oslo have had, is definitely paying dividends on the final today. So it looks like Thames Rowing Club are going to add another club win to their distinguished list of club wins over recent years. They are one of the top performing club in the country. Many young men and women, if they want to row, they go down to Thames Rowing Club on the embankment because they know they have Henley success. If you don't get into a final, then you'll get into a semi-final or a quarter-final. And hey, you may even get into a winning boat, Mark. It's impressive. Look, they've had two wins already today. This is going to be their third. Um, yeah, for a club to come to Henley, especially with the entry, entries we've had this year. It's such a stacked entry. To still be that competitive in all those events is extremely impressive. Jones, Lamb, Reagan and Stevenson come down to the finish line and look out for the commentary position. They have about five strokes left to go before they will celebrate. They have really been the better crew in this race. They've done the tired Oslo men. The Norwegians weren't really in it. Thames celebrate. They weren't to know that they would have such a comfortable victory in this race. It has been relatively comfortable. What a regatta these men from Oslo have had. Incredible racing they've given us. Wasn't to be today. And I think it's a tired Oslo crew that uh, come over the line. I think that was just too many finals in one week. You know, we talk about the close racing they've had throughout the regatta. It just destroys your legs, and there's only so many times you can kind of dig that deep. But a really impressive row there by Thames, taking advantage early, being in control, dictating the race, and then probably enjoying it more than, or having that kind of distance between them and their competitors. They probably didn't expect to win it by that margin. So that was the final of the Whitefold Challenge Cup, won by Thames against NSR Oslo. Let's go up to the start for the next final. So this is the Premier Women's Eight event at Henley War Regatta, the Remenham Challenge Cup, and we have got two Premier Women's crews in this contest. The might of Australia, two Olympic champions in that boat, Annabelle McIntyre and Lucy Stephan. 
they will be very hard to get past as we go down the Australians. A lot of Tokyo Olympians, Bromley Cox, Georgie Rowe from the eight, Georgie Patton from the women's eight, Katrina Wherry in the stroke seat from the women's eight that finished fifth in Tokyo. And these are the British women. Well, we've got two power-packed athletes in the middle of that boat, Rebecca Short and, and Rowan McKellar, both 28. They were in the women's four in the Tokyo Olympics that finished fourth behind the boat of McIntyre and Stefan. And this is a rebuilding project, Mark. Yeah, I was just about to say that after what happened in Tokyo, we didn't get the success we wanted as a, as a team, as a whole. Um, but obviously the women's eight wasn't kind of up to scratch and up to speed as we, we were hoping. Um, this is definitely a rebuild kind of process, project if you want to call it that. And these are the sort of races that, you know, our British women are going to want to see what they are against the Australians. Um, especially before they head out to Lucerne later in the week. But yeah, this is look, really looking forward to this one, just see how close it can be. Uh, there wasn't much in it in the times, but you never know what happened in those races. So yeah, we'll see how the Brits get on in this one. These are two relatively new crews in terms of the amount of time they've spent actually rowing together in the eight. Get ready, please. Annabelle McIntyre, the 25-year-old Australian Olympic champion. So this is the Remenham Challenge Cup for Open Women's Age. Rowing Australia at the top of your picture. Imperial College, London and Leander closest to the island side. The two crews blast off the start. Who's got the early advantage, Mark? Yeah, it looks like the Brits have really tried to dictate, jump back quickly, but I don't think there's much in it, though. Just look, the most important thing is it's clean, you're in contact, and no errors or no mistakes in these early stages because you don't want to disrupt that whole speed. Heidi Long there, the 25-year-old. She's won all the women's sweep eights at Henley Regatta, the Hambledon, the Town, and the Remenham. I think most recently in 2012, uh, 2021, last year's Regatta. But uh, she's up against a far tougher opponent than the Oxford Brooks and Queen's University Belfast outfit that came second in the final last year. Australia got a handy early lead. They look good, the Australian. Yeah, they look really racy there. That is definitely them gunning out, just trying to take that early advantage as they come off the island there. They're just they're still moving. They just seem to have that extra length out forward. They just let the boat come to them a little bit, just at the front end of the stroke. See, they're up at 37, come down from 40 strokes a minute, nearly 20 kilometres an hour, the Australians moving at mile. Yeah, they're really moving there. It just seems elastic, like they're letting it go quickly. They're not... They're not holding anything back. They're kind of riding that speed that they've generated early on. I thought I saw a shout there from uh, Georgie Rowe, the former surf life-saving rower, spotted by John Keogh, who's the coach of this Australian women's eight. Used to coach in Great Britain, John Keogh. Now he's had great success with Australia, that four that won the Olympics in Tokyo. And uh, this Remenham Challenge Cup shaping up to be a great race, but Britain will have to push back. There are the British, Mark. Yeah, the Brits have kind of come onto their rhythm, I say, slightly earlier than the Australians, and they're definitely, the Aussies just still are attacking, they're moving. They don't want to see them come off that high cadence. So Britain in their race rhythm, which will carry them through the middle of the race. Cox by the extremely experienced Morgan Bain and Williams. She won this event last year in 2021 one of the three coxes at british rowing competing for a place in either the women's boat or the men's boat australia on the right of your picture and the british composite from imperial college london and leander club on the left of your picture and it is australia who lead at this early stage of the race there we see Katrina Wherry, the 28-year-old from Mercantile. She was out of the eight in Tokyo in the stroke seat. Lucy Stephan behind her, fantastic row. Lucy Stephan from Nihil in uh, Victoria. Rose from Melbourne University Boat Club. Georgia Patton in the sixth seat, just anchoring the boat with Annabel McIntyre. You see her just that up there at five. The uh, figure of Georgie Rowe from New South Wales back in the three seat. Bronwyn Cox. University of Western Australia in Perth in three, Eleanor Price in the two seat from Sydney University Boat Club and Emma Fessy from UTS Harbourfield Club. And wherever you're watching this in the world, if you've stayed up late in Australia to watch this race, we hope you're enjoying this presentation of Henry Law Regatta. 
and this great race for Premier Women's 8th event at the Regatta, the Remenham Challenge Cup. And it's the women from Australia who have got drawn first blood in this first half of the race. We're through the halfway point now, Mark. Yeah, they've definitely taken that advantage and they've kept moving. They've gone for the, the kind of Foley marker, so that they're still in charge, that they're moving out. And it's really important we talk about standing contact all the time with this kind of match racing, gladiatorial race that we have at Henley. And this is really important now because that Australian eight has just kept inching out over that last 500 meters. And it's important the British eight really start to stick it or hold them. This eight. British eight coached by James Harris. The chief coach is Andrew Randell, the Australian who's come out of that programme, and Britain are now moving back. The women have been doing a lot of intensive paddling, a lot of intensive steady state. What a move by the British eight. Where has that come from, Mark? That is really impressive. Composure, not being flustered by what was going on beside them, being very clear about the processes they were going to go through as a unit. And that is coming to life right now as they start to put the Australian eight under pressure, they start to move up in contention and it looks like they're coming levels. This will be a sensational turnaround from the Tokyo Olympics if this British women's eight manages to overturn a boat with the quality of the rowers that the Australian crew has in it. Britain on the left, Australia on the right. There we see, I think, Rebecca Shorten with that blue Imperial top on. 28-year-old Ron McKellar really shoving it down. This is the benefit of that training, that tough training they've done under Andrew Randell's training program, Mark. Yeah, they said it's been a bit uncomfortable at the start when he came in, but you know it's paying dividends now when they want to ask those questions about themselves, about the crew, as they keep piling on the pressure and they start to slowly move away from the Australians. I've never seen a British women's eight just move as successfully as that. I, I guess I say never. I guess the 2016 British women's eight in Rio had that second half move the course. None of the women in this boat were in that Rio crew, but they have absolutely taken their legacy and moved through the second half of the course, just like the British eight that took silver in Rio did. Yeah, that, and that was really impressive. Obviously that silver medal in Rio, but today all these women, you know, they've got a point to prove as well. You know, the eight hasn't been that good in at the last Olympic cycle. They want this to be the lead boat putting Australia under pressure, just doing it in that style and fashion that they've done in the first section of the race has been super impressive. The bow woman, Rebecca Edwards, 28, Lauren Irwin, 23, Emily Ford and Esme Booth from the pair that won in uh, Belgrade, Sam Redgrave, Rebecca Shorten, Ryan McKellar, Heidi Long, stroking the boat long, the 25-year-old, and Morgan Bain and Williams calling out in the Cox's seat. Wow, this must be sweet. They're coming up to the progress board, there's about 10 strokes to go, and Great Britain are going to win the Remenham. What an amazing turnout. Australia, the favourites, are left in their wake. If the British crew come down to the finish, Australia charge, but it's too late. Britain have produced a devastating burn in the middle of the course to take the Remenham Challenge Cup. You can see what it means to them. They wouldn't have expected that. Arms in the air from Esme Booth, the 23-year-old. Australia crossed the finish line, dejected. Morgan Bain and Williams taps Heidi Long on the face and hugs her. That wow. was super impressive. It looked worrying at the start. The Australians obviously went off, kept that high cadence, looked like they were moving away. The British eight kind of grabbed hold of them, you know, didn't let them kind of lose contact and then grew in confidence. And then that second half just used their strength and power they've been working on behind the scenes and training and really you know, de delivered today when it most mattered. So super impressive then. Lots of confidence going into Lucerne next week from that. So we are now, we are now got an interview for you with uh, Sebastian from one of the winning crews earlier today from the St. Paul's crew who won the Princess Elizabeth so and he's going to be celebrations on the pontoon. Delighted. I've never seen anything like it. You guys jumping in the water. What's the feeling like? It's, it's, it's honestly the best feeling I could ever recommend to anyone. <laughs> I, I've dreamt of this since 2018. I was in my first year of the school and the oldest guys just set the record. <laughs> and ever since then, I've wanted to be that and do that. And just having done that right now is the best feeling. Given you lost last year in the final? Given I lost last year, 
and honestly the competition this year has been even closer or ever, so much closer than anyone I think would have anticipated and last year we only we had, had two returners myself and the vice captain Jonathan Catmule coming coming up this year I think this is definitely the youngest crew ever to win a PE we've got a 15 year old two 16 year olds in the crew and to Alp Cardogan, Felix Fearless and Philip Wolfens Farmer, I'd love to give them a big shout out for being like my younger brothers who I never had this year. So let's head up to the start for the next race after that breathless interview. So it's the Diamond Challenge Skulls between Oli Zeidler on this near side of the course and the improving Aussie, the vastly improving Aussie, David Bartolo from Sydney University Boat Club at the top of your picture. I'm joined in the commentary now, thanks to Mark Hunter, but a former Diamond Challenge Skulls winner, none other than Greg Searle. Hi, Greg. Hi, Martin. Good to be joining you. Good to be joining everyone to bring you final stay at Henley, and it's the Diamonds. Look at that lovely calm water. This is the final of the Diamond Challenge Skulls between Barthol of Australia at the top of your picture and Oli Zeidler from Germany on the right of your picture, blasting off the start. Yeah, both Skullers getting away pretty well. We know it can be a little bit bumpy. It has been earlier in the week, but it's lovely out there on the water today. That wind has dropped. Looking at Oli Zeidler here, just getting off his station. That's Richard Phelps giving him the flag, steering back on. He's going to follow that move very nicely correctly and get back towards his station. He's such a big man, but his sculling skills are just getting better and better. So all his idlers change clubs from his Donau club down in Munich, where he lives, to Frankfurt, Rudi Gesellschaft, Achten, 100, 9 and 60. The German club got a really good setup for him. He's now studying accounts and seeing tax laws, having worked as a, an intern, I think, for Deloitte. And he is, his tactics aren't a surprise in this. He, he wants to get clear water, doesn't he, Greg? Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? In a single skull, you know, there's even more in the mind than any boat. So whilst we're seeing this side-by-side -side match racing, Oli Zeidler will want to get ahead here. He'll want to shake off the Australian sculler beside him. And I think Bartolo has done a really nice job here of actually not letting Zeidler slip him. He's kept that overlap. And now Zeidler's going to be a little bit disappointed. Hang on, what's this guy doing still here? Bartolo's been fantastic through this regatta. The former surf boat rower took up rowing in 2016. He's got in various world championships, never hit the high notes. He was in a double with uh, Antil, Kayo Antil in 2019 that finished 12th out of the Olympic qualifying position. And he is in fact the reserve for the Australian double. But I think with Alex Hill's injury, the Australian selected in the men's single skulls. Uh, Bartolo will probably reckon that he's got the slot for the 2022 World Championships, and this race is an important part of that journey. Well, I think on this form, he's looking like he deserves it. He's at 35 strokes a minute. You can see they're through that quarter mile, and what he's managed to do is all that power and uh, energy that came out of Zeidler wasn't enough to slip him. As it is, you know, sculling very nicely, a little bit smoother looking, a little bit easier on the eye, probably Bartholo in terms of his technique, um, has kept him with him. And I think he'd be very pleased actually to have settled into this. I mean, you've raced on this course with the water. You know, Oli Zeidler was talking to our co-commentator, Kath Bishop, last night at a dinner in the stewards. And he was saying, one of the reasons I've come here was because I didn't really make it in the Olympic semi-final. He finished fourth in that race because the water was rough and he said, I've targeted Henley because of the water. This is where I want to row. I want to sharpen my skills. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's great to challenge yourself, bring himself here. Of course, he won the Diamonds back in 2019. Um, so he knows this course. He knows how to win on it. But yeah, absolutely. He's dealing with more difficult conditions. Um, we've got the water that moves, of course. It's a busy Sunday. Um, and you've also got this match racing element. And I think this is a really interesting match racing element in your head as to how is going to be feeling that right now with Bartolo still more, pretty much overlapping him here. So on flat water, there is no one, I think, who can out-sprint Oli Zeidler in the, in the final sort of 150, 200 metres of a race, but this isn't flat water. And you've got someone, a man, who can pull 5.37 on the Concept 2K. I don't know what Bartolo's PB is on that machine, but it won't be sub 5.40. 
Well, he won't have that power that Zeidler's got, but has he got the efficiency? Can he handle this water better? Does he see him take that little look to his left? And he'll know, yeah, I'm still in here. I've still got this overlap. I'm still putting total pressure on Zeidler. Um, they're going to be coming through that halfway marker. It's Forley. We know they're more or less halfway down the course here. And again, Bartolo's still right in this. He has sculled above himself at every race. He beat Ben Davison early in the regatta, the bronze medalist. Uh, from the Poznan World Cup, which was a fantastic result. Bartolo finished seventh in that World Cup. He beat Bastian Secker, the fifth place at Poznan, in the semi-final. He has lifted his game every single race, the Australian. And what he's got to hope is that Zeidler isn't able to keep the pace up, because I now think they've hit that third quarter. They're both at about 34 strokes a minute, and Bartolo was able to hang in there in that second quarter. But now that look over his shoulder is going to be one that's going to tell him I've now lost the overlap. He now has a little bit of clear water, and I think Zeidler now is going to think, now's the moment to just hold those blades in a little bit deeper, press those legs down a little bit harder. You can see what a big man he is. We've seen him walking around the town. He's, you know this guy is a big, strong athlete. He doesn't need to get those shins necessarily completely vertical to still row a really powerful middle of the stroke and move the boat an awfully long way. And there he is, just focused. He just keeps delivering one stroke after another. And I think he's going to be able to be opening the gap right now. Great 100 metre swimmer, Oli Zeidler, before he came into rowing. First on the scene in 2018 at the World Cup in Belgrade, where he took a bronze medal. And then took that world title back in 2019. Unforgettable race, beating Sverry Nielsen and Chettle Borch. Yeah, and as we look now at Bartolo, you can see quite a difference in terms of his style. His shins are coming all the way up to vertical. He's closing that angle between his backside and his heels to get absolute maximum length. He needs to slide that long to get anything like the same length of stroke in the water that Zeidler gets, because, of course, Zeidler is such a big guy. Um, Zeidler also showing a bit of nous here, that he's left himself just drift off his station a little bit. Just been corrected by the umpire. It's an easy and a small correction to make, but he'll be trying to make it uncomfortable for the Australian to his right-hand side. It's a real rowing family that Oli Zeidler comes from. He's actually being coached here by Johannes Fava, who's his grandfather, took gold in the German Cox Four in the 1972 Olympics. Normally he's coached by Heino Zeidler, his dad, but uh, he's a policeman in Munich and there's something going on in Munich. He couldn't make the trip to Henley. We're looking at Zeidler now coming down towards the enclosures. We know it's going to be a good roar. There's a good crowd in today. I mean, in terms of looking like an athlete, if you're going to look at shoulders, you're going to look at physique, then this guy has got it. But what goes with it is that that's a 14 kilogram boat that he's sitting in and it's moving along really smoothly underneath him. You can see the balance of it. You see it's not pitching end on end, despite the fact it's got a big man inside it. And uh, yeah, just you can see the line is sculled. It's really nice and tidy. And Bartolo is really going to have to find something special to get past him now. So I guess Oli Zeidler is not going to do anything special in the last part of this race. We've got about another 30, 35 strokes to go, Greg. Is he just going to keep it the same and just look at Bartolo and come back at him but not buy enough? I think they'll both need to squeeze it on. I mean, we're, if, if we find Zeidler has nowhere to go, then Bartolo could come back at him. But at this point, I think he's got it in control. So he'll have planned the race. He knows how he needs to finish. As you say, he's probably got an extra 1% or 2% he could go to, but he's looking great coming towards the finish line now. Oli Zeidler of Germany from the Frankfurter Ruggesellschaft Club comes up to the finish line ahead of David Bartolo from Australia. The Sydney University Boat Club man's handed him a great race. But Oli Zeidler wins the Diamonds for the second time, puts his name on a trophy with the likes of Mahi Drysdale, Thomas Langer, Steve Redgrave, Greg Searle, of course, and the sculling greats, and Zeidler is loving that, Greg. Yep, he's loving the moment, as he should do. The music plays in the background. Uh, people are enjoying the regatta. The crowd is at its maximum point. Um, I thought Bartolo did really well to hang in with him, as you say. He hasn't necessarily got so much sculling um, expectation around him as uh, Zeidler does, but I thought Bartolo is continuing to step up and up, which is great. But the favourite has taken this one away. Well done, Oli Zeidler. So, so we will go up to the start of the next race very shortly, and I'm leaving the commentary box. Thanks for your company. Stay with us. You'll be joined by Camilla Hadland together with Greg Sell to take you through. We're 
at the start now of the Stoner Challenge Trophy. This is an internationally contested final and two lightweight crews going up against each other here, Greg. Yeah, two lightweight crews. Look at that American double just sitting off the boat, the state boat there. The state boat boy's now going to have to reach out because he's let it drift just a little bit too far. But I guess what it's showing is he's clearing some weed or something, which we want to do at Henley to make sure they're clean uh, races and you don't want to get any of that weed caught around your fin. Um, what you see, we're clearing course up. What you can also see is the wind has died, so there's no wind there, um, which we've had in the earlier rounds where this boat would have been getting blown straight back into the state boat. Yeah, hugely different conditions here on the final day at Henley Royal Regatta 2022. It's so still up here. You've got the shelter of the island. The stream is, you know, almost non-existent. Beautiful flat water here. And you can see the Aussies there uh, front and centre of your picture um, who are enjoying just these moments of calm before what will be one of the most important races, potentially, you know, of their lives, of their season. Um, this you know new combination I think uh, they're gonna be feeling the pressure Greg they'll be feeling the pressure and they're trying to remain calm with the distractions that are going on around them these aren't normal sort of situations racing on a river like this with a crowd like that people often shout encouragement maybe at the times when you don't need it can be a bit distracting um, they'll be waiting for the umpires launch to swing in behind them um, and then when the umpire comes to their feet then they'll know it's more or less time to slide forwards um, get ready to square the blades up and USA, get ready to go. Australia, when I see that you are straight and ready, I shall start you like this. Attention. Go. Get ready, please. So, Molly Reckford and Michelle Sexer will line up for the USA on the left-hand side of your picture. And uh, it will be Annika Reardon and Lucy Coleman for Australia on the Buckinghamshire station on the right-hand side of your screen. They've come Attention. forward... Go. to take the first few strokes of their final here in the Stoner Challenge Trophy. And there's no wind, there's a few little waves, but they've made their way really nice and cleanly over those. Looking down the line of the boat from Australia, and what a lovely line they've taken off the start, Camilla. Yeah, absolutely awesome here from Reardon and Coleman for the Australian uh, national team. They're a brand new comp uh, you know, competitive double. They've only just walked onto the international scene a couple of weeks ago at the Poznan World Cup, the second World Cup of the season. And it looks like they got their bows out in front in those first five strokes. But the Americans, certainly the favourite on paper, having uh, beaten them at that international meetup a few weeks ago. Yeah, but we all know that being compatible on paper doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make a fast boat on the water and you'll team up as a good pairing in the end. So let's see how this one goes. We see uh, Annika Reardon there taking a look to her right and she's going, yep, we're the Australian lightweight double. That's the American lightweight double. And we're pretty much sitting on their bows. So this is going well so far. Yeah, it just goes to show the pedigree of these international crews, both lightweight crews making the final here in the Stoner Challenge Trophy. And, uh, you know, just to bear in mind, this is an open event. It means that they've come through the rounds having beaten open weight athletes. And uh, both of these currently ranked uh, among some of the best in the world, Greg. Yeah, of course, Camilla, that's very important to point out. This is an open weight, it's an open event. We don't have lightweight here at Henley. These athletes would normally have to weigh in before racing they haven't had to do that today um, and look how the australians here i think the angle is slightly um they're deceiving us but they're getting out towards that boat length which will help them at least disappear from view of the americans beside them yeah great start here for the australians lucy coleman in the stroke seat will be able to just about see the bow of the american crew molly reckford who's come back into this crew, having uh, suffered from COVID uh, just following the World Cup in Poznan two weeks ago. She was got stuck in Italy. She wasn't able to get over here to Henley Royal Regatta for the opening stages of this Stoner Challenge Trophy, but they were able to have a substitute on board. Fellows raced uh, in the earlier stages with Michelle Sexer, uh, but Retford now back here for the final in what is their quite well-seasoned combination that uh, went to the Tokyo Olympic Games, Greg. Well, all sorts of moving parts as well as moving ducks on the Henley course. And as you say, how will they have been able to deal with the fact that there was that um, 
COVID that they had to deal with, having to row with a spare, now having to change the crew again. Hopefully, as you say, it'll be like getting back into a comfy pair of shoes, that now they're back in the double together, it'll all feel good for them. Well, they're on neutral turf here at Henley Rogatta in the UK. The US, the Australians, uh, you know, about as far different of combinations as you could get. Retford and Sexer fifth at the Olympic Games in the lightweight double skull category. The Australians, as we've already mentioned, brand new to international competition, a brand new combination, and they've got their season off to a good start. They're going to be really pleased to be up here matching the US at this point in the race. Yeah, they certainly will, and it's lovely. We ask all the athletes, what are the highlights of their rowing careers to date? Uh, and these two Australian athletes said the highlight so far was picking up the silver medal at the World Cup 2 in Poznan just two weeks ago. Let's see whether this could end up being the highlight of their career, that whether they could pick up the win at Henley. But as we see this one bow on bow, what do you think we've got here, Camilla? Yeah, this is teeing up to be an absolutely sensational race and something that we actually expect, you know, from lightweight crews. Uh, it's, we often see it on the international stage because the weight of all of these athletes has to be the same. You know, there's, there was a weight limit for their international racing season, of course, not here at Henley Royal, but they need to keep on weight uh, and it makes for really matched racing usually. Well, it does make for matched racing. And as those stewards there came past that half mar halfway mark, the Forley, I think there was a signal that said the crews are level, but I'm not sure they're level now. I think the crew to the right of our picture, Sesha and Reckford, have moved in front, but they've also moved into the middle, haven't they? They are, they're just drifting, and umpire John Hedger, he's not got uh, any flag out yet, and just as I say that, I saw the, the megaphone being picked up in the umpire's launch. He's watching this with a keen eye to see whether he thinks that Reckford and Sexer of the USA are just drifting across their station, and you can see them, they're poised and ready, uh, but at the moment, Greg, he seems to be happy. Yeah, the umpire seems to be happy there because I think the Australians have actually steered such a good line on the left of our picture. They've kept their distance from the booms absolutely perfect all the way along the island, all the way along the course. The Americans have bounced along a little bit. They've now taken themselves back to their station. It hasn't helped them, but even with that, it looks like they might have come through here and got their bow in front. Yeah, still overlap between these two crews. It was a five-second difference between gold and silver at the second World Cup in Poznan, the USA clinching that gold on that occasion. So still to be within, well, that's probably about a second separating them at this point in the race if we were to convert it. Um, oh, but still, look at this steering. This could cost them a few seconds here, Greg. It's certainly going to cost them a few seconds when you see them wander out like this. And earlier in the week, the headwind was so strong and we we're seeing these pictures and, and being harsh on people steering. Today, there's no wind on the course. It's pretty calm and nice. I can't help thinking maybe the American doubles here are thinking, let's let ourselves drift into the middle and maybe send up huddles towards them a little bit. This is a little bit of a try and give ourselves as much of a help as we can on this shared course with no boys in the middle to keep us apart. Great little look there from Annika Reardon in the bow seat for the Australian double, the, the lady from Tasmania. She's uh, the closest at the moment to this USA crew of Retford and Sexer. And there we have it. And in fact, actually, I thought it was John Hedger. In fact, I think it's Ben Helm umpiring this one. Uh, correction from me there, but he has, in fact, warned the USA for the first time in this race for their steering. Yeah, I think that's right. They should be warned for their steering. They should go back. They haven't caused great interference. The Australians on the left of our picture. As you say, Annika Reardon in the bow seat as we have a look now at the back of Molly Reckford. Michelle Setcher in front of her. And they are on their station now. They're in control and I think they're actually moving. You can see that marker board on the left for everyone on the course to see the mile and one eighth showing boat number one is the US, boat number two is the Australians, and there's nearly a length gap between those two boards, just as there's nearly a length gap between these two crews. Yeah, and there we are, we're looking at the bow seat, Molly Reckford, who's recovered from COVID to be racing here at Henley Royal Regatta today. The Dartmouth alumni who uh, backs up Michelle Sexer in the stroke seat from the University of Tulsa and uh, they've now broken clear water and it looks like it's going to be seasoned, uh, the season combination here over the newcomers to the international scene. The uh, pedigree on paper proving true in this Stoner Challenge Trophy final as the USA 
Molly Reckford and Michelle Sexer did all the important work in the middle part of this final to triumph in the Stoner Challenge Trophy for elite double skulls here at Henley Royal Regatta. And look, a, a very calm sort of uh, processing here for the US, no big celebrations from them. Yeah, no huge celebrations, but they've been pushed to the edge. I think the Australians were very brave the way they took it out, took it on, but the Americans came through the middle um, and uh, a good win for them. I think the Australians will be pleased. Good progress for them. As we say, a new double coming together um, and these two crews will head on. I'm sure they'll head on towards Lucerne. They'll keep drafting and getting themselves faster and quicker, ready for the next race. But today it was all about Henley Royal Regatta and it was all about this double. So there were the smiles of the USA, and now we're going to head back up to the start of the Grand Challenge Cup. The Grand Challenge Cup on the start line. Oxford Brooks University and Leander Club on the Berkshire Station and Rowing Australia on the Buckinghamshire Station, the oldest event at this regatta and a showdown for the ages between Great Britain and Australia. Yeah, and it's brilliant watching these two crews getting off the start like two locomotives just chugging into action. They didn't throw themselves at it. It was just a surge and a surge and the pistons of the legs started going down quicker and quicker. Now they're up to full length coming through about 10 strokes. The Australian crew we can see here throwing everything at it alongside the British. Bad ball to bad ball, top of the island. Well, this is going to be a sensational matchup here. Rowing Australia were the record holders in this event. They set that in 2018. A very different crew here coming to Henley Royal Regatta. Uh, but the Brits are just looking to extend out this lead in their sort of step down onto pace. Tom Ford in the stroke seat for the British crew. We're now looking at uh, the eight men from Australia plus their Cox, Kendall Brody. Uh, who will be guiding them through the next stages. Yeah, well, we look at this crew, five of the crew making their senior debut in Poznan, coming to Europe now to race for the Australian national team. You see the British are starting to slip away, starting to establish a lead, but their blade work is looking pretty tidy. Looking very tidy, and this new look British eight uh, there's a, has absorbed some of the members of the British men's four. Rory Gibbs in the bow seat, Sholto Carnegie in the four seat, uh, coming in to strengthen this eight and uh, having stepped off a gold medal at the first World Cup in Belgrade this season, they will be full of confidence. But this is a blind matchup. The Australians were in Poznan, the British were in Belgrade, and this is the first time they've met this season. Yeah, first time of many, I'm sure, but the British crew on the right of the screen have established a lead here. As you say, they raced in Belgrade at World Cup 1. They won that by 10 seconds. An enormous winning margin in the men's eight as we're taking a look now with the Aussies. Yeah, this uh, Australian crew are certainly, you know, going to be feeling the pinch here in these middle stages, being down on Great Britain, but looking relaxed there in the four seats. Jackson Kench for Australia. A national champion from Oz and uh, he just sort of granted himself a quick look out the boat there to see whereabouts he matched up with his opposite man. Yeah, and that look will tell him that they're still very much in it, but we know in eights and particularly in eights in the Grand Challenge Cup, you get on to a lead and then you may be able to hold that lead. You may be able to hold just half a length. Things don't always turn around the way we might see them more in the smaller boats. Um, so the Aussies will want to be stopping the British from actually getting that clear water move. The crew's coming up through this quieter, empty patch on the course. But you see them come through Forley. There's going to be a margin. I think it's going to be looking quite close to a length. Yeah, the British will be really pleased with that, Greg, at this point, because, you know, the Australians back in 2018, they were on the other end of this. They were in deficit. They were having to chase, and unfortunately, it never happened for them. And actually, great, you know, a Great Britain squad crew hasn't won the Grand Challenge Cup since 2015. We had Oxford Brooks University last year, of course, uh, but that wasn't a, a British squad outfit. This is the Olympic squad now, and look at this clear water as they come through the crowns towards the Remenham Club. Yeah, fantastic performance from this British eight. As you say, two of this crew were rowing for Brooks last year when they won this event. Now they're in the squad eight, the Great Britain eight, and that open water is just getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, 
And this Australian crew, they were silver medalists at World Cup 2 behind the Germans, those age-old competitors, those rivals uh, that Great Britain will be keen to measure themselves against in the seasons to come. They're racing at Lucerne next week in World Cup 3 and Henry Fieldman back in the Cox's seat here, uh, having missed that first World Cup in Belgrade. He's going to be keen to demonstrate what he can do to be selected into that seat. Yeah, Henry Fieldman, experienced Cox sitting in that seat, taking that look to the right, holds his body so still, as all the Coxes do, doing as little as possible to disturb the movement of the boat whilst keeping the crew on it, while giving them the information they need. He's talking to their heads, and he's now might be talking to their hearts to try to get them to find what they need. They're in front of the enclosures. This is a special moment for them. It's one they're going to want to treasure. It's one they're going to want to deliver stroke after stroke as well as they can. They're in a brilliant position here to win the Grand Challenge Cup, but there's still work to do. Yeah, the Australian crew here are going to be really hurting. It's painful being behind, but especially on the stage that is Henley Royal Regatta in the Grand Challenge Cup. Um, and there's just nothing that they can do at this point in time, I think, uh, to recoup this deficit because the British just look so sharp. They've snapped that elastic band that held them together in the early part of the, the course. And now it's uh, all of the pressure on rowing Australia. And I think there'll be no let up from the British eight either. They want to use this opportunity to go and race again and again, build that confidence. As you say, it's a new combination. Lovely to see all the different outfits, all the different club colors on display on the Henley course. They'll blend that together into the Great Britain eight. And this is another step in the learning. It's one that they'll put into their memory backs about how they felt passing the progress board, passing the grandstand at Henley Royal Regatta 2022. This crew littered with former Henley winners, but uh, nothing like winning the Grand Challenge Cup for elite open aids. And that's going to be a huge, huge celebration. The first time in seven years, a British squad crew winning the Grand Challenge Cup ahead of rowing Australia by clear water. What an absolutely phenomenal performance there from that eight. Brilliant performance from the Britain eight. From stroke one, I think they were just that tiny bit more on it. They were a tiny bit better. Um, they never went slower than the Australian eight. The Australians are a good eight. Let's not take anything away from this British eight. But just as they did in the first World Cup race, they just opened water and moved and moved and moved. Fantastic. They'll feel pleased with that. And they're stepping on to Lucerne next week. What do you think is going to happen? Well, we'll get the race with the Great Britain eight up against the German eight see who else comes onto the scene but i think that'll be a confidence booster uh, for the coaching team a confidence booster for the athletes team to go with the women's aides to know we're doing things and they're working out well great for the great britain rowing system well what a great race but uh, next up we're going to be speaking with some of the victors in the remenham challenge cup from the british a imperial college london and leander club sam just how significant is that win for the boat Oh, it means a great deal. We've been trying to get our women's project to be as strong as we can, and we've obviously been focusing on the four and the pair, but we thought we'd come to Henley and just see what we could do as an eight, and I think everyone's just blown away by how quickly we've brought it together. We haven't had many sessions in it, and it just felt like each piece, each race we did together, we just stepped on that extra one, two percent. So incredible feeling. How good is it to get one over the Australians? <laughs> I mean, it's always good to get one over anyone. Just to win Henley in itself is amazing. Um, obviously, I've well, I've done a couple of Henley finals, never won. So just yeah, it was good. <laughs> and how does this? Um, how good is this? How much of a boost is this? Looking at the the World Cups and possibly the World Championships at the end of the season. I th we're just going to take so much confidence into it. We've already been building confidence as a squad. Like we're fitter, we're stronger, we're faster, um, and every win is just like another like, yeah, we've got this. We can do it. We can go up against everyone. And was the atmosphere amazing supporting the local team? Yeah, it was honestly. It's just the whole way along the bank from start to finish. You can just hear everyone yelling, and it just it really it is amazing. And get, don't get anything like it. 
What a great interview there from Rebecca Shorten and Sam Redgrave from the Remenham Challenge Cup 8. Lots of happy, smiling faces in the British team today after some great performances. And uh, great to hear how much Henley Royal Regatta really means to them. That sensation of rowing through the crowds, there's nothing like it. Yeah, lovely for Rebecca Shorten to win that Henley medal. She competed here before, hasn't got one before. And lovely to see their determination that they're on to the next. The Town Challenge Cup now lining up on the start line. This is for elite women's Coxes fours. The Town Challenge Cup now lining up on the start line. This is our elite women's Coxes fours event. And we're looking at Wairiki Rowing Club of New Zealand lining up on the Buckinghamshire station. And they're going to be facing off against the Denmark's Row Center for Denmark over on the Berkshire station. And we've seen so many international matchups here in well, this year in the 2022 finals. Um, another cracking one to look forward to here as these guys build through their international seasons. And I'm really excited to see how the Danish and the Kiwis are going to perform here. Yeah, very excited to see them here in the Open Women's Coxless 4 event, um, the Town Challenge Cup. Um, and you've got the New Zealanders there trying to stay relaxed, trying to stay calm, waiting in these moments. Um, and the Danes on the other side, yeah, excited to see how they're going to get on. I saw them this morning, actually. They've done a, all the, the crews were probably out for a paddle this morning. They came off the water. And I was able to just have a chat with them. And they said they're really enjoying being at Henley Royal Regatta, really enjoying the atmosphere, surprised at how big it is. Um, and that's unsurprising to us. Yeah, it's, uh, it must be really special coming here for the first time and with no expectations um, and just seeing the amount of support there is. This is one of the biggest rowing regattas in the world. You know, it's up there with the likes of the Olympic Games, the World Championships. Henley Royal Regatta is so special and fantastic to see so many people up at the start here to watch some international crews uh, kind of blast off into the distance. Yeah, and at the start here, you can still hear what the crowds are saying. You're waiting in these quiet moments. Then as you row along the course, the, the noise gets louder and louder until you get to that steward's enclosure, which is absolutely bursting, as we've seen. And it's just a wall of noise when you get to the end. So we're starting to come to front stops and come to attention now. Denmark this is the final of the Town Challenge Cup between Denmark's Row Centre on ready, the Berkshire Station and Wairiki like Rowing Club of New Zealand Attention. on the Buckinghamshire Station. Get ready, please. The hands go up in the bow seats there. Julie Paulson for the Denmark's Row Centre, Catherine Laban for New Zealand, and they tentatively put them down, ready to Attention. race. Go. This straight line down towards Henley Town Centre, towards us here at the finish line. And it's a great start here for the Danish, Greg. Yeah, good start for the Danish. They'll be pleased. I won't be surprised to see them try and take it to the New Zealanders. We often see New Zealand crews. We've seen them in this regatta get into a steady pace. Um, but here we are. They're both crews away really nice and smoothly. Both crews steered by the person in the stroke seat on the right. That's Phoebe Spores. On the left, that's... Astrid Steensberg and both crews steering really nicely along the island. Yeah, Phoebe Spores, sister of Lucy Spores, who we saw racing in the Princess Royal Challenge Cup for single skulls. She's now here leading uh, this crew down the track with the steers foot for New Zealand. And pretty equal footing here off the end of the island. But I think if anything, Greg, um, the Danish crew look like they've just come down uh, onto pace that little bit smoother. Well, let's see how this one goes. As you spotted, Camilla, I thought the Danes really went out for it. To me, there was just a little bit more of a look of relaxation about the New Zealanders. And you've got to ask the question, is that going to be relaxation that's helpful as the course goes on? Or is that something that's going to just not give them the pace that they're going to need? But, um, yeah, a good start, I think, for this one. Yeah, and another new combination that we're going to see racing throughout the Olympiad, I'm sure, for uh, Denmark. This uh, crew of Julie Paulson, uh, Marie Johansson, Frieda Nielsen and Astrid Steensberg have come together and uh, been fairly successful at their first international of the season. Three of them winning a historic silver medal in the eight uh, for Denmark, their first ever in that boat category back at World Cup 2. So they're going to be riding high on those feelings of being a part of that historic team for Denmark. 
Yeah, as you say, the, these women rode in that Danish eight in Poznan. They picked up confidence from that. They put that down as one of their highlights. Now they're coming to the Henley course. And actually, I hope it looks like that confidence is helping them to feel confident here. But they've got into their rhythm and they've just managed to start to move on the New Zealand crew. It's, it was about level coming out of the island. It's looking more like it's about a third of a length now by looking at that board there. And look, wonderful steering. We've said it already in these intense moments. It's so difficult to wrangle these boats when you're up at high intensity to do what you want them to do. And uh, these international level athletes are really uh, putting on a performance here to show how it's done. And Denmark, I think from this shot from behind, I'm just watching the blade placements here. And I think just that little bit more together from the crew on the right from De uh, Denmark's row center over the Wairiki crew of New Zealand. But uh, look, New Zealand, they've got an Olympian on board, a silver medal winning Olympian on board uh, in the form of Beth Ross in the three seat. What do you think she's going to be you know, telling her crew at this point where they sit down on Denmark? I think she'll be encouraging them to hold their nerve. Um, I think it's not done this early in a race ever at Henley. Um, and what you're seeing is that the, the crew from Denmark just needing to correct the steering a little bit, both the crews settling into their rhythms. You can see them pretty much exactly stroke for stroke in terms of how they're moving. So now it's about distance per stroke, it's about efficiency. They're both quite high in their rate, both about 37, 38 strokes a minute. Um, so it's about how well those strokes are delivered, whether they can do nothing to slow the boat down. And uh, yeah, in terms of what Beth Ross is saying, I think it's more of the same. Let's just try and edge our way back in the second half. This event here, the Town Challenge Cup, formed at the Regatta in 2017. So still one of the newer events here to get your name on the trophy. And, uh, well, I think still very much up for grabs here. This distance has just remained the same with every stroke. And, you know, I think uh, the, the crew from Denmark are going to be very aware of that. And uh, the, the New Zealanders are creeping up now, Greg. New Zealanders are creeping up, and that marker shows that they're, they're actually seeing them as in front. That number two's gone up, showing the bow ball of New Zealand either in front or perhaps they're going to be level. But it's just, uh, what can I say, a rhythm that just keeps coming and coming from the New Zealanders. They're taking on a little wash now. Look at that wash hitting the two crews. Let's hope they can handle that well. Yeah, and I think absolutely right. The uh, Wairiki Rowing Centre for New Zealand, the New Zealand national team, the women's national four here are a canvas up as they come through to Remenham Club. This is uh, going to be such an impressive move from them if they can hold this all the way to the finish. It's now asking questions of Denmark. You know, Denmark were the... Uh, but sort of stronger performing outfit at the World Cup, but uh, this New Zealand four here come here with a point to prove. Well, it's all learning, it's all steps on the road, and here racing at Henley Royal Regatta, we're seeing the New Zealanders doing what New Zealand crews do so often, which is to get off the start well, then find the pace, and then just be relentless. And they keep coming relentlessly at you at about 36 strokes a minute, moving really smoothly and, uh, and just churning it out. And some steering uh, now being steering warnings being issued now to the crew from New Zealand, and that's going to be the job of Phoebe Spores in the stroke seat to correct them, and not the kind of thing you want to be hearing when you're only marginally in front. That you have to adjust and think about that. Uh, and uh, look at this. Let's see if it's made any impact on where they are. Well, she's made that correction with the rudder on her foot. The crews have done the work with both their feet, pressing those legs down hard, connecting their blades, and they're doing well. They've moved it out to what looked like about two-thirds of a length. Yeah, it's not uh, ruffled their feathers at all here, the Kiwis. They are still, you know, moving out with every single stroke and a real decisive press uh, down into the finish here for them. Yeah, the New Zealanders did well, but look, they're wandering back towards the middle again now. It looks like the umpire's going to go back to the flag. And again, we're going to have to another little correction from Phoebe Spores. She was reserved for the women's eight for New Zealand uh, at the Olympic Games. Now she's sitting in the stroke seat of this four. She's made that correction really nice and clearly. There might be a little straighten up required, but I think she's put that in place. And yeah, the New Zealanders just keep coming at you. Can the Danes find something? Will this crowd that they were surprised to find here in Henley be able to lift them, take them to a higher level and make a big, big move in the last 25 strokes or so? They are springing here into the final 250 metres. So much liveliness here from the Danish crew, but grit coming from the New Zealanders.
They've been so powerful through this final 300 meters. And uh, I think there's going to be overlap by the end, but it's not far uh, from the Danish crew in towards the crowd. And I think that was one through the middle there, Greg. Yeah, I think it was one through the middle. Brilliant performance from the New Zealanders. They held their nerve off the start, got into that relentless rhythm, and it's taken them all the way to the line. Well, what a uh, endurance uh, sort of effort there from Phoebe Spores, Beth Ross, Davina Wadi, and Catherine Laban of New Zealand. And, well, that really took some effort. Uh, barely a celebration for how exhausted they are. Yeah, really calm, deliberate performance, well controlled from the crew from Wairaki in New Zealand. Congratulations on the big win here at Handy Royal Regatta. Up at the start, next up, we've got the ladies' challenge plate. And we're going to be looking at Leander Club versus the University of California, Berkeley. At the start of the ladies' challenge plate, on the right of your screen, the University of California, Berkeley, USA. And on the left-hand side of your screen, Leander Club in those quiet moments before the start. And they are on the way. This is going to be a huge matchup here. So many developing athletes who are aspiring to Olympic Games and, in fact, have competed at Olympic Games. This intermediate eights event here, Catherine, is uh, really stacked with future stars. It is a joy to be here for this event. This is so, I mean, they're just fast and furious finals coming down the course today. Um, and as you say, these are these are athletes who are going to have amazing potential in their own boats but might have eyes on bigger prizes as well so it's an incredible opportunity for them to just lay out what they've got today but it's looking pretty level pegging off the end of the island and blinking you'll miss it this will be one of the fastest events of the day but uh, the home crowd from leander club will be pleased to see as this moon moves towards them down the track leander club place just after the finish line here at henley that they've managed to sneak out in front in this early stage yeah, and Leander Club also on that side of the course, the Berkshire Station, which means you are really close to those crowds. So as we see, the bank sort of comes in and out of that very straight line where the where the boy line is, and you actually end up at points feeling you've got people shouting right in the right at the edge of your when you put your blade into the water. So it's very dramatic scenes, and as a as a crew, especially in a leading position, it is an absolute thrill to race in front of this final day. And they are going to be uh, sort of filled with gusto here, Leander Club. It's been a little bit of time since uh, a ladies' plate crew from Leander uh, lifted the the uh, challenge plate. It was 2016, uh, six years ago now, Catherine, and they will know how much this will mean to the club to keep themselves in front of Cal. Yeah, it's one of those events. I mean, we've got some newer events coming in. We've got this, this is one that dates back to 1845. So it's one of those events. There are going to be a multitude of big names attached to that trophy, and you want to add your own one to it. Absolutely, and uh, this crew for Leander Club that currently are in the lead. Cox by Wolf LeBrock, uh, the under 23 European champion from the men's eight. He coxed that crew to uh, victory. And in front of him, he'll be looking at Peter Lancashire in the stroke seat. Another Henley winner from the University of Washington, uh, who's now moved back to Leander Club. But lots of crossover between these two crews because a couple of former Leander athletes actually lining up for Cal Catherine in Ewan Hadfield and Ollie McLean. Yeah, we see a lot of this. We've talked about it a bit during the week. A lot of you know British athletes um, going over to the States, going to university there. There are incredible sort of scholarships on offer. So brilliant, brilliant experiences for some young British athletes to get over to UCAL and experience life there. Oh, great to see there. Ryan Todd Hunter, James Vogel in the two and three seat for Leander. That was a close up shot of them. They rode together uh, for Durham University back in the Prince Albert in 2018, where they set a couple of uh, course records, the barrier and Forley, but now joining forces to try and take victory in the ladies' plate and looking, well, pretty good for them at the moment. But what do you think uh, Cal are going to have to do here at this point in the race, Catherine, to get back on terms? Well, you can see him in both boats, unsurprisingly. In a Nates race, there is a, I wouldn't use the word comfortable, there's a gap now opened up. Leander are, you know, will be feeling 
exactly where they want to be, but it won't be, there's still a, a hint of an overlap there. So until you've got that break from the boat behind, you are not going to let off. And you know, this is a quieter part of the race. They'll soon hit the enclosures. And at that point, the adrenaline surges. And you, they, I think we'll see the end of lifting all the way. Berkeley really have to act now. They've got just about touch there. You can just see the bows of their boat just overlapping the stern. They have to go now. When they hear the crowd, they're running out of time. Yeah, the bow ball's just tickling the stern of Leander Club. That is not the position they will want to be in, especially with the calibre of athlete they've got in the crew. Uh, Gennaro De Mauro sits in the four seat. He's over 200 centimetres tall. Uh, he was the Italian Olympic single sculler, a real rising star at just 20 years of age. Uh, and he's the linchpin of that Cal crew, but they're going to need all the power from those 200-odd centimetres to be going into these final few strokes because Leander are a length up, and we're looking at the back there of Tom Ballinger in the bow seat, uh, who would be the first to cross the line if they can keep up this effort. Yeah, and they can feel that now. You, you know, the home support, you said this, the Leander crew is a, a crew that trains on this course day after day. They will have a lot of local support and they'll be lifted by that coming to these final stages. They will be very aware that Leander Club's name does not feature on that ladies' plate challenge plate trophy since 2016. Is it going to be all smiles? The crew from Leander Club, a home regatta, a home course, and will it be a home win here? Leander Club in the ladies' challenge plate will beat out at the University of California, Berkeley, from the US of A. They are going to be ecstatic with that and, uh, well, you know, absolutely amazing race. Oh, another fantastic race from both crews. We had really, really classy eights rowing there. Both kept length, both had rhythm, really power coming down both boats. But, you know, we were saying this, there can only be one winner, and Leander really did take it from the very first stroke. They were never going to let up on this home course, and they've done, the, they've done the business to get those names engraved on today. Well, the arms going up there as they cross the line for Peter Langshire in the stroke seat for Leander Club. And uh, there will be celebrations at the Pink Palace tonight uh, to see that trophy being lifted. And look, just exhaustion, I think. Felix Drinkle there, a former Oxford Blue, just barely being able to react, Catherine. I know, and I, th I mean, I think this is the moment, isn't it? Win or lose, this suddenly when you cross that finish line, everything goes from flat out to just ending. And, you know, exhaustion keeps saying, but so does elation and, and the thoughts of a job done. There's been a big, big build up. You know, the Henley Royal Regatta is such a sort of pinnacle for these club crews to serve to come here to get to the final stage, to get to Sunday and then take home the title means so much to every single one of these athletes. Well, look at the crowds here that we've got on finals day at Henley Royal Regatta. The banks, you know, four or five deep just to see the amazing racing that we've had so far today. And I don't blame them at all. And we've had a beautiful day here and wonderful to see everyone back in full force after a sort of calmer year last year, Catherine. I know. And, and actually, I know we, I think we talk obsessively about the weather. We're British. We get to do that. But... Again, it's a lovely day here. The conditions are actually superb for racing. And it's wonderful to see the crowds sort of rewarded for their enthusiasm through rain, hail, lightning and thunder this week to get a glorious sort of day of racing finals under sunshine. Yeah, and the final day here, as you say, it's a big sort of climax, a big build up here to this set of racing. And whether you are here watching friends and family and you know nothing about rowing or you're a rowing anorak that's been coming for the last 50 years, there is something for everyone here to enjoy. And they've been treated to some marvelous races. I think the closest we've seen this morning, Catherine, one foot, right? I know, back in the stewards event. It was, we, they're just extraordinary racing. And like we've said, whether it's sort of, you know, Athletes starting off early on in their career, we've got some incredible schools racing here in both the women's and, and men's side of things, right up to, you know, you've got international world champions, Olympic medalists, we've got, we've got kind of everything here at this regatta. So actually for a day out that's individual or family, it's a, it's a really special day to come and see some top quality sport. And even more top quality sport to come. We're not done yet. Another few races still to go here on the program of finals day of Henley Royal Regatta and the next of those upcoming the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup. And 
thank you to Camilla. I'm joining Catherine here in the commentary box and we're at the start line for the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup. Um, so special, they've made it through to this Sunday, the finals day at Henley, I can't tell you enough how big this day is in the rowing world, it's a huge moment and we're here looking at the Claire's Court crew on the Berkshire station. Just sitting relax Catherine, we've got a few more minutes till about to go and as we stare down the course, looking at the Redwood Scholars there, very calm scenes. I think we're very calm, we're very relaxed here in the commentary box. I'm sitting in that start line, although it looks calm, there'll be hearts will be pounding and there'll be, you know, they, it, even to qualify for this event is so competitive. So to make it to this final day, it's a big, big thing for both of these crews. So they will want, to, they've got 2,112 meters waiting for them ahead and then the, the champions declared. So this is, this is down to them now. And move to the front stops. Start stroke from powerful position. This weather blades as we join the start the Diamond Jubilee Junior Women's Courts. Claire's Court School on the Berkshire Station at the top of your screen. Redwood Scholars USA on the Buckingham Station on the bottom of your screen. And off they go. Always punchy, always fast in these quads, Catherine. I know, I love watching quad starts. You know, these are boats that are almost the same speed as the, the eights, but you know, they're half the sort of size and length and obviously half the numbers of athletes. So you get up to speed really quickly and it's, it's eight blades flashing through the water at speed. Beautiful start for both crews right here. Also steering, always an issue, Cox's boats. You've got to have one of those athletes will have a, a, a sort of steering wire attached to their foot. They've got one bit of their brain attached to the steering, the rest of it powering down this course. A great start for both boats, they're looking level. This is it. This is what the entire season has really built towards. This moment right now, and the crews are neck and neck coming off the end of the island. Staying in your boat, stay calm. You're not looking across right now, are you? Uh, there's always someone having a little sneaky look, isn't there? One, we used to maybe do that. But no, I mean, in theory, you're, it's still so early in the race. You want to just get that rhythm right. You know, that we've got there in the strokes. So you just want to settle the rhythm down. It's still coming out of that fast, high rate level. But you're going to come into that rhythm that will take you down the length of the course now. This is a close-up of Clare's Court, their local Maidenhead club from just further up the river. Um, done an incredible job to get to this point here and um, really nice start for them as well. Nice rhythm. Nice. Really good start there. Great shot of them. Great from the side. Both crews very horizontal. In the rowing stroke's a horizontal thing. You put a blade in, you push flat. You don't always want to see your shoulders lifting or anything lifting up. And, oh, lovely shot there of Clare's Court. Led really well there by Becca Don in the stroke seat. Keep your eyes in, guys. Just a few words there from Noala McFarlane behind her. We've also seen Hannah Hickson behind in the two seat giving out some calls. Jemima Don in the bio seat just keeping it sensible, keeping it level. Here we've got close up of Redwood Scholars. They've come over from USA and they've done an incredible job this week as well. Redwood Scholars, the crew to beat. They have come across all the way from the West Coast, if you're joining us, hello. Based there in the San Francisco Bay, and they're an open club, a community club, anyone can come and join, and they have absolutely dominated the rowing scene in America this season, and they've come across here to really add a cherry on the top of it, I think, Catherine. Yeah, it's wonderful to see them here. We, we say that, you know, this, this is sort of, a, you know, a local club in Clare's Court with a, an international sort of visitor coming in from Redwood Scholars, and it just makes for fantastic racing. Both boats, incredibly well drilled, really beautiful sculling for both young women crews. And um, I mean, they're actually coming together a bit closer than they should be with steering. But again, you know, it's a long race this one, and they just need to settle in. Look, as we were talking about, a little glance across, just checking where they are. You never want to lose contact with any crew at this point. Just keeping an eye on where the opposition is. This hurts. They are, you know, a minute into this race. They look so calm and so relaxed, but their lungs are absolutely burning. They've got to stick with this race. It's a long way. It's not terrible tailwind today. It's almost a bit crosswind coming across from the Buckingham Station. So, you know, you've got a race on your hands. You can stick with that crew in front of you, and they really have, Catherine. Yeah, that's a really good move, actually, because I think we thought Redwood Scholars was moving out in them. Again, very, very classy crew coming over from the USA here. But Clear's court has matched it, and they're seeing that. Now, this is so, I love this angle from quads as well. You can just see the timing. You can see how low the shoulders are. You can see the arm movement coming together. And again, just looking at that blade work, the handles should be matched. The 
come apart slightly, but you know the, the really top chords, you'll just see hardly difference between athlete to athlete down that boat. Your top tips for rowing in a chord, Catherine, you've done a few of them in your time? Hold on tight. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it, I do think it's a fabulous boat. It's fast and it's feisty. Um, but, you know, I did spend the first few years probably doing it a little bit nervous of a lot. It feels like a lot could go wrong, but these, these young women are showing us how it's done. Leela Hen, George Richardson, Mina Barr, Caroline Phipps there. We see a great shot of them. And then now from above, their crews are overlapping. They're still both in this race. Yeah, this is, I mean, as a spectator, this is exactly what you want to say. To be honest, as an athlete, you'd rather be somewhere kind of far apart from your position. But, you know, this is exactly what finals day is for. These are two boats. We know what this race means to both these crews. Like you said, this is the end point of a very long season. And this is a big title. The Henley Royal Regatta title is one you want to win. I mean, look at this. Nothing between these two crews. This is fabulous feeling. I think Claire's caught made a move. They've made a move and they pulled a seat back. You're looking at crew on the top of your screen. They're both in white, but at the top of your screen is Claire's Court. They are giant killers. They've come here and they've overturned crews, the ship lake, the holders, they've overturned crews that they almost weren't meant to. And they're here on finals day, neck and neck, coming through Remington Club. Yeah, this is the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup. Now, clues in the title, it was named around the Diamond Jubilee, which is 10 years ago now. So the event's been here for since 2012. So it's the anniversary of this event. And it is just, I think we've just seen sort of junior sculling just get better and better every time we see this event coming in. So it really is, you do see some brilliant young women in their own right, but they have got, you know, they've got an amazing future ahead of them in this sport as well. Now both crews are looking at each other because they're side by side. This is it guys, who is going to pull it out? Who's going to hold on to this? I think Red would have sneaked out a seat or two from that angle. This is also what winds me up about this boat. It's always so hard to tell. Until you're until you're directly opposite the cruise, it's really hard to predict what crew's doing what. So I think what's impressive, it sounds like, looks like Redwood has still got that slight lead, but my goodness, it's still enough of the course that anything could happen. These are young athletes. We're looking at rowers that are 15, 16, 17, 18, and look at the rowing they're bringing. Look at that talent, look at that skill they're bringing to this Henley course today. It is so impressive, and it is neck and neck. Oh, look at that. I mean, we, we saw Redwood had a bit more of a lead, but the, the latest update, it looks like there's just about a bye ball in it. I mean, this is this is stroke for stroke. This is when you're an athlete. You are you need to be so focused in your boat. And yet, when there's only two boats in a race, you can't help but be drawn into what's happening right next to you. There's, you know, normally, we're used to six lane racing. There's other boats to distract you or to focus on. Here, it's just you and your opposition, and it's and I think that could be Clear's Court moving out a little bit from this angle. What a move. This is so impressive. It's very hard when you're one and one to be losing and come through another crew. And that is a, the grit and determination and maybe a bit of confidence building through the regatta for this Clare's Court School. A little look across there from Rebecca Don's stroke of the Clare's Court School. Have we got it? Are we doing it? That looks like a decisive move from here. There's still enough of the course for things to change again, but that's the first time we've really seen Clare's Court come through and take the lead strong. Now remember, they are a local club. They are going to feel the roar of these supporters right next to them. And for both crews, it's very, very rare to be so close to a crowd. I mean, look, you can see the numbers on the banks this morning, this afternoon now. It is fabulous to be in part of this environment. This has been a killer blow. Clare's Court come through. The Redwood Scholars and they've pulled out to two thirds of a length. A little look across. Are we nearly there? Progress board. You've got 100 meters to go. Redwood's going to go again. Do they have any space they can make up now? It looks like Clare's Court might have this sewn up right to the line this one. Into the last few strokes and Clare's Court, you hold your heads up high because you have just won the Diamond Jubilee Challenge Cup 2022. What a race. Arms go up, elation, there's a usual cheer to your opposition. It's always a three cheers, respectful call, but as we can see from most people, they're about to hit us in this box here. Um, you can just see they, they almost can't even muster three cheers. That's how much it takes to get down this course. Yes, they're joining us in our commentary box, but unbelievable row there from the Clare's Court Scholars. Uh, so impressive to see and great racing. Isn't that wonderful? This is, we keep seeing in these shots, this is what it means, but this is what it means to win. It takes so much to get to this regatta. It takes so much to get ev through every day in a knockout competition. To make it to finals day, it's almost that, that look of disbelief. We've actually done it. Rebecca, Rebecca Don there is looking like she's uh, really felt that in the stroke seat. She did an outstanding job just keeping heads calm. And look at that. There's going to be some celebrations there tonight.
Well, we're back up to the start shortly for the Prince Albert Challenge Cup. This is going to be for the student men's coxed fours. Um, if you've caught your breath after that race, come back and join us. Um, and we're going to be seeing University of California, Berkeley, all the way again from the west coast of America against Oxford Brooks University A. Another big showdown. They are Oxford Brooks on the bottom of your screen in their famous maroon. Cal Berkeley on the top of your screen in their navy blue. And you'll see shortly a big yellow C on their backs and their fronts. Um, two really huge university programs with a lot of history between them. And um, it's come down to this finals day. They're sitting there on the start line. They've knocked out all the rest of their opposition. Who's going to take the win? Both these universities have been represented already in many different events throughout the day. So, you know, really successful programs, as you see, at university level. And, you know, again, it's just, it's just, you know, it's about spirit and pride at this point of just, you know, one race left. There's always that feeling of at this point, so much has happened, but it all comes down to this is obviously the one they want the most. It really is. There's nothing quite like this race. That's why we see crews coming from around the world, the very top of the top coming here to race down this 2,112 meters to get themselves on the top. The Prince Albert final, University of California Berkeley A on the top of your screen, Berkshire Station against Oxford Brooks University A on the Buckinghamshire Station on the bottom of your screen. Look good at the start, flat, not too much wind. You know, they're not having to do too much to keep the boat straight, which is always a bit of a relief in that bow seat. Cox's hands are going up and down slightly. They'll raise their hands to tell the umpire they're not quite ready. They'll instruct the crew to have a slight tap. They want to start with the straightest line possible. As soon as those hands go down, the umpire will begin this race. Short, sharp strokes from both crews, getting the rate as high as possible. They start lengthening out along this island now and bring it into that rhythm and rate that they can sustain over the long course ahead of them. Very strong start there by Oxford Brooks. Coming at us at the, the left hand side of the screen, the maroon, but Cal seems to have gone out equally as hard. And uh, how we'd see these boats going are level at the end of the island. Really impressive starts for both crews. You can just, I mean, you can feel and you can hear the power and the force coming down. The start again in this two-boat race, the start is so important because it becomes a mental battle as much as a physical battle. And it's just where, you know, how have you done? How have you settled? How are you going to take on? Can you get an early lead? Can you get that confidence-building start on your opposition? This is looking going to be a tight race the whole way down. Yeah, and it's a slightly slower race than some of the coxswain's boats you see because you, if you look at the front of your screen, there you see a coxswain in the bows, they're steering and they're shouting encouragement to the rest of the crew and Cal have slipped a seat. They've got a slight edge on the Oxford Brooks crew. Yeah, that was a nice move. It almost looked like University of California just kept that rating high and just aren't settling yet. They're going to try and take as much as they can as as they can. Now Oxford Brooks will feel that and will know it and their coxes are obviously calling the instructions as well. Cox will be very aware in both seats exactly what's happening with the opposition and they'll just be saying, you know, we need to stay on them, we need to not let them slip away, we can't let them take any more seats. We're watching two of the very best university programmes in the world here battling it out in the Prince Albert Challenge Cup and they are neck and neck. It says slight bow ball to Cal right now on the right of your screen with a big yellow C on their backs but the maroon of Oxford Brooks have not let them go and that's a strong start by both crews. Yeah, you can see actually there's, there's, there is wind picking up and down this course, which will affect them slightly. It definitely helps when you've got the cocks, although the cocks, as you say, will weigh the boat down and slow the boat down a little bit. They'll also be massively helpful in the motivation and the steering just to keep these boats aligned and straight, coming straight down that course. And the form book is with Cal. They were slightly faster to the barrier yesterday, slightly faster to the, to the Forley. Um, and I think 
that will give them quite a lot of confidence coming down this course. But it's finals day. Anything can happen. This is sport. If you really punch out there and believe you can do it, it can take you a long way down this river. It's also an interesting, I mean, the last few races that Oxford Brooks have had, they've sort of dominated from the beginning of the race. They've really managed to use that power and that length and that speed to lay down how the race is going to pan out from the first stroke. So this is the first time really this week they've had to come from, they'll have to come from behind if they're going to go ahead. So they will be in an uncomfortable and unusual position to be slightly down on the University of California, but they will be experienced enough to know what they, that they're going to need to get down and ahead of, if they can, ahead of UCAL. These are physical boats, it's a heavy boat, you're carrying on a cox and these rowers here are showing us how to do it. Very nice blade work, both of them on the great courses, holding their stroke length, keeping nice and long. Yeah, this is impressive rowing, like you said, from both crews. University of California definitely got the advantage at the moment. Both crews keeping a, a pretty pacey rate as they come through the middle part of the course. Not willing to, it's not, you know, it, although University of California are almost moving out gradually every stroke now, it's still not going to be a comfortable gap. You know, you really want to feel you've got open water between the two boats if you're leading. And actually, if you're following, if you're Oxford Brooks and chasing, you want to keep that overlap, you want to keep that contention so that it, when you are ready to put down the extra bit of work or raise the rate, then actually you can pounce quickly. And they could be pulling back a bit on this right as we watch. You can never write off Oxford Brooks. Their programme, their depth, the amount of Olympic medals they produce is unreal. And they have got that belief and they have pulled right back to Cal now. They've pulled almost bow ball to bow ball. That was an absolute killer move there, coming through the Foley up to Remenham. Yeah, and there's nothing like in a two-boat race when you have had to start off from behind, getting the confidence build as you... I mean, they just slipped straight through, straight past the University of California. If not, they just moved up and stuck. They just kept moving straight through that boat. It was like California had nothing they could do to stop that move from Oxford Brooks. It's absolutely devastating. They're making it look like a Cox's boat. They're really keeping that rate nice and high. How many strokes per minute they're doing? It looks like it's tapping it along. They're being... Such, such loose pictures of them. You're in the middle of a Henley final and they're so loose and powerful. This is really exceptional rowing. Yeah, they, are, they do look as if, I'm sure it wasn't the race plan, but they obviously knew exactly what to do if, the what if moment of what if we do, we are behind off the start, what are we going to do if we find ourselves half length down, you know, at, at the barrier fall. The points you say, what do we do at this point? Now they've just handled it cool, calm, collected, move straight through. So we look down the Cal boat there, stroke, Tommy Barrel. Leading his crew on, can he respond now? As there's a tiny glance across there from Amy Jones in the cockpit of this Oxford Brooks boat, at the bottom of your screen, telling a crew we've done it, we're a length ahead, keep moving. Yeah, now this is the bit we talk about this moment, is when you suddenly see the crowds, you feel the crowds, there's a sense you are now coming home, this is you coming to the final straight. Now, there's still quite a, it's a long sprint still from if you're in. A crew, it still feels a long way, but as soon as you hear the crowd, you know. So if you're following, you have to act now. You have to make the impact. You have to start pulling back that crew in front of you. And if you're ahead, you've now got your eye on that finish line and just drive it on. These rowers know they've already won the temple today, Oxford Brooks. There are nine of their colleagues, their crewmates, their friends sitting on the bank about to get a Henley medal. They want one too, and they are pulling away from Cal Berkeley on the left of your screen, the maroon of Oxford Brooks. They've almost got a few hundred meters left. Hold on to it. Looks like the University of California raising the rights, they're lifting it. They know this is, they have to act now if they're going to do anything in front of this huge, noisy crowd. They've definitely lifted the right. Brooks have responded. Brooks seems to be holding it. Like you said, the relaxation of both crews is impressive. The Oxford Brooks look. They've still got the length and they've still got just about the advantage now. You're looking at eight rowers. They're almost 200 centimetres tall, all of them. They are absolutely powering. Their rate is up. Their lungs are screaming and they are absolutely careering towards this finish line. And Oxford Brooks have four more shrugs until they become the Prince Albert Challenge Cup winners of 2022 over the California Berkeley crew. What a race. Coming from behind, you don't see that very often. You know, another great final where the lead changes and just dramatic scenes of racing as they, not just down the course, but even as they cross the line here, the two crews have come together. And there's a really lovely moment of respect across the two boats and appreciation of that race. That's what you see in a rowing race. These crews cheer each, these crews cheer each other. 
They know the pain they've just put each other through. They know the dedication. They know the training they've had to do to get to this point in their rowing careers. And that is so respectful to see in a lovely moment. It is, and it, you know, it comes down to those seconds. It's, here we see Amy Jones really celebrating. Great work from a coxing point of view. I mean, just, again, holding her nerve and, and getting the, the crew to move. Like we said, that move they made just to come from behind, almost a half length behind to a half length ahead very quickly. It was really impressive. Well, we're very excited to be going to the next with the Silver Goblets and Nichols Challenge Cup, the Open Men's Pair event. And we have Glenister and Bogatsky. We don't have Glenister and Bogatsky, I'm, I'm reading the wrong sheet. We have Ollie Wynn Griffiths and Tom George against the Wairiki Club New Zealand of Matt McDonald and Tom McIntosh of New Zealand. These are two of the fastest pairs in the world right now, and we're very excited to see what's going to happen down this course. George and Ollie Wingriff there in their Cambridge blue. Both national team members, both of them took a year out of the national team this year to go and race Cambridge. and study at Cambridge. Wairiki. When I see that you're both straight and ready, I will start you like this. Attention. Go. I'd like to just get be ready, please. McDonald and McIntosh from New Zealand in the black. All you Griffin's Tom George in the silver goblets on the top of your screen. As we said in the previous race, it's usually the cocks and the cocks boat who have their hand up saying they're not straight. Here it's the bad Go. person. Quite right, clean start. We'd expect that these are two of the very fastest pairs in the entire world. Kiwi pair, as I say that, have veered slightly across to Berkshire. They'll be getting warned to move back, please, back to your Buckingham station. That slightly pushed the Cambridge pair over as well. It's always a really deceptive because they actually, the, the, although the line is really straight on the course, they actually the land moves away from you, so it's very common for crews to start moving towards where the land's taking you. Like you said, these are two of the best pairs in the world. They've, between them, one's won the first World Cup, the other's won the second World Cup, and this is the very exciting and what a privilege for us to watch them come together to see who might take the title today. Exactly, Catherine. This is an absolute spectacle you're watching right now. Two of the fastest pairs in the world from either end of the world and they're here on this Henley course going to battle it out, this gladiatorial stretch of water and the Cambridge pair have taken the lead. Ollie Winkers. Tom George have slipped half a length on this much favoured, very fast New Zealand pair. Yeah, that's going to be slightly uncomfortable for that New Zealand pair. It, you know, I don't think anyone's expecting a move, especially so close to the start, suddenly to be able to move out half a length. And both pairs, you can see both pairs still very high rate, still very much, you know, driving out that start, still at very intense level. They haven't settled yet. And even within that intensity, the Cambridge pair has moved out on them by about half a length. It's a very impressive start. New Zealand pair are not bad at rowing either. Both of them got an Olympic gold medal each in the men's A in Tokyo. Not bad at all, really. Yeah, not too bad. So these two pairs you're looking at here raced each other in the men's eight. With the left-hand side of your screen in, in the black, the New Zealand combo. They won the gold and Tom and Ollie on the right of your screen, the Cambridge blue bronze. A little bit of a grudge match here. I know, we do love a grudge match. Um, but yeah, as you said, both both medalists, um, all medalists in men's eight. So interesting, they've both been selected currently in the pairs. Um, it's a long season, we've mentioned this before, the World Championships for the international crews are, are very late this season, they won't be till September. Um, so there's a long of season yet, so it'll be interesting where these, these gentlemen end up, in which boats later on as we get done the season. And I think we're looking here at the future of world rowing. These, these pairs are both very young, they've both all been to the Olympics and I just imagine quite a few more Olympic Games in them both. And I, would love to see this battle carrying on because the Kiwi pair has stuck with Cambridge. They've not let them go. They're, they're very physical, they're very strong, and they're gonna have that confidence of an Olympic gold medal around their neck. Yeah, and, and although, as we said, they've, they've won their sort of big title in the men's eight, 
New Zealand have got an incredible history in men's players rowing as well. I mean, they're like Britain as well. Between the two countries, they've really had some outstanding athletes in the past. So again, through their coaching, through their setup, they're very confident in these smaller boats taking on the rest of the world. The very successful New Zealand pair, Bond and Murray, two-time Olympic champion. Are we seeing the next New Zealand pair right now? Mac McDonald in the bow seat. Tom McIntosh in the stroke seat. A little look across, he's going to say we're still there. They've certainly got the power to stick with them, but lovely, loose, long stroke that we see from a lot of the Cambridge crews, Captain. Yeah, they have a really impressive setup. Um, Rob Baker is the coach over at, at Cambridge University for the Blue Boats. Just, you know, very good technician, sets up a really nice, relaxed, long style. We're not seeing the, the end of the blades at the moment, but really sort of clean, technical style of racing as well. And I think, you know, for both Oliver and Griffith there, we see in the bow seat, Tom George in the stroke, just lovely rhythm, very confident. I think, you know, this this kind of imposing that rhythm and imposing that success on the on New Zealand pair would have been, will be very pleasing for them at this point in the race. And they've not let them get away. This is like a six lane race where really it is neck and neck most of the way down the course. These crews are used to that. You see anyone not getting flustered from being down is going to be these professional athletes you're seeing right now. And the Kiwis look like they've just taken their strike, their strike of rating up and they are moving back on the Cambridge pair. Yeah, it does it that they've made us move. And, and it's always the interesting bit when you get a start like that Cambridge pair got, you know, can you hold on to it? But the, the Kiwis, as we, we expect them to be very strong in this race, but they have done a move that you don't often see in the middle of the course. It's still, you know, still a long way to go, but they've lifted the rate a, a bit like we saw with the Oxford Brooks crew in the race before. They've sort of done this move that mentally will be will do some real damage to that Cambridge pair. It's really going to be on them how they respond, because once you've got a lead, you want to consolidate that lead and get comfortable, and suddenly you've got this New Zealand pair powering up next to you and alongside you, and it's going to be what both crews can do next. And what a move! They were a diesel engine getting starting out those blocks, and they have just fired themselves up because they are taken a half a length out of this Cambridge pair, and they're right back on track. As we come down here, we're approaching the Forley. This is through the middle of the race. Have they got it? Yes, I think they're just about all ahead as we come down towards the enclosures. Yeah, that was a really, really impressive move from that New Zealand pair. I mean, again, like we said, experienced on the international scene. Um, less so in the small boat, to be fair, than the, than the eight, but they've already won a World Cup in this. And they will know they've got a reputation and, and a, an ability to match that as well. We talked about this before. People do want to come to Henley Royal Regatta and win the title. It's a big name to add to your list of accomplishments. And to take on the sort of the British pair on the British course is something that a lot of international crews really enjoy taking on that challenge. See the bow shot there, the New Zealand pair, all black colour, and they have absolutely ripped it through the Cambridge pair. Brilliant start by both boats, but that killer blow is so hard to do through the middle of a race. Really opened up this lead, but great shots there. Oliver Ingram's bow seat. Still looking calm and relaxed, can they respond? Because you can move in these smaller boats. You can. What I was impressed with, when you looked at it from the bow end of the boat, the, the New Zealand pair is running very, very smooth. There's very little lift and drop to that bow bar, whereas the Cambridge boat were bouncing a bit more. So that New Zealand pair is going to have a much more efficient stroke as they come into these last few, but last few metres. Here they come. They're coming down towards the finish line. A little across from Tom George in the stroke seat. Take the rate up, Tom. What have you got left? But it's not going to be enough as the New Zealand pair, Wairiki Rowing Club, cross the line to take the famous Silver Goblet and Nichols Challenge Cup. What a race. Yet again, I mean, it's that change of leaders as well, isn't it? It's really dramatic racing style we're getting, and so much of this. We talk about this, it's such a physical race, it's a long race, it's a two-boat race, which also then becomes an equally matched mental challenge. So when you get that lead, what can you do when you're behind and have the confidence to roll through? And when you're then being overtaken by someone, how can you respond? So, you know, you don't want to say each one's a, you know, another learning experience, but both crews will have learned so much about themselves from that race. And they won't have to wait long to race each other again, because they'll both be racing one week's time at Lucerne Regatta, the last World Cup another great rematch of these pairs. 
And I am excited to say we are on to the final race of Henley Royal Regatta 2022. We're going to be taking you to the start line of the Thames Challenge Cup and what a race it is going to be. We're going to see Molesy Boat Club A on the top of your screen. They're going to be in the Berkshire Station with Thames Rowing Club A on the Buckinghamshire Station at the bottom of your screen. And this is a rematch of the 2021 Thames Cup final. with their famous red trucker caps, black lycras with their red and white stripes. On the top of your screen in the yellow boat, you're seeing Molesy Boat Club and their famous black and white stripes too. It's going to be an absolute cracker. Looking at some of the times, being very similar to these two crews. In fact, yesterday in the semi-finals, both crews did exactly the same time to the barrier, which is the first marker exactly the same time to the Foley, which is about the halfway marker. So we should have an absolutely outstanding race to finish this regatta on. Um, we already have seen uh, three of the titles going to the Thames Run Club already, so this crew will be looking to see if we can add a fourth today. So Matthew Pinson following them down, umpiring this race. I wonder if they'll know that. You probably can always see here in Paris, you're very close, it's very intimate at the start line come forward to begin this final race of the regatta. Attention! Go! Good quick start from the umpire there. The boats can't settle too long off they go. Thundering now along the island. This is the eight and all their glory. Big finish, big finale for this regatta. Both crews. These are, this is such a big event for club crew racing. This is, this is the one they've come for. This is the long season they've built to, and it all comes down to this last 2,112 meters. And this is an exciting race on a, another factor because these crews have really not raced each other much this season. The Moldy crew were the fastest club crew at the Marla Regatta, one of the most recent big regattas, and Thames did not race there. Similarly, Thames are the fastest at the Metropolitan Regatta where Moldy didn't race, so they're both vying to be the top club men's A in the country. And obviously in a knockout competition you don't meet each other until you make, reach in the final, so they won't know each other's form up other than watching it, on, watching it play out with, uh, with other crews. So this is the first time they line up side by side to test themselves against each other. What an incredible test for both crews now. As they blast out of the blocks that quarter mile signal, is very close here, neck and neck. Some brilliant blade work there of the Thames Ring Club. Look at the synchronization, the dropping in of that oar of the catch as you pan back round to the crew. Faces looking quite relaxing, so they're at maximum right now. We should all remember their heart rates at maximum. They've got lactic acid in their legs, and their cox is telling them to go harder. Yeah, and it was not that rhythm that Tim set up. Just got that bit of time, that little bit of run, even though, like we said, fast intensity, very high rating coming out, but they've just blown that boat run just very sweetly under them. And across the Molesy crew. Again, the level of this rowing is extremely high. Look down the boat there. Strokes it, Rufus Tilt, 23 years of age. Has been at Oxford Brooks, he's now moved across to Mulsey. He's leading his crew very well because this race is panning out to be the corker we pinned it for. Outstanding job, and I think the Cox will play a big part in that. We've got Richard Hill as Cox in the Thames boat, this 10th appearance for uh, Henley Royal Regatta. So he knows this course well, he knows what it takes get down this course, he knows exactly when to push his crew and when to sort of lift that adrenaline momentum and when to bring it down to that nice long rhythm. Back to the Moldy crew. Total concentration on their faces. Rufus Tilted Chug, Ollie Salona in the 70, Theo Darla, Reese Westall, Tom Worthington, Sam Ford, Ben Whitting, Marcus Lewis, cooks by Alexandra Wenyon. 
and they look to have slipped a seat from this angle, I'd say, Catherine. Yeah, from this it looks like Molesy have moved ahead. Again, like you said, really impressive rowing from both boats. They, you know, they, they look at the blades as well. You want just that timing, you want that precision. And, and again, they're doing that nice, shallow. It's very easy in these big boats to sort of dig the blade in a bit deep, and it does slow the boat down. They're just covering their blades, and that horizontal push through it is making, again, this really efficient row. And every stroke, they're just eating up this course. Catherine, exactly that. Look at the blades there. There's a slight difference. The noisy spoons are just dropping in the water. Very little splash, very little interference. That's no wasted energy there. As we pan back to a bit more aggressive style from this Thames crew, doing great stuff, but slightly more splash on those blades at the end of the water. And it is paying off because Molsey have squeezed out. Have they got open water yet? They're just a length ahead as we pass up attempts. We're passing Remnant. Both clubs are going to get a huge cheer here through Remnant Club. Yeah, and we see there Thomas Wood in the bow seat of the Thames. He'll just be aware that the Cox from Molsey Alexander Wenyon is just slipping out of his peripheral vision and that's when you feel, that's when the crew is slipping away from you. Now you're coming into these enclosures, this is the moment they have to pounce if they want this title to bring it back on time. You've got to dig deep now, whether it's rate, whether it's power, whether it's length, there's something you've got to tap into that raises your boat speed at this point. The Thames rowers are thinking we have to go now. This is what the early mornings are for. This is what the missed weddings are for, the missed funerals, all the time you should turn down those drinks with friends. This is the moment. What have they got? They will be digging deeper than they've ever done before. This is the one they want, and they're going to come into these enclosures. We keep talking about this moment. It's a quieter part of the regatta. They've just come down that course, and now they hit the crowds, but they will lift Malty as well. Malty will know they've done the... Oh, but I think Temps is pulling back a little bit. There's still a way to go. This race isn't finished yet. As we come into the closing stage of this race, they've got 600 metres to go. Multi Boat Club have three quarters of a length lead over Thames Rowing Club on the left of your screen. Can they hold on to this? Can they have revenge from crossing that line in second last year? Are they going to be the victors today? Or are Thames going to take their rate up and squeeze back? Mosey still looks strong as they come in, that blade work. Still looking neat, still looking tidy. They're going to be lifted by these crowds again. Like you said, this, this has been a year these crews have been waiting to get this rematch coming back. So here they go, final stages. They're coming back, they're absolutely coming back. Mosey, what have you got? Can you respond? Can you absorb this? There is nothing quite like the intensity of the last 200 metres of an Airtus. And Thames Ring Club have responded. They're pushing back on this Mosey crew. Can Mosey take their rate up? And I think Mosey have, they've responded and they've absorbed that push and that is the killer blow. And Mosey are gonna take the last few strokes of this race with a huge spirit attempt, throwing everything at this towards the line. And Mosey are going to do it. They've revenged their second place in the Thames Cup from last year as their hands go up, the water is splashed. The bangs on the boats and the hugs are going to go on and on until the early hours. What a race, what a way to feel it. You see celebration and jubilation already from that Molsey crew, well, well deserved, and all the heads have gone down in that Thames boat. That was an intense race, and you can see how hard it is for that Thames crew. To, and, and although both crews would have put in exactly the same effort, you see the difference in winning, Suddenly you feel no pain, you just feel joy. Losing, everything hurts and everything just it's starting again. What a treat. We have just seen a gladiatorial fight to the line from so many crews this afternoon. This was an absolutely brilliant way to end our regatta for 22. Look at that. Absolute screams of joy from Rufus tilt there as he screams out to the skies above him and they are absolutely elated. Tears there are, you know, the emotion is probably the most you're ever going to feel, maybe the birth of a child, but this is the moment for this absolutely incredible crew in the Thames Cup. And the bowman really is hitting him hard now. Marcus Lewis, the 24-year-old, this is fourth Henley Royal Regatta. Isn't it beautiful to see that? This is what this means. And this is just, it's so much built to this point and it just matters. These races matter. It's sport, it's fun, but it really matters to every single individual in these boats.
And now we're going to be lucky enough to be joined um, by the Princess Albert winners, Oxford Brooks University A Queen. Jack, you've competed here a number of years. Just what kind of feeling was that victory? Yeah, it just felt like a like a four-year struggle finally over, and like we got the job done. There wasn't really a doubt like we were ever going to not do it today. As the crew's just been flying, it's been really, really good. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Amy, why does this one matter so much, particularly? This is my last year at Brooks. Um, so two years of hard work of all the all the days, the six days a week of getting up, doing it, and we've got it. We've we've. We, I've jumped into this boat a few weeks ago and these boys have been nothing but incredible and they've worked so hard and this is just this shows the work that they've put in, the coaches have put in and all the hours that go on behind the scenes. It's amazing. And just a word on the support that you've had, not just here at the boat, uh, the boat tents, but at the whole length of the river. Oh yeah, it was absolutely amazing, especially with the tunnel that formed just outside boat tent D. It was absolutely incredible. I have never experienced anything like it. It was all the way, all the way along. Rowing up to the start, you just hear, yeah, Brooks, just left, right and centre. It's, it makes it all possible, really. We're all We appreciate every single one of every single person that turned up to cheer us on. And we're yeah. really grateful. Really this, is, this victory is for them as well. Yeah. Well, Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. well, what a regatta it has been. It has been an absolute joy to bring you the races and give you our commentary. On behalf of me and all the commentary team, we want to thank you for tuning in and listening to us. And we are going to say goodbye to Henley Royal 2022. And we look forward to seeing you Henley Royal 2023. Yes, thank you very much to all of our commentators this week. You've done an amazing job. The atmosphere down here at the, uh, the boat tents is electric, as you can imagine. Mosley getting such a huge, huge cheer. So many supporters of that club as they come back in, having won that final race. The celebrations here are going to be continuing late into the evening. But sadly, that is it for us, for Henley Royal Regatta 2022. It's been a historic year. Great to see the enclosures back to their pre-pandemic bustling best. We've had a record number of entries, a whole host of overseas Olympians, some brilliant junior performances, and for the first time, all been spread over six fabulous days. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in 2023.